Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the Luffy Fanfix, back with amazing fanfiction. This is the series of What If Luffy Ate Strongest Mythical Chimera Zone Fruit. Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Years ago there was a man named Goldie Roger, or as he was better known as Gold Roger, who held the title of Pirate King due to his conquering of the toughest sea known to man, the Grand Line. Before his execution, he was asked where his vast treasure was. His final words were, My fortune is yours for the taking, but you'll have to find it first. I left everything I own in one piece. This started the golden age of piracy where every pirate in the world went searching for one piece in hopes of becoming the next ruler of the seas as the pirate king. Time passed and we find ourselves ten years later in the quiet town of Windmill Village. Or not so quiet, since a band of pirates under the command of red-haired Shanks, one of the four emperors of the sea, four of the most powerful pirates of that era. What would this vicious band of bloodthirsty sea dogs be doing in such a remote part of the world you ask? They were partying like there's no tomorrow in the local tavern with some of the locals. At the bar of the tavern we see a young boy by the name of Monkey D. Luffy and Shanks, captain of the red-haired pirates. Luffy is a young seven-year-old boy with jet black hair, a white shirt with a picture of an anchor on it, blue shorts, and a bandage currently under his left eye while red-haired Shanks is a slightly average height man wearing a button-down long-sleeved white shirt, black pants with a sash holding them up, sandals, three vertical scars over his left eye, and a straw hat over his bright red hair, hence the nickname. The reason for the celebration was also the reason Luffy currently had the bandage under his eye. In order to prove his manliness to the pirate crew, Luffy had taken a dagger and cut himself to prove that he could withstand pain, despite the fact that he had tears in his eyes and was obviously trying to hold out crying like a little baby. The crew had decided to hold a party to, in their own words, celebrate Luffy's craziness. That didn't hurt at all, said Luffy in a voice that would make it obvious to a brainless monkey that he was lying. Liar, said Shanks, his crew, most of the people in the village, and anyone who's ever read the first chapter of the One Piece manga. I'm not afraid of pain at all. Next time bring me out to sea, exclaimed Luffy in the excited voice of a child ready for an adventure. I want to be a pirate too. You can't handle being a pirate. Being able to swim is a pirate's greatest weakness, said Shanks while supporting a knowing smile on his face, most likely thinking back to when he first wanted to become a pirate. Luffy, with a ticked-off look on his face shot back, as long as I stay on the ship I'll be fine. Besides my fighting is pretty good too. I've been training my whole life and my punch is as strong as a pistol. Luffy finished with a proud grin on his face. Shanks seemed skeptical at the young boy's high opinion of himself, but his crew wasn't helping the matter by telling Luffy how awesome the life of a pirate is. Luffy listened enthusiastically, his eagerness only increasing by the minute. Shanks tried to act as the voice of reason by telling Luffy that he was still too young to live the life of a pirate, which Luffy heatedly denied. Don't be mad, here have some juice, Shanks said with a mischievous smile. Luffy thanked the pirate and drank the juice down with the usual childlike enthusiasm. As soon as Luffy was done with the juice Shanks could no longer hold it in and burst out laughing. You really are a kid. That's too funny. He gasped out between bouts of laughter. That was a dirty trick. Luffy cried indignantly as he watched the captain laugh at his expense. Luffy left the bar table in a huff muttering about the indignity of it all when he noticed Shanks' first mate, Ben Beckman, make a come here motion while lighting up a cigarette. Luffy, while I understand that you're upset, you should try to understand the captain's feelings, the pirate said between puffs of smoke. Seeing the small boy's confused expression, Ben explained, while the captain knows that being a pirate is interesting, he also knows that the life of a pirate is hard and very dangerous. You understand. He's not purposely teasing your ambitions of being a pirate. I don't understand, Luffy said irritated. Shanks just takes me for an idiot. Looking in said man's direction, Luffy noticed Shanks stifling his giggles about the prank he just pulled. See, Luffy shouted while pointing an accusing finger in Shanks' direction. A distraction came in the form of the bar's owner Makino asking Luffy if he wanted something to eat. Never one to pass down food, especially fruit of the meat variety. Luffy eagerly plopped down next to Shanks and dug into his food. Luffy then asked how long the pirates would be staying and, after finding out they would be staying for the year, promised Shanks that he would learn to swim by that time. Suddenly the tavern's door was kicked open by a man who looked like a cross between a hobo and a street thug walked in, eyeing the pirates seated around the bar. The obvious meth addict made a snarky comment on the pirates' appearances despite the obvious fact that he was obviously outnumbered 50 to 1 against superior opponent, which let us know that the man has an IQ that makes Luffy seem like Stephen Hawking. Everyone was looking at the sad excuse of a bandit that they never noticed Luffy eating an oddly colored and shaped piece of fruit, not even Luffy. The hobo man walked up to the bar and introduced himself as a bandit and demanded ten barrels of sake for he and his men. When told that the sake was sold out, the self-proclaimed bandit leader frowned and looked around the room. 
Oh, that's strange, then what are they drinking? Is it water? The bandit, whose name was Haguma, asked. No it's sick, but it's all we had, explained Makino to Haguma. Sorry about that, said Shanks trying to defuse the situation. Looks like finished all the sake here. Here, if you don't mind take the last bottle. He said while holding up the unopened bottle of sake, which Haguma promptly smashed sending sake splashing all over the pirate captain, much to the shock of Luffy and the others present in the bar. Most likely they were shocked at the stupidity of the bandit once again ignoring how outnumbered and outclassed he was. Higuma went into a small rant on how he was the prime fugitive figure around the village and how his head was worth eight million dollars and blah, blah, blah. Shanks ignored the man in favor of cleaning up the newly created mess on the floor. Higuma, seeing as no one seemed to give a crap about what he was saying took out his sword and proceeded to smash all the glassware on the bar right on top of Shanks. Seriously, you'd think he'd quit while he's ahead. With a few more condescending words, the bandit leader stormed out of the tavern. As Makino checked on Shanks to see if he was alright, which he assured that he was, the rest of the pirate crew started cracking jokes on what just happened, with Shanks joining into the laughter. The only person not laughing, however, was Luffy. Why are you laughing? Luffy shot out while looking quite ticked, seeing Shanks' puzzled expression. Luffy went on a slight rant saying, that was disgraceful. Why didn't you fight him? So what if they have more people? Who laughs after getting picked on? You're not a man and not a pirate either. Shanks paused for a second before saying, Look Luffy, I know how you feel, but it's just a bottle of sake. There's nothing to get worked up about. Seeing as Luffy didn't like this answer and was leaving towards the door in a huff while calling Shanks a coward and that he didn't want to see him again, Shanks reached out to stop him saying, Oh come on, don't go Luffy. Shanks stopped mid-sentence as Luffy suddenly came to a halt gripping his stomach as if he was in pain. Luffy are you all? Shanks started to ask before Luffy fell to the floor screaming in pain. My body feels like it's on fire, Luffy managed to say before continuing his screaming and withering. Shanks and Makino were about to get a doctor before they and all the pirates in the bar noticed Luffy go through a startling transformation. Luffy's head and body became like that of a lion with goat horns. His arms became reptilian-like with sharp claws but maintained their opposable thumbs. His back legs took the shape of a goat's, and finally a long, lizard-like tail elongated from his spin. The entire bar was silent, save for Luffy's slightly animal-like gasps as he tried to steady himself. All the pirates and Makino stared wide-eyed and pale-faced at what Luffy had just become. Shanks was the first to compose himself, seeing similar things during his many years on the Grand Line. Luffy, are you alright? Shanks managed to ask in a voice just above a whisper. Why yeah? Luffy managed to stammer out in slightly deeper voice. Not that anyone really noticed or cared at this point. Phew that was weird. Almost felt like my entire body was being turned inside out. Must have been something I ate. Luffy mused before turning and noticing that most of the other people in the bar were still staring at him in wide-eyed shock. What's wrong? Is there something on my face? Luffy asked while everyone in the bar felt the urge to face fault despite the shock they were still feeling. Most of the pirates were starting to get over their shock and took a closer look at the transformed boy. Despite his animal appearance, Luffy wasn't much different than when he was human. He was larger, but only by about six inches. His new mane was as black as his hair had been before the transformation. His eyes still held the childlike innocence they once held, only with slitted pupils. He still wore his clothes, but they seemed bulky under his new form and his bandage fell off, reveling a small scar under his left eye. What finally brought the pirates out of their daze was the confused expression held on Luffy's feline face. Something that would make most little girls squeal on how cute it looked. Luffy, meanwhile, was started to get annoyed that no one was answering his question and hurried over to the mirror near the bar table, not noticing the changes to his body because and now that the initial pain was over his body felt just like it always did. He just couldn't figure out why his clothes suddenly felt tight and why it felt like his spine was longer somehow. And B this is Luffy we're talking about. He probably wouldn't notice a forest fire unless someone pointed it out to him. When Luffy reached the mirror and looked in he gave a startled yelp and fell backwards. Getting up he went to look in the mirror again and noticed the strange, wide-eyed creature and it was following his movements exactly. It was then he looked down and took notice of his body. Luffy felt his panic growing as he looked over the changes his body had and looking behind him he finally noticed his tail. Holy crap, I have a tail, Luffy shouted out in shock. This caused any remaining shock the residents of the bar were feeling to disperse and they all sweat dropped, he only now noticing the tail. Everyone thought with exasperated expressions on their face. Hey captain, said Lucky Roo, a slightly fat member of the Red Hair Pirates who was almost constantly snacking on a drumstick, you don't think Luffy? Oh no, he shouted, the chimera fruit from our chest is gone. Lucky exclaimed while looking at the now empty chest next to where Luffy was sitting. Quickly going over to Luffy, Lucky pulled out a drawing of the fruit from 
somewhere and asked the monster-like boy, Luffy, did you eat this? Luffy, with a slightly confused look on his transformed face said, well yeah, isn't that dessert? It tasted pretty bad tough. Shanks ran up to the animal hybrid and shouted out. That was the Chimera Chimera fruit. It's one of the most powerful of the legendary devil's fruit. It's said whoever eats it can become any animal the person can think of as well as the mythical beast, the Chimera. Shock seemed to go over Luffy's face before he broke out into a wide Cheshire cat grin. You mean I can become any animal? Like a tiger or an eagle? He asked excitedly. Shanks, able to calm himself down some, looked at Luffy with a serious expression. Yes Luffy, you can become all that and more. The devil's fruits are one of the rarest treasures of the sea. There are three types of devil's fruit. The parmesha, which gives the user superhuman abilities like being able to stretch like rubber or separate their body parts. The zoan, which allows the person to become a certain animal as well as an animal-human hybrid. And the loja, which turns the user's body into an element like fire or lightning. You Luffy ate a Zoan fruit. Unlike other Zoan type devils fruit it is not limited to one type of animal or human animal hybrid, as well as gives the user the form of the legendary Chimera, like what you are now. That is why it is considered a mythical Zoan fruit due to its ability to turn the user into a legendary creature. However, it is said whoever eats a devil's fruit is cursed by sea devils and will never be able to swim. Luffy gained a shocked expression and cried out, Wet at. Are you kidding me? You idiot. Yelled Shanks. Time skip. A few weeks had passed since Luffy ate the Chimera fruit, and after a few hours of concentration he didn't know he had, Luffy was able to finally shift back into his human form. He was still trying to figure out how to shift between forms at will, as well as how to shift into other animal. But so far the only progress he made was being able to change his hands into the reptilian claws of his Chimera form. Life had went back to normal in Windmill Village. The red-haired pirates had gone sailing for a few days. The mayor of the town was annoying Luffy by repeatedly telling him to avoid hanging out with the pirates, and Luffy was getting the tar kicked out of him by Haguma and his gang of bandits. Dot dot dot. Wait, what? Let's rewind a bit. Luffy was back in the bar talking to Makino about Shanks when Haguma and his men came barging in and demanding sake and soon started insulting the red-haired pirates. This soon escalated into a fight between Luffy and the bandits as Luffy tried to force Haguma to apologize about the bar incident with Shanks. Luffy then tried to use his fruit's powers to transform into his chimera form to teach a lesson to the bandit. But thanks to his crappy control over his powers and his increasing anger towards the bandits, he was only able to make his arms into their reptilian claws like usual. Not one to back down, Luffy still tried to attack Haguma but was easily knocked back, only managing to slightly tear the end of the bandit's coat. You're a different type of human, aren't you? Haguma observed while looking at the slight tears in his coat, and you've ruined my best coat. Maybe I should sell you to the circus as payback, HM. Luffy made several attempts to clobber the bandit, but said bandit was able to easily knock the chimera boy around like a kicked puppy. The mayor and Makino came and tried to apologize for Luffy's actions. But the bandit decided to kill the seven-year-old out of sheer annoyance due to Luffy constantly insulting the man. Just as it looked like the end for Luffy, and a really crappy start of a story, Deus Ex Machida decided to raise its head in the form of the red-haired pirates returning to port. Shanks noticed the lack of welcome and, deciding to check out what was wrong, came upon the scene just as it looked like Haguma was about to kill Luffy. Luffy, what's wrong? Didn't you say your punch was strong as a pistol? Shanks asked as he casually walked up to where the bandits were. Haguma, annoyed by the interruption, threatened Shanks to mind his own business while one of his men pointed a pistol directly against Shanks' head. Well since you pulled out your gun, I guess we have to fight. You know, you really shouldn't use guns to threaten people. Just then, Lucky Roo appeared out of nowhere, killing the bandit with a quick shot to the temple with his own pistol. The bandits and villagers stared at the scene in shock. Haguma recovered his senses and started yelling on how the pirates were using dirty tricks. Dirty, don't make me laugh. The people standing in front of you aren't saints, we're pirates, stated Shanks calmly. Now listen well bandits, you can insult me, you can pour drinks on me, but one thing I can't forgive no matter what the reason, nobody hurts my friends. Haguma laughed this treat off and sent his men to kill the pirates. Then Beckman stepped forward and, using his rifle as a club, beat all of the bandits in a matter of minutes. Haguma, realizing how screwed he was tried to defend his actions by saying Luffy started it. Shanks easily dismissed this, saying they'd just turn in the bandits' bounty. The leader of the downed bandits threw a smoke bomb and escaped in the confusion, taking a beaten Luffy with him. Haguma went out to sea on a small dingy with Luffy and, seeing as he didn't need the kid as a hostage anymore, cruelly kicked Luffy into the ocean where he immediately started to drown. Haguma was so busy laughing at Luffy's expense that he didn't notice the huge shadow rays up behind him. By the time he turned around, he and his boat were already being swallowed whole by a large, ill-like sea king. 
The large serpent then tried to snatch up a struggling Luffy, but he was pulled out of the way just in time by Shanks. Get lost. Shanks stated while giving the Sea King a look that would make most men lose control of their bowels. The Sea King immediately swam off leaving a sobbing Luffy and Shanks bobbing in the ocean. Makino told me what happened. Thanks for sticking up for us Luffy. Luffy continued to sob and Shanks said, Oh come on Luffy, boys don't cry. But, Shanks, your arm. Luffy cried out while looking at the bleeding stump that used to be Shanks' left arm. It's nothing, just an arm. As long as you're alive. Luffy learned a valuable lesson that day. That the sea could be a very dangerous place, which was why Shanks didn't want the boy to become a part of his crew. However, Luffy soon noticed a problem. They were in the middle of the ocean with no boat in sight. Since Shanks' lifeboat drifted off during the excitement and Haguma's boat was in the belly of an overgrown eel. Luffy then noticed how pale Shanks was starting to look as well as the amount of blood pouring out of his new handicap. I've got to do something. Luffy thought, Shanks may die, and it will be all my fault. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, and that his newfound hero's life may be in danger, Luffy gathered on previously unseen determination in himself. I've got to save him. I can't let him die like this. Stupid body won't let me swim. Please, give me the strength to save him. Let me dot 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 ha. Huh. Luffy then noticed a change to his body. While he might feel as natural as he normally did, he realized he was no longer sinking. In fact, he was swimming. He also noticed that his body felt more powerful in a way and it felt like he could hold his breath longer. And when he breathed in it almost felt like he was taking air in from the top of his head. As this was happening, Shanks was busy thinking on the fastest way to get to land. Okay, I have no boat and I'm fairly injured with a seven-year-old who can't swim. It'll be tough, but I should be able to make it back to land and to a doctor with plenty of time to spare. Now to grab Luffy and dot 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 what the... Shanks noticed he was no longer holding onto a small child. Instead he was gripping the dorsal fin of a young dolphin. Luffy, is that you? Shanks asked incredulously. Yeah Shanks, it's me. Looks like I learned how to swim after all. And with a devil's fruit too. The porpoise happily chirped no time to question it. We better get you back to land. Shanks nodded dumbly as Dolphin shot through the water with him holding on tight. This kid, he just continues to surprise me. Shanks mentally chuckled. Time skip. A few weeks had passed since the bandit incident, and it was now time that the red-haired pirates had to set sail from Windmill Village. Luffy was standing before Shanks as the pirate captain asked the young boy if he was upset over their leaving. Yea but, I won't force you to take me with you any longer. I'll become a pirate by myself, said Luffy. Ha, <laughs> chuckled Shanks before sticking out his tongue at the Chimera boy and saying teasingly, I wouldn't take you even if you begged me. You don't have what it takes to be a pirate. Luffy got a large tick mark on his forehead and shouted back at Shanks, Yes I do. One day I'll find a crew that is as strong as yours, and then I'll find the world's biggest treasure, and become king of the pirates. As his crew looked on in amusement, Shanks said, Oh, you want to be bigger than us, huh? Well then, reaching up, Shanks took the straw hat that he had on his head and placed it on top of Luffy's head saying, This hat is my gift to you. This is my favorite hat, you know. So when you become a great pirate in the future, return that hat to me. With that, the red-haired pirates hauled anchor and sailed off, leaving the waving townsfolk and the crying Luffy in the distance. They were not seen in the village again for many, many years. Time skip. It had been ten years since the red-haired pirates had left Windmill Village. The villagers were once again gathered around the ports this time to bid farewell to a 17-year-old monkey D. Luffy. Luffy had changed a bit over the years. What was once a small boy was now an average height young man with lean, athletic muscles if you looked closely. He still carried the small scar under his left eye, but his wardrobe had changed drastically. He now wore a button-down red vest and jean shorts that cut off slightly above the knees. He wore simple sandals on his feet and had Shank's straw hat on top of his raven black hair. Also added to his attire was a semi-large bowie knife tucked into a sheath located on his belt with a red handle and a gold guard over the blade. Currently was on a small skiff about a mile away from his village's harbor when the water in front of his boat started to bubble and the large eel monster from his childhood suddenly burst from the ocean's depth. Oh hey, called Luffy, you come to see me off. The Sea King nodded his large head before causing a small wave that propelled Luffy's skiff forward with the power of a jet ski. Laughing, Luffy turned around and waved goodbye to the oversized eel who again nodded its head before diving back down beneath the waves. What caused this sudden change in behavior you may ask? Well over the years, Luffy had perfected his chimera powers to the point where he could become any animal, as well as any animal-human hybrid, so long as he knew what said animal looked like. A few years ago, Luffy was able to turn himself into a sea king almost identical to the one near Windmill Village. As an animal himself, Luffy was able to talk to the large sea monster and was able to befriend it as well as most of the animals nearer on the island where he grew up. Ha! <laughs> Luffy chuckled before loudly announcing to the heavens, I'll become the Pirate King. 
Little did Luffy or anyone in the world at the time know that this one small act would lead to world-changing events and life-changing adventures. This is the story of Straw Hat Luffy. It has been a few days after Luffy set sail to start his life as a pirate. Currently we find him lying back in his small skiff enjoying the calm weather. He looks completely unconcerned despite the fact that he is currently heading straight towards a gigantic whirlpool. Ha! <laughs> Who would have thought I would get into such a huge disaster? How careless of me! Luffy stated with a large, slightly idiotic smile on his face. I could transform into something that could swim or fly. But I honestly don't think that swimming would help me in this situation. And I have no idea where the nearest island is, so flying's out. He said while bopping his fist into his other hand in an aha moment. He was so caught up in his musings that he didn't even notice that he was already being sucked into the whirlpool. Scene break. On a remote island we see a ship docked near land. What is strange is that the ship has a swan head mast and is decorated in more hearts than a Valentine's Day card. On top of the ship flew a Jolly Roger, also decorated in hearts. This was a pirate ship, owned by the feared Iron Mace Alveda, the self-proclaimed most beautiful in all the seas. The woman herself looked like the byproduct of an inbred redneck relationship with morbid obesity running in the family. The grotesque woman was also wearing cowgirl-style clothing and had a huge spiked iron mace strung casually over her shoulder. This abomination to self-respecting women everywhere was currently checking her ship for dust. Unsatisfied with the results, brutally beat the man in charge of cleaning over the head with her mace. Kobe, what's the most beautiful thing in all the seas? The sea cow called out. W dot dot w dot 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 why you of course Lady Alveda, stammered a small, glasses-wearing boy with pink hair. It was quite obvious that the boy was expected to lie through his teeth to the woman when asked this question out of fear for his life. This fact was cemented when the hag started to kick the small boy while reminding him how she hated dirty things and that the only reason he was alive was because she valued his navigation skills. After she was done with the beating, Alveda ordered Kobe to clean the ship. Oh, of course Lady Alveda, I'm on my way, Kobe said nervously. Later we find Kobe rolling a large wine barrel to the storehouses for the Iron Mace Pirates. The other crewmen there decided to drink the contents, confident that Alveda wouldn't know, and after not so subtly threatening Kobe not to tell anyone, proceeded to pry the barrel open. Suddenly, the top of the barrel burst open and out popped Luffy like a jack-in-the-box, much to the shock of Kobe and the Iron Mace Pirates. Ah, what a nice nap that was. Looks like I'm saved. I seriously thought I was going to die too exclaimed the straw hat wearing boy before he started to laugh like he didn't have a care in the world. He then took notice of his slack-jawed audience. H.M. Who are you? Luffy asked. Who the heck are you? Came the incredulous reply from the other pirates. One of them further elaborated. Why would someone come out of a wine barrel? Suddenly, an iron mace came spinning through the room with a yell of, Stop slacking off, ringing through the building. The storehouse was immediately flattened to reveal the knocked-out forms of the pirates, with Luffy went rolling into the jungle, with Kobe following close behind. After Alveda showed up the pirates quickly jumped to the wrong conclusion thinking that Luffy was a bounty hunter after Alveda's head that Kobe brought. Meanwhile, Kobe had finally caught up to the straw hat boy and asked if he was alright. After assuring the pink-haired boy that he was fine they gave brief introductions to each other. Luffy then asked Kobe if he had a boat, seeing as his was lost in a whirlpool. The glasses-wearing cabin boy then showed Luffy one of the most pathetic excuses for a boat that has ever graced God's green earth. What made it even sadder was the fact that Kobe had spent the last two years working on the piece of rubbish in order to escape Alveda's fat grip. Kobe then explained how he wanted to be free of Alveda after she took him prisoner one day as he was fishing. And he's been too scared to try and leave since. Luffy, being the happy-go-lucky kind of guy he has tried to cheer him up by saying, You're pretty stupid and useless. You also seem kind of wimpy, I don't like you. Hey, that's Luffy for you, what do you expect? Kobe asked the Pirate King in the making why he was sailing to which he boldly pronounced, I want to become the Pirate King. Kobe then started spouting how crazy, impossible, and suicidal that dream was and was promptly punched in the forehead by Luffy. Luffy said, I'm not afraid of dying, because it's my dream, and I wouldn't mind dying for it. Besides, I think I can do it, although it'll be pretty tough. Inspired by the older boy's declaration, a now crying Kobe asked, Will I be dot 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 able to accomplish my dream dot 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 if I'm willing to die? Kobe said with increasing determination, Will I be dot 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 able to become a marine? Luffy, I know it will mean becoming enemies, but joining the marines and catching bad guys has always been my dream. Do you think I could do it? I wouldn't know, came Luffy's honest answer. I have to at least try, declared Kobe. I'd rather die trying to escape from here and join the marines than spend the rest of my life as a cabin boy and then I'll be able to arrest people like Alveda. Suddenly, Alveda appeared crushing Kobe's boat with her iron mace saying, Who did you say you were going to arrest Kobe? Did you honestly think that you could escape from me? She then turned to look at Luffy. Is that who you hired to capture me? 
He sure doesn't look like Roar Noah Zoro. Anyway, before you die I want to ask you. What is the most beautiful thing in the sea, Kobe? Before the glasses wearing boy could answer Luffy decided to open his big mouth and ask, Hey Kobe, who's the fat lady? Much to the shock and horror of the surrounding pirates. Luffy, quick, say Lady Alvida is the most. Kobe then thought of the life-changing commitment he made not three minutes ago and, gathering his courage, shouted out, The ugliest, fattest hag on the entire planet. To which Luffy laughed and the other pirates looked like they were about to have a stroke. Now you both can die, screamed Alvida as she swung her iron mace on the two boys. However, to the complete shock of all those present, Luffy calmly walked forward and caught the mace with his bare hand like it weighed nothing at all. What? Impossible. Alvida cried in shock. Sorry, but this thing's too light to hurt me, said Luffy as his body started to shift. Before the stunned pirate's eyes, Luffy shifted into his chimera form, which was a good deal taller than it was when he was a kid, standing at nearly eight feet tall and it now had two bat-like wings jutting from the shoulder blades. W. What the heck are you? exclaimed a shocked Alvida as she hurriedly tried to back away from the hulking monster in front of her. It was too late as Luffy reared back his large, scaled fist and shouted, Chimera Pistol, and smashing his fist into the pirate captain's face, sending the sea cow flying back unconscious into her surrounding crew. Luffy smiled showing the crew a mouth full of razor-sharp teeth in his lion-like head and said in a more growling voice, Prepare a boat for Kobe. He wants to join the marines, so stay out of his way. Scene break. You actually ate the chimera fruit. That's amazing, said Kobe as he and Luffy set sail on a small skiff, courtesy of the Iron Mace Pirates. After getting over his initial shock, Kobe started to bombard Luffy with questions from his powers to what he plans to do in order to become the Pirate King. To the pink-haired boy's surprise, he found that their current destination was to recruit the famous pirate hunter Roranoa Zoro from the next town where Kobe plans to sign up for the Marines. Kobe started rapidly telling Luffy why that would be a bad idea, but Luffy just simply laughed it off as they sailed into the horizon. In a galaxy far, far away dot 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 oops, my bad. On a small boat somewhere in the East Blue, we find Luffy and Kobe a few days after the Alvida incident sailing towards the topic of the two boys' conversation, one infamous pirate hunter, Roranoa Zoro. Kobe was fervently telling Luffy why it would be a bad idea to recruit the swordsman due to his reputation as a monster and bloodthirsty hound. But Luffy decided to see him first before deciding whether or not to have the hunter join his crew, much to Kobe's dismay. Shortly afterwards the duo find themselves on an island with the local marine base in the center of town. Luffy congratulated Kobe on finding land so fast while the former cabin boy tried to explain to the future pirate king that he needed to understand the basics of navigation or at least find a navigator, if he planned to sail the seas. Luffy's response was to completely ignore him and look for food. After a quick meal at a local inn, Luffy and Kobe prepare to part ways when Luffy again brings up searching for Zora. The response from the other customers at the inn was simultaneous as they all suddenly jumped up, ran to the other side of the room, and stared at Luffy and Kobe like they had the plague. Kobe, trying to change the subject, mentioned to Luffy how he noticed that the marine base was ran by a captain named Morgan. It was by some strange workings in the universe that each and every one of the inn's patrons jumped into the air, flipping tables and sending tableware flying everywhere while striking poses like a model having a stroke. After observing the odd behavior of the townsfolk, Luffy and Kobe paid their bill and quickly exited the inn while discussing what the heck just happened. Luffy seemed to be under the impression that CPT. Morgan was not liked by the townsfolk while Kobe, in his slightly delusional state of mind, seemed to think that it was impossible for a marine to do wrong. After walking a ways the Chimera boy and the hopeful marine made it to the front of the base which just screamed do not enter. Luffy quickly climbed to the top of the surrounding wall while looking for Zora. In the middle of the courtyard hung a figure on a cross with his arms bound by rope. The figure revealed to by a man only a few years older than Luffy with a black bandana on top of his short, curiously green-colored, hair. The man had on a plain white t-shirt and black pants on with a sash wrapped around his waist. The man had a look on his face that said annoy me and I'll kill you before you can blink. Kobe, after much freaking out, identified the man as Roranoa Zoro. Zoro spotted the two and tried to talk them into untying him. Luffy, of course, was all for it while Kobe, also of course, was highly against it. The argument between the two was interrupted when a ladder suddenly was placed on the wall near both boys and a small girl climbed up while making shushing sounds to the duo. The girl quickly ran up to Zoro and offered him two rice balls which Zoro denied stating he wasn't hungry, even though it had been weeks since his last meal, and tried to get the girl to leave. Suddenly one of the gates opened to reveal a boy around Kobe's age with the face of a pug with a helmet-shaped haircut and dressed in a suit that made him look like a pimp. The boy was flanked by several marines and was revealed to be CPT, Morgan's son, Helmepo. After berating Zoro for picking on little kids, Helmepo saw the food the girl was offering Zoro. 
Look, here are some tasty rice balls. Helmeppo then snatched up one of the rice balls and took a bite before spitting it out and telling the girl off for having put sugar in the place of salt, before grabbing the other rice ball and stomping it into the ground. The girl started tearing up over her now crushed rice balls, but immediately froze when Helmeppo stated the law that Morgan had placed, being that any who aid criminals will be executed. The spoiled brat then turned to one of the marines and ordered him to throw the girl over the fence and threatened to tell his father if the marine didn't comply. The man walked over to the girl and apologized before suggesting that she curl up into a ball to prevent too much damage. Luffy quickly caught the falling girl as she was thrown out of the base. The bowel cut teen congratulated Zoro on his endurance and reminded him of their deal where he had to stay tied up with no food for one month and he would then be a free man. When the boy left, Zoro looked up to see Luffy standing in front of him, so, I hear you're a bad guy. Didn't I tell you to get lost? Zoro said in a voice that would make most men run for the hills. You're out here in the open with what to show for it. Are you really as strong as people say? Luffy continued to question the pirate hunter. What's that got to do with you anyways? Asked an annoyed Zoro. You know, if that were me, I'd have probably starved by now. Luffy was grinning by now. Well I have way more fortitude than you ever have, which exactly why I'm not going to die. The pirate hunter smirked and watched as Luffy turned to leave before calling out, Wait up. That rice ball, would you pick it up for me? Luffy bent down and picked up the crushed rice ball and commented that it was little more than a ball of mud. Just shut up and give it to me. Zora spat out before swallowing what was left of the rice ball with a look that made it seem like he would barf and said, Would you tell that little girl, the rice ball was delicious. Much to Luffy's amusement and pleasure, since he had just found the perfect first mate, Luffy left the square and returned to Kobe and the little girl whose name was Rika, and then retold to them exactly what Zoro had said. Kobe started to wonder whether Zoro was actually a bad guy, only to be berated by Rika who then explained the reason that Zoro was tied up, being that he had sacrificed himself for the sake of Rika and her mother by killing Helmeppo's pet wolf that the boy let run loose and almost killed the girl. When Rika had finished recounting how Zoro ended up tied to the stake, a crash was heard from the street behind them. Turning around to see what had caused the ruckus, Luffy, Kobe and Rika saw the one known as Helmeppo, the captain's son, cockily strutting down the street and having all the townspeople bow to him on threat of telling his father. The helmet-haired boy then started spouting of his gripes of boredom, even suggesting that to help clear that boredom he could execute Zoro. Hearing the captain's son speak of potentially killing Zoro, Luffy walked over to the boy and spoke to him. Did I hear you were going to execute that pirate hunter in the crucifixion yard? Helmeppo laughed and, puffing out his cheeks in a mocking manner, then stated that he never had any plans to do otherwise, and before he could finish his sentence beyond that, Luffy backhanded him like the pimp the other boy dressed as, much to the shock of the crowd. Helmeppo pulled himself up with the help of his guards crying out in pain, You, you hit me. Helmeppo screamed while holding his face, but pulled himself together enough to blurt out, My father is Captain Morgan. Luffy's glare hardened, like I care. If you want to fight, fight me yourself. The boy scampered away and called out before leaving, you'll care when he executes you. Luffy then declared that he would make Zoro his crewmate before storming off to the marine base with Kobe in tow. Back at the crucifixion yard, Zoro was startled awake by the sudden presence of Luffy, oh, it's you again, what are you doing here this time? Luffy looked at the pirate hunter and grinned, I figure I'll get you out of those bindings and then you can join my pirate crew. I'm currently looking for members to join me. Zoro scoffed at the proposition, forget it, I'll never stoop that low to join with a criminal. Luffy looked at the man with a bemused expression. But you're already known as a bloodthirsty demon of a bounty hunter, aren't you? Who cares what they think? The point is that I have never once done anything that I regret. I will survive these next ten days. After that I'll do what I set out to achieve. Luffy's expression became completely blank for only a few moments, and only changed when Luffy up and declared that Zoro would be a part of his crew, despite Zoro's obvious complaints. I've heard you could be the best swordsman in these parts. Zoro's complaints died. Well yeah, but that idiot captain's son took my swords away, and he's keeping them in that base over there. Luffy looked at the base in question and turned back to Zoro. I can go and get them for you, but if I do then you'll have to join my crew. And to this, Zoro exclaimed his annoyance once more with the young captain's disregard for his refusal, while Luffy simply laughed and sped off to the main building. Meanwhile, on top of said building, a group of marines was lifting up a giant statue of CPT. Axe hand Morgan while Helmeppo was trying to convince the man himself to go after Luffy for hitting him. He had little success on the matter, because as it turns out the only reason Morgan never hit his son was because he was too worthless to hit, which he exclaimed as he punched Helmeppo square in the face. Morgan was revealed to be a tall muscular man with metal plating covering his lower jaw and a huge axe attached to where his right arm should be and had a marine jacket covering most of his body. He is shown to be incredibly cruel and narcissistic when, 
After he attacks a marine for refusing to execute Rika, he boasts on how his rank makes him the most powerful one on the island and the statue would help symbolize that fact. Meanwhile, Luffy found himself to be incredibly lost before he noticed noises coming from the top of the marine base, thinking there was someone there who he could ask for directions. Luffy took on a look of concentration. Suddenly, his legs morphed into the legs of a cricket and, backing up a little bit, gave a cry of cricket hopper, jumped high enough that he reached the roof of the building. Unfortunately, Luffy underestimated his jump and started to go over the building. Fortunately, there was a large eyesore, I mean statue, that he was able to grab onto to stop his ascent. This caused the symbol of vanity to topple over and shatter to a thousand pieces, much to Morgan's horror and everyone else's shock. S. Sorry, came Luffy's weak apology. Capture him. I'm gonna kill him, screamed the captain, with the marines hurriedly complying. Before the marines could grab him, Luffy grabbed Helmeppo and dragged him off to find Zoro's swords. The marines were about to give chase when they noticed Kobe in the courtyard trying to free Zoro from his bonds, which Morgan quickly ordered them to be executed. Down in the courtyard Zoro was trying to tell Kobe to run away but he replied, You shouldn't be arrested. I can't stand those kinds of marines. That's why I'm going to become a real marine. Just like Luffy is determined to become the Pirate King. Much to Zoro's shock, suddenly, a bullet grazed Kobe's shoulder as it was shot from the base's tower. Meanwhile, Luffy was dragging Helmeppo through the base by his neck while demanding to know where Zoro's swords are. Helmeppo finally gasped out they were in his room and directed Luffy to it. Back at the courtyard Zoro tried getting the injured Kobe to run away, but Kobe refused and told Zoro about his planned execution, stating the marines never intended on freeing him. Suddenly they were surrounded by marines with their rifles pointed at them and ordering them not to move. It was at that moment Luffy discovered Zoro's katana and noticed the commotion outside. It looked like this was the end for Zoro and Kobe as Morgan ordered his men to fire. Zoro thought that he couldn't die here and remembered his promise to Kuna, his deceased childhood friend and rival, to become the best swordsman in the world. Just as the marines opened fire, Luffy appeared before Zoro and Kobe, knife drawn, deflecting the bullets with ease. Everyone stared at the straw hat wearing boy in shock as he batted the bullets aside like one would swat at insects. Zoro was wide eyed by the show of seemingly impossible blade work. What the? Who are you? Luffy turned to face Zoro, his grin never having left his face. My name is Monkey D. Luffy, and I'm going to be king of the pirates. Zoro scoffed at the idea, but Kobe piped up in defense of Luffy's dream, stating that he didn't believe at first either, but Luffy's complete determination was what convinced him. On Luffy's back were three swords. He took them off and presented them to Zoro. You know, I found all of these in the same place, but I couldn't tell which was yours, so I took them all. They're all mine, I use a style called Santoryu, and it uses three swords, Zoro said calmly while struggling in his bindings. Luffy pushed the swords towards again and reiterated, look just take them, but just remember that if you do then you'll have defied the government and will be a criminal. I mean, you could choose to just stay there and be executed as well if you want. Zoro smirked, you're a jerk you know that, because I either choose to side with you or I die here on these sticks, so let's do this. Luffy started pulling on the ropes but Zoro just told him to place one of the katana in his mouth. Placing one of the swords in Zoro's mouth, Luffy stood back and watched as in moments, the swords man freed himself, drew all of his swords and then proceeded to block a group of eight marines as they all attempted to attack at the same time. Move an inch, and I'll cut you down. Zoro glared at the marines despite his back being to them. Looking up, Zoro addressed Luffy, Alright, since I'm now a criminal for having fought the marines, so I'll become a pirate, but I'll be out to accomplish my goal and you are never to forget that. Luffy asked what his goal was and Zoro just smirked to be nothing less than the greatest swordsman this world has to offer. So if I have to give that up along the way, I'll cut you down before making you apologies to me. The world's greatest swordsman, heh, sounds nice and the king of the pirates would have nothing less than the best on his crew. Luffy grinned at the response that Zoro gave. From this point onward, criminal or not, my name will be known throughout the world. Zoro's last statement was then followed by Morgan's demanding that the marines kill the three people in the yard, being Luffy, Zoro and Kobe. Luffy grinned at this and said, let's get wild. Before the marines or his two companions could blink, Luffy sped off towards the marines with his body starting to shift. Where once stood a young teen now ran a large, humanoid cat with black spots. Luffy had turned into a cheetah man. The people in the courtyard heard a cry of cheetah barrage. In seconds the marines found themselves on the ground with either the wind knocked out of them or completely out cold with lumps on the back of their head. The only marine left standing was Morgan as he observed the scene with wide eyes. Luffy suddenly appeared between the captain and his friends, shrinking down into his human form. A gaping Zoro managed to sputter, W. What the heck are you? To which Luffy happily replied, I'm a chimera man. 
The recent displays of strength made the still-conscious Marines question their ability to overcome the two pirates. Morgan's expression darkened, and he immediately ordered every Marine who spouted out weakness to shoot themselves in the head. Zoro braced himself for a fight, but Luffy dashed forward, through the Marines, and slashed at Morgan himself with his knife, only to be blocked by the giant axe head that was in place of his right hand. You pathetic and reckless punks, how dare you defy me? I am the Marine Captain, Axe Hand Morgan. As he said this, Morgan took off his captain's coat. Hi, my name's Luffy. Luffy stood, completely unaffected by Morgan's attempt at intimidation. When Luffy had finished talking, Morgan rushed the teen with a sideways swipe which Luffy E.C. jumped over, turning around to face his opponent. Morgan then brought his axe hand down which split the earth but once more, Luffy had leapt safely into the air. While airborne, Luffy sheathed his blade and suddenly shifted his legs to that of a mule and with a cry of donkey dropkick kicked Morgan straight in the face, knocking the captain of his feet. Getting back onto his feet, Morgan saw that Luffy was running towards him again, and lifted his axe hand into air once more to bring down on the teen pirate bellowing out a cry for the teen's death. To the shock and surprise of everyone present, Luffy's lower body shifted into a snake's tail and he twisted out of Morgan's attack and belting the marine with his tail back down onto his back. Luffy shifted back to normal and walked over to the down man lifted him by the scruff of his shirt, and started to punch him over and over for having ruined Kobe's dream by soiling the name of the Marines. Pulled its straw hat, look at what I've got. How Meppo's shrill voice cut over the sounds of Luffy's punching. When he realized that he wasn't getting the result he had originally desired he continued calling out. How Meppo was currently holding a gun to Kobe's head and his limbs were all shaking with nerves. Eventually Luffy stopped punching the Marine captain and looked over at Hal Meppo and Kobe. And then Kobe called out and told Luffy not to worry, even if he should have died. Of course, so what will you do now, helmet head? Luffy was grinning as he walked away from Morgan's prone body. And then shifting back into his hybrid cheetah form, grinning a Cheshire cat smile. As he was walking away, Morgan rose from the ground and attempted to cut down the team pirate captain one more time. Zoro noticed Morgan's movement and readied his swords before moving close enough to help Luffy should it be necessary. Cheetah Blitz Luffy said under his breath, and moments later, Helmeppo's head snapped back and he then collapsed on the ground, completely unconscious with Luffy standing where the brat once stood. Behind Luffy, Morgan wasn't in much better shape as he fell back completely unconscious from Zoro's attack. Luffy became human again before he turned to the swordsman and thanked him, only to be told by Zoro that he was just doing his job. Luffy and Zoro turned to the marines and put out a challenge to what had just happened. The two pirates were surprised when the marines then tossed their hats, guns and swords into the air while spouting off that they were free from the corrupt captain. Later, both Zoro and Luffy were enjoying a lunch in the bar that the Rika's mother worked in and Zoro started to question his captain. So Luffy, you said that you were looking for crew members, how many do you have so far? Still with food in his mouth, Luffy just pointed at Zoro who gawked at the prospect then please tell me you at least have a ship. At this, the Chimera boy pointed to the docks that could be seen from the window and one of the dinghies there. Don't worry so much about the ship for the moment, with just the two of us that will be perfect, for now. Luffy attempted to calm the swordsman from stressing out. We may not have much now, but things will work out to our favor in the end, we just need to be patient. Rika asked Luffy where they would be going when they left town. Well I figure that we'll just sail around until we pick up a navigator and a bigger ship before heading to the Grand Line. Hearing this Kobe started to freak out and worry over his new friends, even though they would be parting ways from here. He tried telling the two about how dangerous the Grand Line is but Luffy just waved it off saying they'd be fine. Zoro then pointed out to Kobe to be careful that the marines never find out about his time on Alvida's ship because he would be considered a pirate and would never be allowed in the marines if that happened. As the people conversed within the bar, the marines started gathering at the door and a lieutenant entered the room. I've heard that the two of you are pirates, is that true? Getting a nod of assent, the marines ordered that the two of them leave town immediately, even though they were happy for the assist with Morgan. Zoro and Luffy just smirked and started to leave. When the lieutenant asked whether Kobe was with them Luffy started to tell them about how Kobe had been Alvida's cabin boy for two years, causing the pink-haired boy to strike Luffy in the face. Luffy in turn, then started punching Kobe and was told to stop by the marines allowing Luffy to start smirking. At the docks Luffy and Zoro were both relishing in the very pirate feel that was joined with their current departure of the town. When they just finished unfastening the boat, they heard Kobe thank them and turned to see the newest member of the marine alongside the mother and daughter of the small bar. Out at sea, both Zoro and Luffy were relaxing and Luffy told Zoro to get comfortable since they were just heading where the wind took them for the moment and he was grinning widely at the future prospects for adventure. We find Luffy with his first and so far only crewmate Zoro on their dingy a few days after the Morgan incident planning their next move. Ugh, so hungry, moaned Luffy. 
Well, planning in the terms of two knuckleheads that is. Zoro started to berate Luffy for his lack of navigation skills while Luffy just said he was just wandering and asked Zoro if that was what he did as a pirate hunter. As it turns out Zoro had left his home to find a certain man and had gotten lost. So the pirate hunting was just to pay for his travels. This led to a brief argument between captain and crew member before both collapsed on the floor of the boat with growling stomach. They suddenly saw the shape of a bird fly overhead in the distance and Luffy got a clever idea on catching the bird to eat, spreading out his arms which started to sprout feathers. Luffy suddenly turned into a full-blown red-tailed hawk and flew up to the bird. The problem was that the bird was a lot bigger up close and was able to snag the smaller bird boy up in its beak and started to fly off. Luffy quickly changed back into his human form but found his head still caught in the bird's beak. Normally someone with Luffy's powers would just transform into something too big for the bird to eat, but since Luffy is kind of a moron and also still wanted to catch the bird to eat that thought did not cross his mind. Zoro in a panic started frantically rowing after his bird Jack Captain. Soon Luffy found himself being carried to an island with a bizarre, circus-themed ship docked at the harbor when suddenly a cannonball was fired, hitting the bird who was carrying him and caused him to crash into the town below. Unknown to Luffy he just crashed next to a trio of pirates who were chasing an attractive girl around Luffy's age with orange-red hair and wore a t-shirt with a short skirt. The reason for the chase was that the young woman had stolen a map from the pirates that led to the Grand Line, and the pirates had to return it before their captain found out and killed them. As Luffy pulled himself up from the small crater his fall created and was wondering where the heck he was, the young girl suddenly started calling him boss and said she'd leave the rest to him before running off. Luffy was trying to figure out what was going on, completely oblivious to the three pirates coming up behind him. Five seconds later the three thugs found themselves with their faces planted in the ground courtesy of Luffy when one of said thugs knocked off his straw hat with a punch. Luffy turned and saw the girl from earlier sitting on the roof of a nearby building who introduced herself as Nami and was a thief who stole from pirates. She then asked if the pirate captain wanted to partner up with her, to which Luffy flatly refused before walking away. Nami quickly jumped off the roof she was on and followed the young captain asking him about why he got so mad at the pirates for touching his hat to which Luffy replied, It's my treasure. Nami took Luffy into one of the nearby deserted houses while Luffy told the pirate thief on how he was separated from his crew. Name in turn told Luffy on how all the houses were abandoned thanks to the town being overrun by pirates led by the fierce pirate captain Buggy the Clown. She explained on how Buggy was a cannon-happy maniac who once destroyed a town due to some local children making fun of his nose, and how it's said that he has devil fruit abilities. Luffy then asked Nami if she would rob the empty town to which she flatly replied no, saying she only stole from pirates and hoped to gain a hundred million bri in order to buy a certain village. She then explained how she would use the map she stole from the Buggy pirates in order to find the Grand Line and get the money from pirates there. Nami then repeated her offer on the two partnering together in order to gain Buggy's treasure. Luffy, using his head for once, asked the redhead if she knew about navigation to which she replied, Of course I know. Don't look down on me because as for navigation skills, well, there aren't a lot of people who know more about it than I do, especially since I love the sea. Luffy gave a whoop of joy and told Nami that his crew was heading to the Grand Line and asked her if she would join his pirate crew, to which Nami got a dark look on her face and said there was no way that she would join up with pirates. She then asked if his hat contained a map to his treasure and Luffy explained on how the hat was a gift from a friend that symbolized his promise to become a great pirate captain with the best crew on the ocean. Nami then told Luffy flatly that she hated pirates and the only thing she loved was money and tangerines. Luffy then asked again if she would join his crew to which Nami was again about to reject but then gave a mischievous smirk. Nami then told the Chimera captain that she would join his crew, on the condition that he went with her to her buggy. Luffy, being none the wiser, quickly agreed and started to walk off, not noticing Nami grabbing a long rope and sneaking up behind him. Scene break. Buggy the Clown was a man in his mid-thirties and wore a colorful orange striped shirt with an elaborate captain's hat that had tassels on it over his bluish hair, as well as a large red cape strung over his shoulders. He had crossbones tattooed on his face and red lipstick on giving him the appearance of a clown dressed as a pirate. But his most distinguishing feature was the red bulbous nose on his face that made him look even more clown-like. He was about to execute the three pirates that failed to capture Nami when another of his crew members came up to him and informed him that the map thief had returned on her own. Nami then walked in with a hog-tied Luffy and proceeded to tell the clown captain that she was tired of working for Luffy and was wanting to join the buggy pirate, to which everyone present stared at her in wide-eyed disbelief before the circus-themed pirates broke down in laughter before throwing Luffy, still hog-tied, in a cage and welcomed their newest crewmate with an elaborate party. Everyone, minus Luffy, seemed to be having a great time. Nami was drinking her new crewmates under the table while having a mischievous grin on her face. 
thinking she'd be able to rob the buggy pirates blind when they all fall into a drunken slumber. Meanwhile, our favorite pirate captain who doesn't have a ridiculous large red nose was trying to bite his way through the bars. One would wonder why Luffy didn't just change into a smaller animal like a mouse to escape. Well, it could be that he didn't want to reveal his abilities to a room full of enemy pirates that could easily kill him while he's vulnerable. Or the more likely scenario is that the thought never even crossed his mind. As Luffy was running up his future dentist bill, Nami walked over and playfully asked her captain how he was doing. Luffy had a few choice words to say to the redhead, involving yelling at her to get him out and asking if she could bring him some food since he was still hungry. Nami brought the boy a mouthful of food which he quickly devoured, and Luffy's mood instantly shifted to cheerful and asked the girl if she'd become their navigator again. After heatedly denying that offer, Nami told the Chimera captain that if all went well she might free him after she stole the other pirate's treasure. Suddenly, Buggy stood up and announced it was time to punish Luffy for his part in stealing the map. After asking Luffy if he had any last requests, to which Luffy asked to be let go, the clown captain ordered his men to prepare the special Buggy Ball. The crew brought forth a cannon and a strange red cannon ball with the ship's Jolly Roger painted on the front. Buggy decided to give his captive and new crewmate a demonstration of his power and had the now-loaded cannon aimed at a row of nearby houses. As soon as the cannon was fired, the entire row of houses was reduced to a smoldering pile of splinters. Satisfied that he had his audience's attention, Buggy aimed the cannon at the still-captured Luffy and ordered Nami to light the fuse to prove her loyalty by blowing away her old boss. Nami tried to look for a way out of her current predicament because, while she hated pirates and was a thief she was no murderer. Seeing the girl's dilemma, Luffy told the cat burglar that she made an oath and now she had to find the courage to stand by it. Before Nami could think on what she should do the matchbox was yanked out of her hands by a member of the crew who was becoming impatient with her lack of action and moved to light the match himself. Before the fire touched the fuse of the cannon, Nami pulled out a collapsible staff and smashed the pirate in the face before she could contemplate the consequences of her actions. As the buggy pirate stared in shock and anger Nami declared that she'd never stoop to a pirate's level and said that a pirate took someone precious from her. Luffy commented on how that's why she didn't like pirates. The young captain then noticed that the fuse on the cannon pointed at his cage was lit and proceeded to bite at the bars with a greater ferocity. As the fuse got smaller Buggy ordered his men to kill the backstabbing thief, to which they circus-themed crew immediately rushed over to do. Nami tried keeping the attacking pirates at bay with a swing of her staff, but the pirates used acrobatic moves to dodge the strike. Nami noticed the almost completely burnt fuse and ran over, grabbing it with her bare hands in hopes of stopping the cannon from firing. Then four pirates tried to jump her unprotected back but a figure suddenly appeared and smashed the incoming pirates in the face with two of his sheathed swords asking them how many pirates it took to fight one girl. Luffy noticed who the stranger was and happily cried, Zoro. As Nami and the buggy pirates realized that the newcomer was the infamous pirate hunter Zoro, the swordsman walked over to the cage his captain was locked in while berating him for being reckless. Buggy then appeared next to the green-haired pirate and asked if he was after his head but Zoro said his pirate hunting days were done. Buggy then declared that killing the recently turned pirate would make him even more famous and proceeded to charge at him with knives. Zoro proceeded to cut the man into three pieces to the shock of Luffy and Nami and to the growing amusement of the buggy pirates. The circus crew members proceeded to chuckle darkly while the straw hat crew demanded the key before breaking out into laughter. Suddenly, Zoro stiffened as it was revealed that a knife was lodged into his back by a floating hand. The pieces of buggy started to float into the air and smugly told the shocked teens that he ate the chop chop fruit, so no matter how much he sliced to pieces he can't be killed. Just as buggy moved to finish off the down swordsman, Luffy said a taboo, stabbing someone in the back is dirty, you big nosed creep. Who are you calling big nosed? Screamed buggy as he shot his hand holding a knife straight into Luffy's face. To the shock of all those present, Luffy was able to catch the knife with his teeth and broke the blade in half and declared that he'd clobber the nose sensitive pirate. Luffy then told Zoro to run away and Zoro, understanding what his captain wanted, ran to the cannon while blocking Buggy's knives thrown his way and was able to flip the cannon so it pointed directly at the Buggy pirates. Nami was then able to light the much shorter fuse and a portion of the roof they were on was blown away in the ensuing blast. Zoro ran over to Luffy's cage and was about to lift it up to carry him away when a thought suddenly struck him. Hey Luffy, he asked with a steadily increasing twitch to his eyebrow. Couldn't you just turn into a smaller animal like a mouse to escape from there? Luffy looked confused for a moment before gaining an aha. Face while Zoro face palmed while muttering idiot. Luffy quickly shrunk down while gaining whiskers, rounded ears, and a tail before disappearing into the ropes that bound him. A mouse wearing a shrunken version of Luffy's outfit scurried out of the cage before shooting back up to human form. Luckily nobody but Zoro noticed the change as the roof was still covered from smoke due to the previous explosion. 
The two pirates grabbed their future navigator as she tried to see through the smoke and quickly bolted into the town. The trio stopped a few blocks away due to Zoro needing to rest his wounded body. They found themselves in front of a pet shop with a white dog with old battle wounds standing guard out front. Zoro sat down for a rest while Luffy was investigating the dog to see why it wasn't moving, only to get bit in the face after poking the dog in the eyes. Nami meanwhile was trying to figure out both why Zoro risked himself for Luffy and how Luffy was able to escape from his cage so easily. Luffy was and the dog were wrestling on the ground when an elderly man with a poodle-like haircut wearing glasses and armor while carrying a spear came along and demanded the boy to stop pestering the dog, whose name turned out to be Choo Choo. The old man introduced himself as Boodle, the mayor of the town they were in. After allowing Zoro to rest and recover from his injuries in home, the mayor proceeded to feed the guard dog and proceeded to explain why the dog was standing guard like that. Boodle explained that the store was opened 10 years ago by his friend who was Choo Choo's owner, however the man passed away several months ago and the dog had been guarding the store ever since. Despite popular belief that the dog was waiting for his owner to return, the mayor claimed that Choo Choo most likely knew his owner was dead and he was guarding the store because it was his owner's, and now his, treasure. Suddenly, a terrifying roar went through the village. Panicked, Boodle exclaimed that as was Moji the animal tamer and first mate of the buggy pirates. Nami and Boodle quickly hid behind a house down the street before noticing Luffy wasn't with them. They soon spotted the straw hat wearing boy standing where they were at moments ago with a confused look on his face. Before they could run back to grab him and or hit him over the head for his stupidity a man riding a large lion came into view. The man himself seemed to have white fur covering his chest and head that formed rounded ears on the top while wearing shoes with similar fur on them. The man stood directly in front of Luffy and introduced himself as Moji the animal tamer before mocking the boy on how it looks like his friends abandoned him after their escape. Luffy simply commented that the man was wearing a weird hat, to which said man angrily pointed out was his hair. Moji tried to intimidate the boy by saying he could control all manner of animals and proceeded to try to get Choo Choo to shake his hand only to receive a bite on the arm for his troubles. The man proceeded to demand that Luffy tells him where Zoro was and Luffy immediately said no way to. The lion, named Richie, jumped at the boy who swiftly dodged only to be smacked through several buildings by Richie's paw. Moji was about to continue his hunt for Zoro when Richie went in the direction of the pet food store with Choo Choo growling dangerously. With Luffy he quickly recovered from his ordeal having being hit worse by his grandpa, and proceeded to smile toothily while saying he'd clobber the animal trainer before asking Nami if she'd be their navigator again. After meeting up with Nami and Boodle, who were both incredibly shocked to see he was largely unhurt after going through buildings via giant cat punch, the trio came upon a heart-wrenching sight. Choo Choo the dog was giving mournful barks as the store he guarded burned. Regardless of the fresh claw wounds on his white fur you could tell by the tears falling from the dog's eyes that it wasn't the physical pain that hurt so much. Luffy stared at the scene while remembering the old mayor's explanation on how the store was the dog's treasure with a dark shadow on his face. Moji was riding on top of Richie nursing a dog bite wound to the arm while the oversized lion munched on a battered box of pet food they stole from the store before setting it ablaze, receiving minor resistance from the little guard dog. As the duo continued their search for Zoro they came upon a startling sight. The straw hat wearing brat that Richie sent flying earlier was standing unhurt in their path. After getting over his initial shock, Moji sent Richie to try and tear the boy's head off. Luffy, however, just smirked and said, Let me show you how a real lion fights. To both the lion and tamer's shock, the boy in front of them started to grow till he towered over Richie while growing a large mane of black fur as well as razor-sharp teeth and claws. The now human lion hybrid let off a terrifying roar that shattered a few nearby windows and grabbed the other lion under the front legs while lifting it up into the air. Lion Pile Driver the Chimera boy roared as he planted the still-shocked Richie head first into the ground, knocking him unconscious. The now-terrified animal tamer stuttered out, W. What the heck are you, you freak? The now-lion-like boy stalked over to where the petrified pirate was rooted to the spot while cracking his knuckles and explained, Long ago I ate the Chimer Chimera fruit, now I'm an animal man. Moji tried apologizing to the approaching lion man and said he'd pay whatever he wanted. Luffy was having none of that and growled out, I don't want your apology or your money, because that won't bring back Choo Choo's treasure. He gained a dangerous glint in his cat slit eyes and roared out, I came back to clobber you. With that he reared back his fist and punched Moji straight in the face, sending the man into blissful unconsciousness with his pet. Nami and Boodle stood watching over Choo Choo as he stared at the smoldering remains of the pet store. Nami commented on how all pirates were the same and didn't care on who they hurt. She then noticed Luffy, back in human form, walking up and started to rant against him about how this was how pirates acted and how he was no different. The straw hat wearing captain ignored the girl and walked up in front of the dog, placing a battered box of pet food in front of him. 
The pirate then apologized to the dog that he couldn't bring the rest of his treasure back but congratulated him on how hard he must have fought. The dog picked up the box and started to walk away but turned around and started barking what had to be a thank you. Nami meanwhile was busy pulling her foot from her mouth as she watched the pirate do the selfless deed. She went over to apologize to the captain about her outburst when suddenly the mayor started yelling how he couldn't stand living in fear of the buggy pirates anymore and how he was going to fight them now and protect his treasure. The village they worked so hard to build. Suddenly, all the houses on the block they were on were blown away thanks to Buggy's buggy balls. Zoro suddenly sat up from the wreckage that was once the mayor's house saying that was one heck of an alarm clock. The chief then started to run off in the direction of the buggy pirates and said even though he knew it was reckless and stupid he was still going to fight as his duty to the village and its people. Luffy smiled and said that he liked the man and wasn't going to let him die as he watched the mayor's retreating form. Nami agreed to come with the two pirates as temporary allies and let her keep the clown pirate's treasure. The trio came to the center of town to watch Boodle being chalked by one of Buggy's disembodied hands. Acting quickly, Luffy raced over and pulled the hand from the old man's neck. Boodle tried getting up and said it was his fight so the kids couldn't interfere. However, before the mayor could perform a suicidal charge, Luffy knocked the man out saying he was in the way. In reality he was preventing the old man from killing himself. Hey big nose. Luffy yelled up at Buggy, much to everyone in the vicinity's shock and horror. Kill him. Fire the Buggy ball. Buggy roared to his crew. Red Cannonball was fired and Zoro and Nami got out of the way while Luffy stood there looking confident. Before the ball could hit, Luffy was quickly covered with dark hair and a long tail shot out his spine while his feet grew opposable thumbs. The now monkey boy was easily able to catch the speeding cannonball before it could impact and chucked it back at the buggy pirates with a yell of monkey hammer throw. Everyone in the area was still reeling in shock at the boy's transformation and the buggy pirates couldn't dodge the inevitable impact and explosion. Nami asked what the heck was that and Luffy explained his devil fruit powers to the speechless girl. Before more could be said the trio noticed both Buggy and his second mate Kabaji the acrobat had withstood the explosion by using their crewmates and Richie the lion as shields for the blast. Just then Moji awoke and noticed the straw hat wearing captain and quickly explained his powers to Buggy. Buggy, in a fit of rage for not being told earlier, threw the animal tamer directly at Luffy who proceeded to kick the man out of his way. Kabaji then charged at the crew on a unicycle and wielding a sword but was stopped by Zoro. The two proceeded to fight while Luffy kept his attention on Buggy. The two captains prepared to face each other as Kabaji fell unconscious. Nami meanwhile was going through the rubble of Buggy's former base searching for his crew's treasure. Zoro himself passed out due to his wounds but not before correcting a misconception Buggy and his crew had about him and Luffy, that they weren't thieves but pirates. Buggy asked his fellow captain what he wanted from the Buggy Pirates and the Chimera Boy told him that he planned to use their Grand Line map in order for him to become the Pirate King. Buggy scoffed at this notion thinking himself the better pirate and mentioned how the boy annoyed him, just like the red-haired idiot who wore a similar hat annoyed him years ago. Noticing that the clown was talking about his idol, Luffy asked Buggy how he knew Shanks and where he was now. Buggy simply said he wasn't going to tell him and proceeded to produce spring-loaded knives from his shoes before shooting his lower body off like a buzzsaw. Buggy noticed the boy was nowhere to be found after the buzz saw passed where he was standing but noticed a hole in the ground. Luffy suddenly popped up from the ground behind the big-nosed captain as a human mole and sent a clawed fist at the pirate's head yelling whack-a-mole barrage. Buggy was able to dodge the attack by quickly separating his head from his body, causing the mole boy to just barely miss. Buggy then pointed his knife-filled hand at the young captain and shot his arm like a gun before Luffy could dodge underground again. Luffy quickly shifted to human and caught the fast-moving arm before it could spear his head. The attack wasn't over, however, as Buggy then separated his hand from his arm and the hand nicked a side of Luffy's face. What really ticked Luffy off though was the tiny gash the knife caused on the rim of his beloved hat. The Chimera Man yelled at the Chop Chop Man not to mess with his treasure but Buggy didn't listen and instead threw a knife at Luffy causing him to dodge but left his hat unprotected to Buggy's knife-filled hand. The hand speared the hand and took it over to Buggy who proceeded to throw it on the ground and spit on it once he found out it was Shank's hat. Buggy then told his opponent that he and Shanks were both apprentice pirates on the same crew as kids. Luffy then charged at the older man who proceeded to separate his head in preparation for an attack. Luffy had other plans and, while shifting into a minotaur-like creature, rammed Buggy's torso head on in the stomach, causing the head to scream in pain before rejoining his body. Luffy then sat on the clown's stomach, still in his heavy bull form mind you, and wiped the spit off his hat on Buggy's face and demanded that the older captain tells him how he knew Shanks. The man was able to wheeze out over his collapsing lungs on his time together with Shanks and how the redhead accidentally made him swallow the chop chop fruit that Buggy attempted to steal and also caused him to lose his map to an undersea treasure overboard. He then told Luffy how Shanks was able to save him from drowning after he dived after the map.
but told the boy he still resented the man for all he made the clown lose. Buggy then separated his torso that floated up in the air and proceeded to chase after Nami who had just came out of the rubble holding onto the buggy pirate's treasures. Just as Buggy was about to skewer the thief, there was a cry of donkey dropkick, and Buggy let out a scream so high-pitched it broke several windows. Confused, Nami looked at Luffy who transformed his lower body into a donkey's and had kicked Buggy straight in his family jewels. Luffy told Nami to drop the treasure and run but Nami refused saying that it was her treasure now since she was a thief and she just stole the treasure, ergo it's hers. Buggy, in a much higher pitched voice, told the girl she wasn't getting away and proceeded to separate his body into many tiny pieces that flew all over the place. Buggy's head and hands went after Nami while the rest of him distracted Luffy. Luffy then noticed that Buggy's feet couldn't fly so he grabbed them and proceeded to tickle them, stub the toes, and pinch them causing Buggy all sorts of discomfort. While the clown was distracted Nami swung the sack full of treasure at his face hoping to knock him unconscious, but he unfortunately caught it. Before Buggy could counterattack, there was a cry of, Gorilla Pummel, and Luffy appeared only much more muscular and hairy than before, and punched the older man straight in the face, knocking the sad excuse for a pirate out cold. Luffy then went and grabbed the map of the Grand Line but before he could celebrate, Buggy had regained consciousness and his head started floating saying that the fight wasn't over yet. The no-sensitive pirate then called his body parts back to him but something was obviously wrong. The only parts that came back were the hands and feet, making Buggy look like a hysterical version of a midget. Nami then stepped forward and showed Buggy's remaining parts tied up into a neat little package. Luffy congratulated the cat burglar before going into his chimera form and sending Buggy flying into the horizon with a cry of, Chimera uppercut. Luffy then asked Nami once more if she'd join his crew and she agreed to a temporary partnership so long as she gained treasures like what she gained from looting Buggy. Luffy then gathered up his hat, took half the treasure Nami told him to carry, and woke Zoro up from his nap. Before he could go wake the mayor up the rest of the villagers had arrived because they were concerned when Boodle hadn't come back from town. After seeing the mayor's knocked out form they demanded to know who did it. And Nami tried to think of an excuse while Luffy told them that he did it. The villagers then demanded to know if they were pirates to which Luffy confirmed before Nami could shut the kid up. Before they knew it, the straw hat pirates were running for their lives to the docks and when Nami demanded to know why he did such a reckless thing he responded with. Because the villagers loved their mayor so much they'd get mad no matter what excuse we used. The mob was halted in their pursuit thanks to Choo Choo, who stood between the mob and the pirates barking furiously. They made it to the docks and were about to board their respective boats when three buggy pirates, who had a bone to pick with Nami for stealing their ship and treasure, came out. Things might have gotten messy but the moment the three enemy pirates saw Zoro they swam off like the hounds of hell were after them. Wondering what that was all about, the trio got into their ships and were about to sail off when Boodle, who had regained consciousness, ran up to the end of the docks and gave the pirates a heartfelt thank you for all they'd done for the village. The three pirates smiled as they sailed off into the distance, at least until Nami discovered Luffy left the half of the treasure he was carrying with the townspeople in order for them to rebuild their town. After beating his face to a pulp and threatening to throw him in the ocean if he ever pulled that stunt again the three sailed off onto their next big adventure, Luffy, Zoro and Nami were sailing on their two small dinghies a few days after the buggy incident. Nami had graciously fixed Luffy's hat from the knife slashes that buggy gave it and the animal boy couldn't be happier. Soon though both of the boy's growling stomachs told them it was time to eat. However there was barely a loaf of bread to share between the two small ships. Luffy then noticed an island in the distance and decided it would be the perfect opportunity for a new adventure. Luffy quickly steered the boat towards the seemingly deserted island, despite Nami's protest. Once they landed, Luffy quickly jumped out and observed the heavily forested island. Nami reluctantly followed while Zora went back to sleep. Once the duo reached the forest they noticed some really strange animals like a fox with roster-like characteristics, a snake with white fur and rabbit ears, and a pig with a lion's mane. Unknown to Nami, Luffy was studying the animals intently. You see, while Luffy might have the mental maturity of an 11-year-old on a sugar rush, he was quite clever in two aspects, fighting and animals. After obtaining his powers from the Chimera Chimera fruit, he started looking through all sorts of animal books to see different kinds of animals, both real and mythical, to figure out different forms he could take as well as different attacks. He also studied the animals he's seen on the island he grew up in and in the forest his grandfather threw him in as a child to get more ideas. So, whenever Luffy finds new types of animals, he is always sure to study them intently so he can become a more effective fighter. Suddenly, a voice boomed out from seemingly everywhere demanded, Don't come any closer. Get out. I am the guardian of the forest and I demand you leave or face the judgment of the forest. Luffy let his curiosity get the better of him and, ignoring the voice, walked deeper into the forest. Suddenly, the straw hat captain felt his instincts go crazy and, quickly morphing into a kangaroo, 
jumped out of the way of a bullet fired at his back. The voice sounded again but it was more shocked than anything else. Ha. Huh. W what kind of being are you? Nami noticed where the shot came from and tracked it to what appeared to be a large green bush sticking out of a chest with a smoking pistol still in front of it. The two stared at it for a minute while the bush seemed to sweat nervously before a pair of feet came from the bottom of the chest and started to run off before tripping a few feet away. Suddenly, a man's head popped out of the chest and it was revealed that the bush was actually the man's hair. The man yelled for help while the two teens watched with sweat drops on the back of their heads. After helping the shrub-like man, whose name is Gaiman, onto his feet the trio started talking. As it turns out, Gaiman had arrived on the island 20 years ago as a member of a pirate crew and had gotten stuck in the chest after finding a multitude of treasure chests on the top of an extremely tall plateau and was left behind by his crewmate. The man then asked Luffy if he himself had any treasure maps and Luffy explained his map and his dream of going to the Grand Line. Gaiman warned the duo about pirates he'd seen who came back from the Grand Line and how they were shadows of their former selves. Gaiman then explained that he stayed on the island and used the Guardian of the Forest routine to scare away visitors who might try to steal the treasure on the top of the plateau. The Straw Hat pirates were taken to the plateau and Luffy offered to retrieve the treasure for the castaway. Quickly changing himself into a hummingbird, Luffy darted to the top of the plateau and eventually called down that he found the chests, but he wasn't going to bring them down. While Nami started berating her new captain, Gaiman started crying tears of relief, joy, and grief all at once. He understood now that the chests that he'd wanted so long for were empty. Luffy decided to ask the wild man if he would join their crew, in order to make up for the severe disappointment. Gaiman, however, declined stating that he'd grown fond of the island and its exotic animals over the years, and people had come to try and collect the animals as pets. He said he felt it was his duty to guard the animals that had been his friends for 20 years. So, after being given supplies by Gaiman, the Straw Hats set sail onto their next adventure, with Gaiman and the animals waving goodbye on the mysterious island. Scene break. Nami and Luffy were on the decks of their small dinghies debating on what they should do next before heading to the Grand Line. Luffy was busy thinking about food and Zoro gave his input about how they should have more booze on board, but Nami quickly shot down both ideas. She explained that the most important thing at the moment was finding a decent ship that could carry them to the Grand Line, as well as more crew members. They eventually landed on an island that, according to Nami, had a small village located on it. As the crew landed on the island and went to stretch, Zoro noticed four figures on the nearest hillside and asked out loud what they were doing, catching everyone's attention. There was some rustling from the bushes that Zoro was looking at, followed by hysterical screaming, and finally a young man around Luffy's age revealed himself to the group. The boy wore long brown overalls with a sash as a belt and had a bag slung over his shoulder. He had long dark hair with a green bandana tied on top of it but his most distinguishing feature was the incredibly long, Pinocchio-like nose on his face. The boy laughed boisterously and proclaimed, I am the great Captain Yuza, commander of over a thousand ships and eighty million men. This island is under my protection so if you plan to attack, you better leave now or face my wrath. Liar, Nami said not amused by the clearly bluffing boy's antics. Crap, she saw through my lie. Yuzop cried out in a panic while clutching his head and sweating bullets. Nami sweat dropped and said, See, I knew it. Double crap, I admitted that I lied. She's a master of deduction, exclaimed Yuzop dramatically while twisting his body into odd angles while still clutching his head and sweating bullets. At this Luffy cracked up at the other boys' antics and started laughing out loud, much to Yuzop's ire. A little while later the group was taken to one of the local taverns and were engaged in conversation over a meal with Yuzop who was eager to hear about the crew's exploits. Once he found out that they were looking for crewmates in a big ship, the liar thought it sounded like the start of a great adventure. Deciding to help the pirates out, Yuzop told them that their best chance for a ship on the island was to ask the local owner of a large mansion who was the wealthiest person on the island. It turns out the owner was a sickly girl who inherited her fortune from her parents after they died from disease. After hearing that, Nami said that they should look for a ship somewhere else. Yuzop gained a smug look and said that, since they were looking for crewmates, he'd happily join if they let him be the captain. The crew unanimously said no to that in a deadpan voice to which Yuzop face vaulted it. Soon after, the long-nosed boy left the group to attend to personal business and around five minutes later three kids came in calling themselves the Yuzop pirates and demanded to know where their captain was. Luffy then decided to comment on how good the meat he was eating was in the kids, having a very morbid sense of imagination, thought that the crew had eaten their captain. Zoro didn't help matters by jokingly saying that their captain was gobbled up, causing the three youngsters to faint while Zoro laughed and Nami scolded the swordsman. After the Yuzop pirates regained consciousness and Nami explained that they were joking and told them that their captain had left a little while ago to attend to business. One of the kids said that the business was to go visit Kaya, the owner of the mansion, and he would tell her tall tales in order to help her feel better. After hearing that, 
Luffy decided that Usopp was a good person and would be someone he'd be willing to let join the crew. Luffy then thought it would be a good idea to go ask Kaya for a ship, seeing as she would feel better after visiting with Usopp. Dragging his two crewmates along, Luffy headed towards the mansion with the Usopp pirates in tow. Arriving at the mansion, Luffy loudly asked for a ship before he started to climb the gate surrounding the building. Soon the group found Usopp talking to a young girl at her window who could only be Kaya. Usopp did a double take when he noticed the group while Luffy went to Kaya and asked her if she could spare them a ship. Suddenly, a voice called out, What are you doing here? You can't just barge onto private property like this. A man wearing glasses, stripped shoes, and a fancy suit with what looked like two golden turds attached was walking towards the gathering and Kaya introduced the man as her butler Clahador. The man proved to be an exact representation of the decorations on his suit, minus the gold. Clahador told the gathered people to leave the area immediately and denied Luffy's request for a ship. He then spotted Yuzop and called him a lying low-life son of pirate trash, and he should no longer bother Kaya if he was after her money. Kaya berated her butler and told him to stop insulting Yuzop but the man kept running his big yapper and Yuzop, in a fit of anger, slugged the douche square in the face. The long-nosed liar then said that he was proud to be the son of a pirate and that his father was a good man, and he would tolerate no insults towards him. Yuzop then left in a huff of anger, with Luffy following close behind, not that anyone else noticed. The animal boy found Yuzop on a hill overlooking the sea and went to greet him. By which I mean he climbed a nearby tree and scared the crap out of the liar by jumping down from a branch right in front of him. After the long-nosed boy recovered from his mini heart attack, the two settled down and stared out at the sea. Suddenly Luffy said, Yasop was your dad right? You look just like him. This got Yuzop's attention and asked Luffy, how do you know my dad? To which he replied that he met the man when he was young because the pirate was with Shanks' crew. He's with Shanks, came Usopp's incredulous reply. He couldn't believe his dad was with such a famous pirate captain. Luffy told Usopp on how his dad was a great marksman, able to shoot the wings off a fly at 80 paces. He also told the boy how his father would use to constantly brag about him to Luffy and how his dad missed him even though he had to heed the call of a pirate's life. This filled Yuzop with pride as he told Luffy how much he admired his father and Clahador's biting comments really hurt his pride. The young captain asked if he'd ever go to visit Kaya again to which Yuzop said he would but only if the jerk of a butler apologized first. They both then noticed that said jerk was on the beach below the cliff they were on talking to a man with a disturbing resemblance to Michael Jackson, only with blonde hair and a goatee with heart-shaped sunglasses. He even dressed and did the moonwalk like the king of pop. What a rip-off. What the two heard shocked them. As it turns out, Clador was actually the thought-dead pirate Captain Kuro of a thousand plans, and he, along with his first mate Django the Hypnotist, were planning to murder Kaya to get her money. They planned to have their crew, the Black Cat Pirates, attack the town and during the confusion Django would hypnotize Kaya into write out her will and leave everything to her butler Clahador before suffering a fatal accident. This was apparently a plan three years in the making when Kuro decided to quit the pirate life and went on to play the part of the loyal butler to Kaya's family. Yuzop was planning to run into town to warn everyone when Luffy suddenly stood up and yelled down. Hey, don't kill Kaya. We heard everything. While Yuzop looked at him like he was the dumbest person on the planet. Unfortunately, both of them were noticed by the two conspirators, and Django pulled out a ring attached to a string. The Michael Jackson impersonator then said, When I say one, two, Django you will fall into a deep sleep. Ready? One dot 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 two dot 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 J-A-N-G-O. Luffy, who was staring directly at the ring, fell into a deep sleep and took a nosedive off the cliff while Yuzop, who was too busy panicking to look at the ring, watched in horror as the Chimera captain fell to a likely death. Django himself also fell into a deep sleep for staring too intently at the ring. After Kuro woke him up, Django asked if he should kill the other one but the black cat captain said it was alright because even if Yuzop told everyone, no one would believe him due to his reputation as the town's liar. Yuzop ran off into town while the two pirates left the area at a leisurely pace. If any of them actually stayed to investigate, they'd notice Luffy was still alive and still sound asleep because of his animal-like endurance, as well as having experienced worse from his grandpa's training. The fall was just a minor inconvenience to Luffy. The straw hat-wearing boy was awoken several hours later by his crew and the Yuzop pirates and told them everything that happened. Luffy then wondered how he got down the cliff and why he was sleeping while everyone else was thinking of their next course of action. The group went into town and ran into Yuzop who was bleeding from his left arm. Apparently he had tried to warn the town but like Kiro predicted, no one believed him. What was worse was that Kaya didn't believe him either and one of her guards shot him as he tried to convince her. After getting over the shock at seeing Luffy alive and well, Yuzop then told his followers that he made the whole thing up so they wouldn't get hurt trying to back him up. He planned on stopping the pirates before they attacked so no one would know what happened and it would just be another lie to them. 
That was how much the boy loved his village. Admiring his courage, Luffy and his crew agreed to help the long-nosed boy defend his town. Usopp led the group to a hill that lead from the beach to the town and had a narrow path that was flanked by two large cliffs. He told the Straw Hats that it was the main way to get to the town from the slope, so they had to defend it with their lives. The long-nosed boy asked the group what they were best at to evaluate their chances. Zoro was cutting, Luffy was shifting, and Nami was stealing. Usopp his best skill was running and hiding, causing the group to face vault before yelling, You have to fight too. Usopp then got a large amount of oil and poured it down the slope and said that the best way to fight the pirates would be to prevent them from climbing the slope and attacking them from a distance. Soon the sun rose, but there was no sign of the pirates. Suddenly they heard a loud noise coming from the opposite side of the island and Usopp realized, to his horror, that there was another identical slope to the north of the island. He figured since the pirates had their meeting at their current position that they would attack from there. The sniper then said it was a three-minute run to the other side of the island and Luffy took off at superhuman speeds while Nami accidentally pushed Zoro down the oil-slicked slope in her hurry to get to the other side of the island where she realized both their ships and her treasure were at. Luffy realized that he was running the wrong way before he decided to do this the faster way and changed into a horse before galloping towards the northern slope. He met up with Zoro, Nami, and Yuzop at the slope and was able to repel a wave of pirates with Zoro's help. It looked like Nami and Yuzop arrived first and had already fought for a while if Yuzop's wounds were anything to go by. The real fight had just begun. The straw hat pirates and Yuzop stood at the top of the hill, staring at the vicious black cat pirates being led by Django the hypnotist. The enemy pirates all seemed to wear fake cat ears and had black eyeliner on, which you would think would make them seem comical but in reality gave them a slightly fierce look. Luffy and Zoro seemed calm if slightly out of breath from running the entire island while Yuzop and Nami looked ready to pee their pants. Nami took this moment to yell at the two newly arrived teammates. What took you two idiots so long? Zoro seethed, me. You're the one who pushed me down an oiled-covered hill. What are you blaming me for, huh? Luffy meanwhile laughed sheepishly before saying, Well you guys didn't tell me which direction north was so. Yuzop looked at the straw-hatted captain incredulously. You're the one who ran off before I could tell you. He said in an exasperated tone. Well, we're here now so no problem right? Luffy said with a carefree grin. Meanwhile, the black cat pirates Luffy and Zoro knocked down in their entrance were picking themselves up while wondering how a couple idiots were able to send them flying. Django looked at his crew with disdain and said, Hey, you idiots couldn't have been so easily bested by one blow from those fools are you? Get up. The longer we make Kira wait the more likely it is he'll kill us, and I don't know about you guys but I happen to like living. Django made it a point to do various Michael Jackson-like moves while driving his point home. The hypnotist then pulled out a ring on a string and stated firmly, If the opponent is strong then we must be stronger. Pulling his hat over his eyes while swinging the ring back and forth he continued, Look at my pendulum. At one, two, Django you will be strong, you will not feel any pain, and you will be unstoppable. What the man didn't realize was that a certain idiot captain was also staring at the ring as it rocked back and forth, wondering what was going on. One, two, Django. Django yelled. Suddenly, the wounded pirates shot up as if they were on Red Bull and Vicodin while yelling like the Incredible Hulk. One of the pirates decided to go all Mr. Universe and was able to crush a solid rock with only his hand. Things were looking bad for the Straw Hats as Zoro told Nami and Yuzop to retreat while he turned to his captain. But, before Zoro could form any plans with Luffy, the captain let out a loud roar while changing into his chimera form, startling Zoro and Nami while scaring the crap out of everyone else. It was at this moment the Straw Hats noticed the blank look in Luffy's eyes and realized that the moron got himself hypnotized as well. The beastly boy gave another roar as he plowed his way through the enemy pirates and sending them all flying with at the very least a mild concussion one associates with running headfirst into a building. Yuzop stared in naked shock as the boy he had befriended the other day transformed into some sort of hybrid monster and began manhandling the black cat pirates like a red-headed stepson. Django was also staring in shock and quite a bit of terror as his super-powered crew was laid out faster than a five-year-old versus Mike Tyson. The pirates who remained conscious after the initial assault ran screaming like little girls in the opposite direction while the Chimera boy ran past and grabbed onto the cat-shaped figurehead of the black cat pirate's ship. All of the cat-like pirates watched in horror as the monster with the straw hat tore off the bow of their ship like it was a bandit. Luffy then started to chase the scared senseless pirates while wildly swinging the bow of their ship. Thinking quickly, Django placed the rabid monster under another hypnotism that made him fall asleep. Unfortunately, the bow Luffy had been wielding fell on top of him and the majority of the black cat pirates, knocking them out while Luffy slept like a baby. Django seethed at the sheer stupidity of the situation he found himself in while the straw hat sat back to relax. Seemed like it'd be an easy victory right. Wrong. Everyone present heard two voices coming from the now headless ship, talking in concerned voices about the impromptu remodeling that just occurred. 
Django gained a smirk. At last someone who could set the plans back into action and hopefully spare him Kuro's rage. Come on out, Meowbin brothers. He shouted out. There was a burst of movement from the ship and two figures jumped to the ground below. The new figures were dot 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 odd to say the least. One of them was named Sham and he had a hunched back while wearing a shirt with a bow tie and shorts, as well as having curly green hair and slit pupils. The other was a large man named Butchai and he simply wore a cape with a hood on it and a cat bell with stripped shorts. Both wore cat-like gloves with claws and had cat ear-like accessories similar to the rest of the crew, except Butchai's was worn on his hood. You called for us, Captain? Sham asked while Butchai simply asked, What's up? Django jerked his thumb over his shoulder to point at the remaining straw hats, more specifically Zoro who was looking quite intimidating with his bandana on and sword drawn, and stated, Butchai, Sham, we couldn't get up the slope thanks to those meddling kids, because those guys are blocking our way. Now go and destroy them. The two ship guardians looked over at the straw hats and suddenly shook with fear spouting crap like, how can we beat them? And those guys look really strong. The straw hats looked at the two scaredy cats incredulously and wondered why in the heck Django thought they'd be a threat to the crew. Said hypnotist soon got fed up by the brother's antics and ordered Sham to attack, which he did so reluctantly. As he charged at Zoro, the swordsman simply told him that he wasn't a match for him and that he should leave before he got himself hurt. Suddenly, Sham gave a burst of speed and was able to get into a deadlock with Zoro using his clawed gloves. Let me guess, you thought I was a coward right? Sham said with a smirk, idiot. I was only pretending to be scared to get you to lower your guard. With that, Sham disengaged their stalemate but it soon became apparent something was wrong. Nami called out, Zoro, your swords. With a jolt, Zoro checked his waist and noticed his other two katana were missing. Looking over, Zoro noticed in anger that Sham had swiped the two swords and placed them on his back while looking pleased at his little cat burglar performance. To his increasing ire, Zoro watched as Sham carelessly threw the two swords down the slope stating, I should get this junk out of the way before the fight. Zoro charged forth with blinding speeds, seemingly cutting Sham in half but this was just a ploy. Sham's actual body was really thin so the cut only went through his clothes. Sham used the distraction to jump onto Zoro's shoulders and grabbing his arms while calling out to Butchai. The fat cat jumped high into the air over the immobile Zoro and called out, Cat Stomp, while extending his leg into a dropkick. Fortunately Zoro was able to just barely avoid the attack, which caused cracks to appear where Butchai's foot landed. The duo started attacking Zoro with wild scratch-like attacks, which he had trouble blocking due to only having one blade. Yuzop tried to help the struggling former pirate hunter by firing a lead shot from his slingshot. But Zoro blocked the shot with his body, giving an opening for Butchai and Sham to claw his chest. Nami reasoned that he did that so the pirates wouldn't make them their target if the attack had landed. The thief then decided to make a run for the discarded swords but was unfortunately spotted by Django. Using one of his rings, the hypnotist slashed Nami across her back with the ring's bladed edge. Suddenly Django, the Maubin brothers, and all of the black cat pirates became still while shaking in uncontrollable fear. The reason for their fear came in the form of Captain Kuro, who had just arrived and was looking extremely ticked. Kuro said in an icy voice, It's been a while since dawn. Why haven't you attacked yet, Hujie and Geo? The pirates cowed under their captain's harsh glare, remembering how cruel and remorseless he could be. Kuro then said condescendingly, I wouldn't have expected the black cat pirates to be held up by some kids. This crew has been reduced to a truly sad state, right Django? Said hypnotist started sweating waterfalls under his captain's I'll kill you look. Django sputtered, be but why you told me T to, to let that kid go. You said he wouldn't affect our plans. Kuro gave a nod and stated, that's true, however it doesn't excuse your uselessness. I expected that Brad to come after us but he cannot affect our plans. Suddenly, Butchai and Sham were finally able to overcome some of the fear they were feeling and cried out, Don't look down on us, Captain Kuro. You said we're useless, but you've been living here in comfort for the past three years while we've been active this entire time. It's true you were powerful in the past, but we've never stopped attacking villages and ships. The duo continued, despite Django's attempts to warn the two. Meanwhile, the straw hats stared at the internal conflict, hoping it could work in their favor. The duo then leapt at Kuro screaming that they wouldn't be killed over something as stupid as a failed plan, also stating that Kuro was no longer a threat to them, allowing them to kill him. They then did a combo slash at their former captain, only to find that they only got the bag he was carrying. Kuro had moved behind the two now wearing clawed gloves, except they held katana blades at each finger with his signature silent step. The Malbin brothers quickly turned around only to find him missing. Kuro then was behind the duo, placing his arms around their shoulders saying, Who are you going to kill? It's true that I may not be feeling too active, and I also may not be your captain, but as of now I'm your client. A client who can kill you if the plan fails. The straw hats and the black cats looked on in awe at Kuro's speed while Django stepped up stating, 
What are you so surprised about? His silent step technique is a silent movement technique that could allow him to kill 50 assassins silently. We can't escape from his plans. You may think Kuro's gotten soft over the years but, you can tell by how he still only pushes his glasses up by the palms of his hands like he does while wearing his cat claws that he hasn't forgotten how to fight. Kuro ran the blades of his gloves over Sham and Butchai's throats while musing. I must have gotten soft over the years because I'm feeling generous. I'll give you five minutes to kill these brats and if you can't get it done in that time frame, I'll kill you all. Kuro finished in a dark tone, just as the Mialbin brothers prepared to attack. Nami kicked Zoro's swords over to him, much to his ire, allowing him to properly defend himself. With his swords at hand, Zoro was easily able to co. Sham and left Butchai heavily injured. Butchai then had Django hypnotize him to increase his power, causing him to go into a berserker rage. Nami was able to get over to Luffy's sleeping form while dodging Django's razor rings and kicked her captain awake right in the face. Luffy awoke with a start and turned to yell at Nami, only to receive a razor ring right to the back of the head. After pulling it out, Luffy cried out. That hurt, with tears in his eyes. Meanwhile, Nami and Yuzop relaxed a bit, seeing as the battle just became much easier. After getting over the fact that he just had a sharp object literally jammed into his head, Luffy checked to see if Nami was okay after noticing her shoulder injury. He then noticed with a smirk that Kuro was there, and said, Ha, even the evil butler's here. Meanwhile, said evil butler was wondering how the heck Luffy survived falling off a cliff. It was at this time someone made a highly untimely intervention. Kaya. After trying to convince Kuro to just take her money and leave the village alone, Kuro seemed undisturbed by this event. He calmly and coldly told Kaya that it wasn't just her money that he was after, but peace of mind, and in order to obtain both peace and money, he explained that his crew needed to attack the village and she needed to die for his plans to be complete. To everyone's shock, Kaya then pulled out a pistol and pointed it straight at Kuro. After she demanded him to leave the village, Kuro decided to play dirty and shifted to his clad or personality, reminding Kaya of all the good times they had together, in order for Kaya to lower her guard. It was then he stated cruelly, I've suffered taking care of you long enough. Can you imagine how I, a former pirate captain, felt by taking care of a brat like you every day for the past three years? It was insulting. That is why you have to die today. Suddenly, Yuzop charged at Kuro with his fist cocked back for a punch. Kuro easily dodged the swing and said while smirking, Ah yes, now that I think about it Yuzop I still owe you for the punch you gave me earlier. You really hit me hard. The vicious pirate said with a predatory look in his eyes as he slashed his clawed gloves to bifurcate the wannabe pirate. Before he could touch the liar though, Kuro was struck down by a speeding blur, much to Django's shock. The blur turned out to be Luffy, who had shifted into humanoid black and white long-legged bird that had a bushy crest and long, thick, dark bill with a long, dark tail, a dark head and back, and was blue on the front of the neck and on the belly, all while still wearing his human clothes and having feathered arms instead of wings. The humanoid roadrunner smirked as much as his beak allowed and said, If you hate being hit, I'll make sure to hit you 100 more times. The black cats, Kaya. And Yuzop openly gaped at the transformed boy wondering just what in the heck he was while Kuro simply glared up at the boy through his now cracked glasses. The enemy pirates were able to snap out of their shock to shudder in fear at the near-visible rage Kuro was emitting. Luffy meanwhile jumped back in preparation for a counter-attack. Suddenly, a battle cry echoed through the clearing and out of the woods popped the Yuzop pirates carrying random implements like a shovel and a frying pan and started whacking Kuro over the face like he was a whack-a-mole. Apparently they hadn't bought their leader's lie on lying about the pirate invasion and had followed Kuro to the beach when they saw him leaving the mansion. Everyone in the clearing stared in shock at the sheer gall and stupidity of the three kids while Yuzop tried to tell them to run away. The trio turned to their captain, ignoring the seemingly knocked out pirate behind them and exclaimed, Captain, you were fighting all this time without us. That's disloyal while it should have been dishonest. Besides, we'll fight for you till the bitter end. Suddenly, Kuro sat up like a zombie out of a horror flick while adjusting his now ruined glasses. The Yuzop pirates all screamed like little girls and scooted as far as humanly possible form the man. Kuro simply stood up and calmly walked over to Yuzop before savagely kicking the boy in the ribs before turning to the now transformed back Luffy. I'm curious, just what was that attack earlier? Your entire body changed into some sort of creature. Do you perhaps possess the power of a devil's fruit? Kuro asked. Yep, I eat the Chimera Chimera fruit. Now I'm an animal man. Luffy happily explained. The black cats gawked at this piece of information while Kuro simply nodded before calling out, Django, I'll handle this kid while you go after Kaya. Make sure she writes her will and then kill her. As for the brats, they irritate me. Got it, responded Django who proceeded up the slope but was stopped by Zoro, who stood in his path. Annoyed, Django called out to Butchai who did another cat stomp at Zoro. 
who was able to dodge but the attack was able to shatter a good portion of the ground thanks to Buchai's enhanced strength. Django continued up the slope while Zoro was distracted and Yuzop was too injured from the beginning of the battle to move. Yuzop called to his band of followers and gave them a direct order to protect Kaya, to which they promised that they would. The boys grabbed the girl and carried her off to the forest with Django in hot pursuit. Fortunately, Yuzop was able to slow the hypnotist down with a well-placed shot fired from his slingshot. Kura ordered Django to hurry up which resulted in the man to chase after the fleeing group. Afterwards, Zoro and Luffy got ready for the fight of their lives. After about five seconds, Buchai was knocked out cold thanks to Zoro and the swordsman picked up the wounded sniper to help him save Kaya. Hiro crouched into a fighting position and asked the fleeing duo, Who said I'd let you pass? Id id. Luffy cheered as he rushed forward, morphing into his cheetah form as he ran at increasingly higher speeds. Hiro was just barely able to dodge the swipe Luffy made at him with his claws that snapped the tree behind the conspirator cleanly in half. Go Zoro, go Yuzop. Luffy cried out as he sent a series of rapid fire swipes and punches at the former pirate captain. As the duo ran after Django and the Yuzop pirates, Hiro found himself having a hard time dodging the steady stream of attacks coming from the cheetah boy. Luffy sent a swiping kick with his clawed foot that would have taken Kuro's head off if it connected, only for the villain to seemingly disappear with his silent step. If Luffy was a normal person he wouldn't be able to keep up with Kuro's movements at all, but thanks to his enhanced vision granted by his cat-like eyes, as well as his experience moving at high speeds, he was able to see the direction Kuro sped off to. Using his enhanced speed, the Chimera captain sped over to Kuro's new position in speeds equal to, if not slightly faster than the false butler. Kuro's eyes widened as he was just able to make out Luffy's speeding form and made a wide slash at the black and yellow blur with his clawed gloves. Luffy was fortunate to see the attack coming and was able to leap over the attack, landing behind the traitorous captain with cat-like grace and sent a vicious backhand into Kuro's face, causing him to rocket backwards at the strength behind the punch. Hiro pulled himself up as his crew stared in awe at the kid who landed not just one, but two hits on their captain and seemed to match him in terms of speed. Hiro noticed the wide Cheshire cat grin on the transformed boy's face and asked, What are you so happy about? Well, it's not often I get to do these high-speed fights. Normally I only use my faster forms if I either try to end a fight fast or just need a quick speed boost. Fighting you though will really help me test my limits with speed. It really makes me excited. Luffy explained with a laugh. Kuro seemed to ponder this for a moment before asking. Before we continue, I want to ask you one question. You're a stranger here so why are you getting involved with this village? Luffy paused for a second before breaking out into a toothy grin and said plainly, I have a friend in this village, and I don't want to see him dead. The schemer gave a mocking smile and said, What a simple reason. Are you sure you're all right with it? After all, it'll be your reason for dying. With that Kuro spread out his bladed fingers so it looked like wings. Luffy gave another grin as he shifted back into human form before getting into a ready stance and proclaiming, That's okay. I'm not gonna die anyway. The two fighters shot at each other like they were fired out of a cannon. Luffy started to seemingly get bigger and suddenly there was a charging rhino in his place. Kuro was able to nimbly jump over the rampaging Luffy by using the tip of his horn as a springboard. The butler gave a powerful backwards kick into the back of Luffy's head which, when added to his momentum and mass, caused him to go crashing into the ground with a mighty bang. The straw hat captain quickly shifted back to human as he dodged Kuro's follow-up slash and transformed his body into a black mamba-like being with a human torso and arms and hissed out snake sweep flicking his powerful tail at Kuro's legs. Once again the glasses-wearing pirate jumped over the incoming attack but Luffy anticipated this move and shot his arm forward, allowing it to stretch out longer than normal due to a snake's natural flexibility. Before the surprise attack reached Kuro, the man simply vanished in another burst of silent step. Luffy and the black cats were shocked to see Kuro casually standing on Luffy's outstretched arm. Is that all? I feel like I might fall asleep at this rate. Where was your speed from before, HM? Kuro said mockingly before bringing his leg back for a vicious kick to Luffy's snake-like face, throwing him backwards in a heap. Luffy shifted once again back to his human form while shooting out some blood from his damaged nose. The black cats started cheering for their former captain and started chanting his name. Kuro only seemed to be annoyed by this and yelled out, Don't call me using that name. You don't get it yet, do you? The real purpose of this plan is to eliminate the name Captain Kuro forever. I'm sick and tired of planning for you reckless morons. As I became more and more notorious, more of the marines' dogs and bounty hunters started to come after me and it quickly grew annoying. That is why, three years ago, I killed myself to escape that life. What happened that day was essential for today's plan to be successful. My plan can only be completed when I have achieved wealth and peace. Do you understand now brat? I cannot allow you to disrupt my plans. With that said Kuro charged at Luffy with his claws bared. 
Luffy's body quickly grew in size as thick brown hair covered his body and knife-like claws sprouted from his hands, making him a human grizzly bear. With a grunt of effort, Luffy picked up a huge boulder and used it as a shield against Kuro's attack, causing the claws of his one glove to be stuck in the rock. So I see you're not just an animalistic brute, Kuro said with a scowl as he tried to remove his blades to no avail. That's right, I've been training to become a pirate, Luffy said with a toothy grin and with a roar the bear boy gave the boulder a sharp twist, snapping the blades like toothpick. The black cats watched in shock as their captain's infamous cat claws were broken. Luffy then lifted the rock over his head and said, You said you were sick and tired of your name being known. Then how can you call yourself a pirate? With that Luffy gave another bear-like roar and smashed the rock over Kuro's head, knocking him to the ground. Luffy said triumphantly, My dreams are far greater than your plans. Kuro slowly got up. His slick-backed hair hung loosely from his face as blood dripped down from a gash in his forehead, giving a truly haunting image. His crew tried cheering him on. But realizing he didn't want to be called Kuro, they tried calling the man by his fake name Clahador. Shut up, Kuro said with venom in his voice. After this is done, all of you must die, and Django is no exception. This shocked Luffy and the black cats at the man's cruelty. Suddenly some members of the crew started laughing nervously and making calming gestures. One member said, Please stop joking, Captain Kuro. While another cried out, It's still not too late to attack the village. And yet another pointed out, as long as Django can make that girl write the will, the plan will still succeed. Kuro shook his head bemusedly and explained, You don't have to worry about the plan. As long as your corpses are here, I can place all the blame on you. I never intended on any of you leaving this village alive because it would be a disadvantage leaving anyone who knows my plans alive. With his current disheveled state, the statement made him look that much more depraved. Why you mean from the very beginning, you plan to kill us all? Cried out his crew in shock and dismay. Yes, ever since that day three years ago, this has all been a part of my plan, Kuro stated with a devilish smirk. Luffy, shrinking back into his human form, commented loudly, You guys are dumb. What a bunch of loser pirates. Kuro scoffed, Losers? A pirate crew is just a gathering of outcast outlaws. What could these fools do without my plans? You should continue to quietly follow my plans. In a pirate fleet, the crew is just pawns for the captain to use as he wishes, which means their life and death are in my hands. Even if there's a cliff in front of them, you'd have to follow my orders and charge at it, and sacrifice themselves for my plans. Now Kuro looked furious, that is the way of the pirate, a wandering little brat like you would never understand. Luffy just gave a confident smile and said, Even though you're a captain who controls hundreds of men, you still can't beat Yuzop. Kuro then paused and had confused expression as he asked, What? You say I'm inferior to that captain in a kid's pirate game? After Luffy gave the affirmative, Kuro let out a bark of laughter, Ha! Huh, you're so stupid. Don't get cocky just because you've broken my cat claws. In what way am I inferior to him? He exclaimed as he disappeared behind Luffy in a burst of silent step. The way you think, came Luffy's simple response, which made Kuro pause long enough for the straw hat captain to deliver a vicious backhand to his face while saying, You don't know what a true pirate is supposed to be. The black cats were shocked to see someone see through their captain's silent step. But in reality it was thanks to Luffy's higher than normal instincts and reflexes that he could easily keep up with Kuro's speeds. Kuro meanwhile pulled himself up with a bloodthirsty look on his face and said, You've insulted me. Don't get cocky just because of your powers. I've noticed one weakness to your fighting style is that you have to shift back to human before you can transform into another creature. With this in mind, I'll show you what a real pirate is supposed to be like, as well as the terror of a real pirate. A real pirate, who's been at the brink of death and survived, he exclaimed while getting into a slouched position, much to his crew's horror. It's his out-of-the-bag attack. He's using it against only one person. One member screamed in fright while another yelled out, he really is trying to kill us all. None of us are safe here either. The crew started backing away while some begged for their lives and begged Kuro not to use that technique, saying that they'd leave and forget they ever knew him. Kuro meanwhile continued to sway in his hunched over position before calling out out of the bag attack and disappeared in a dust cloud, much to Luffy's confusion. Suddenly, there was a blood-curdling scream from one of the enemy pirates as his torso gained deep claw marks across it in a spray of blood. Another soon followed and then the claw marks appeared on nearby rocks and trees. Some of the pirates called out for Kuro to stop while one yelled out, It's no use. Whenever he uses this attack he moves so fast that he can't tell what he's attacking. He won't stop till he gets tired. As more and more pirates were cut, Luffy's anger grew and grew as he watched the pointless massacre in front of him. Luffy threw back his head and yelled out, Come out you evil butler. Just what the heck do you think crew members are? Even as he got a few cuts along his arms and chest. Little did he know that Nami saw the whole thing and was shocked at Luffy's outburst. Luffy then took on a still pose and waited for the right moment. 
Suddenly, his instincts screamed out at him and he reached out, seemingly grabbing air until a surprised Kuro suddenly appeared in his grasp. Luffy quickly tossed the shocked man on his back while giving a happy call of, Gotcha. Kuro got up with a snarl and spat out, You punk. You should have let me kill you quickly. Now look, my beloved crew is half dead and in pain because of you. Do you have something to say? He asked as he noticed Luffy had gone silent during his tirade. Yep, I swear I'll never ever be a pirate like you. Luffy declared with a smirk as he cracked his knuckles. Oh you won't be, stated Kuro as he once again got into a slouched position. Because you're going to die right here, right now. Before Kuro could once again use his deadliest attack, Luffy was right in front of him in a burst of speed similar to Kuro's with noticeably longer legs that had hooves and faint spotted markings on them. Luffy grabbed onto the butler's arms and wrapped a thin, whip-like tail growing from his spine that had a small bush of hair at the tip around the villain's waist and cheerfully said, Just try it. Try and use your silent step now. Curse you. Let me go. Kuro howled as he tried with no avail to break out of the transformed boy's grasp. Now your three-year plan will fail. Luffy stated confidently to which Kuro gave an indignant. What did you say? The Black Cat Pirates had started to cheer again, but they were cheering for Luffy now in hopes that the Chimera Man would finish their traitorous captain off. Luffy gave an irritated huff before snapping his head back to face the pirates, his neck elongating with yellow fur with brown spots growing on it till his head was a foot from the pirates, freaking them out. I don't need your cheers. I'm gonna beat you all up too so be ready, Luffy said through clenched teeth. With that he called out Giraffe. Captain Kuro meanwhile was still struggling in the newly dubbed Giraffe Man's grasp and he yelled out in outrage. How can this be? My plan cannot fail. Headshot. Luffy called out as he retracted his neck at a shocking rate before his head collided with Kuro's in a savage headbutt, snapping the evil pirate's head back and knocking his glasses off. As Kuro fell back unconscious, the black cat pirate stared in awe at the man who took down the pirate who was able to defeat a ship of marines, Kuro of 1,000 plants. They asked in fright, Who are you? Monkey D. Luffy. There's no way I'd lose to a pirate who gave up his name and runs from the sea. With that Luffy turned around and gave the staring pirates a wide grin. You better try and remember my name, because I'm the one who's going to become the Pirate King. Luffy then hefted Kuro up before tossing him back to the shocked pirates and yelled out, Take him and don't come back. He finished with an animalistic roar. The pirates didn't need to be told twice as they took the phrase scaredy cat to a whole new meaning as they bolted to their ship. Luffy then started to sway from taking so many cuts during the battle and was caught by Nami, who had finished robbing the other pirates blind. After lying her captain down, Nami sat beside him and said, I guess even you can't stand up after being cut so many times. Why did you get so mad earlier? To which Luffy replied, I don't like them, they're wrong. Nami stared at the boy curiously for a moment before commenting, What are you talking about? It's obviously because they're pirates. Luffy just stated that he wanted meat to which Nami sweat dropped. Meanwhile, Yuzop and Zoro were able to stop Django with the help of the Yuzop pirates and surprisingly enough Kaya. The hypnotist was laid out cold after an exploding shot fired from Yuzop caught him square in the face. Yuzop had his followers promise to keep the day's events a secret so the townspeople didn't get scared. Afterwards, the kids had gone home and the town was none the wiser of the day's events. Back at the slope, Yuzop gave a heartfelt thank you to the straw hats. The pirates brushed it off saying that it was no trouble at all. Yuzop then said in a determined voice, In light of this, there's a decision I've made, much to the crew's curiosity. Scene break. Yuzop stood in front of his crew and addressed them once he was sure they were all there. Yuzop said in a proud tone, You guys fought bravely against those black cat pirates, a fight worthy of the Yuzop pirates, I am proud to call myself your captain. It was five years ago when you were all four years old that we formed this group, and this was the greatest, most magnificent battle we've experienced in all that time. And now, it's sudden but I've decided to go to see myself and become a real pirate. Seeing the group's stunned silence the long-nosed boy continued. After seeing them, I decided that I'm going to leave this village. There is only one reason, that the pirate flag is calling me. The group gave loud protests to this, checking to see if their captain was lying again and asking what was to become of the Yuzop pirates. Yuzop smiled and said calmly, Thanks for everything guys. I don't plan on telling the folks in the village, so say bye to them for me please. He then gained a reminiscent look on his face despite the group's protest. As he said, don't you guys remember that this was the spot that we first met? A lot has happened since then. He stated with tears forming in his eyes that didn't match his smile. What are your life ambitions? The marksman asked and as the kids told him what they hoped to become when they grew up he said with a trembling voice, W while not losing sight of our ambitions, swear that why you'll go on the road you've chosen. Starting today, the Yuzop pirates are disbanded. With that all four former members started crying tears of both joy and sorrow. Scene break. Luffy pulled a fishbone out of his mouth that had gotten caught in his throat while Nami and Zoro berated him on chewing before swallowing. 
After they had finished their meal, the door to the inn opened and in walked Kaya. Naomi asked the girl if she was feeling alright enough to be up and about and the heiress explained that she couldn't be weak with Yuzap encouraging her all this time. She then gave a bright smile and said, So, I heard that you guys need a ship. Much to Luffy's excitement. Scene break. The Straw Hats found themselves at a nearby beach where one of Kaya's other butlers, a goat-faced man named Mary greeted them. Both Kaya and Mary showed a boat that was a floating caravel. With a goat-shaped figurehead with cartoonish eyes and curly horns, a brightly colored deck and stripped sails, and cannons poking out at different sides including under the goat's head, Mary said merrily, This ship is of a slightly old style but I designed it myself. It's a caravel that uses a staysail. The controls are in the back. It's called the Going Mary. He then started to explain the controls to the ship to Luffy, who just gave a blank stare before Nami called the man over and told him to explain it to her, since her captain's a dunderhead. Luffy happily exclaimed, This is a cool ship, to which Kaya told him that she had the ship stocked for their voyage, and Luffy thanked the girl sincerely. Suddenly, the group heard a shrill scream and turned to the hill only to see Yuza, and a bag packed with what looked like the entire inside of a house, came rolling down the hill at worrying speeds, before the rolling boy could crash into the going merry. Both Zoro and Luffy stopped the human boulder by placing their feet up and accidentally kicking Yuzop square in the face. After shaking off the mild concussion he had, Yuzop turned to Kaya. Are you leaving to the sea, Yuzop? Kaya said in a sad but understanding voice. Yeah, I'm leaving before I change my mind. So please don't try and stop me, Yuzop said in determined voice. I won't. I was actually expecting it. It still makes me really sad though to see you go, explained Kaya. The next time I come to the village, I'll tell you adventure stories that are even more unbelievable than lies, stated Yuzop to which Kaya giggled and said, I look forward to it. Yuzop then turned to say goodbye to the straw hats but before he could Zoro shot out, hurry up and get on board. And Yuzop gave the intelligent reply of, huh. Luffy stated plainly, you're already our companion, aren't you? Yuzop stood gawking for a moment before he happily asked, can I be the captain? And Luffy shouted out, no way, I'm the captain. After tearful goodbyes were said, the going Mary hoisted anchor and set sail, with the crew toasting their latest crewmate and friend. All right. Luffy cheered as he held up a black tarp. Our pirate flag is done. The tarp was shown to have what appeared to be a Jolly Roger if said Jolly Roger was drawn left-handed by a right-handed four-year-old. The rest of the straw hat pirates stared at their captain incredulously. That dot 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 is our symbol? Zoro asked warily. Calling our captain artistically challenged would be an understatement, Yuzop commented while gawking at the poorly made flag, maybe it's some kind of abstract art. Nami asked thoughtfully though you can tell she didn't believe her own words. A pirate's flag should be a symbol of death but this dot 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 well I guess it is terrifying in a sense. Zoro deadpanned, so what do you guys think? Luffy asked while giving a smile that threatened to split his face in two. You're beyond terrible, Yuzop groaned, leave the drawing to me. Five minutes later both Zoro and Luffy were braining Yuzop over the head for his design, which was a jolly Roger with Yuzop's nose sticking out and its slingshots instead of the usual crossbones. After the moment of silliness was over Yuzop made the finished project of the straw hat's flag, which showed a grinning jolly Roger with a straw hat on top, coming to a unanimous agreement. The crew quickly decorated their ship with the new flag and also painted the symbol on the sails before setting sail. The crew was busy relaxing after their little Martha Stewart moment before they heard the sound of cannon fire. Looking up warily they noticed their captain by the ship's cannon and was aiming it at a random rock jutting out of the sea. What are you doing Luffy? Zoro asked warily, seeing as his immature captain had somehow figured out how to operate firearms. I'm trying to get the cannon to work, cause it'd be a shame to not use it. I can't seem to get it to work right, though. Luffy sighed the last part as he stared off to the area he had been aiming to hit. Stand aside my amateur friend and watch how a pro does it. Yuzop boasted as he strutted over to his captain. After making a few adjustments to the cannon, Yuzop was able to hit the rock on the first shot. This greatly impressed Luffy and he decided to make the liar the crew's honorary sniper. Yuzop agreed, on the condition that he becomes captain in the event that Luffy would want to step down, to which the Chimera boy agreed to reluctantly. The next half hour involved Luffy trying to convince his crew that their next member should be the musician, to which they all flatly denied. Before the crew could further discuss the next crew member who should join they all heard a large crash on the upper decks. Luffy ran on deck and was confronted by a man wearing Ray-Ban sunglasses with a tattoo on one cheek and was wielding a machete-like sword. Before he knew it, Luffy was jumping over the man's wild swing before the hat-wearing captain could even ask what the big idea was. Meanwhile, Zoro was asking Nami and Yuzop to evaluate the situation while the swordsman got ready to help his captain if needed. The assailant started screaming out that he'd defeated dozens of lowlife pirates before yet a no-name pirate like Luffy was able to kill his partner, much to the animal man's confusion. 
Luffy quickly jumped over the man's wild swing before grabbing him by the head and flipping him over his shoulders, causing the man's face to be acquainted with the wall. Zoro then decided to see the aftermath of the incredibly one-sided fight but was shocked to find that the assailant was someone he knew. The man's name was Johnny, and he was a bounty hunter who did some work with Zoro from time to time along with his partner Yasaku. Zoro then asked the man, after he calmed down some both due to his beating and recognizing that there were friendlies on the ship, where Yasaku was and then the man started blubbering like a five-year-old on how his partner had apparently fallen ill. It had started a few days ago when the other bounty hunter's health took a rapid decline and they were resting on a small island to try and recover his strength before they were assaulted by cannon fire. Fortunately for the ailing bounty hunter, Nami quickly recognized his symptoms as signs of scurvy and quickly had the two idiots. I mean Luffy and Yuzop pour some lime juice down the man's throat while the navigator lectured everyone aboard on how they need to be better prepared while being out at sea, to which was largely ignored by the others who just thought she was some kind of miracle worker. The bounty hunter Yasaku was quickly able to recover and the duo went along to properly introduce themselves. Yasaku wore clothes slightly similar to his partner. However, he had a shaved head with a metal-plated headband and lacked the tattoo and sunglasses. After introductions were out of the way, Yasaku had another bout of illness before he was sent to rest and recover. This little scare led the Straw Hats to decide that their next member needed to be a chef in order to provide them with proper food and nutrition. Johnny came by during this discussion and recommended that they head to a restaurant on the seas that he'd heard about if they were looking for a chef. Zoro's attention was further piqued when Johnny mentioned that that man was rumored to have been sighted there before. Soon, the crew was sailing off to see this acclaimed restaurant. Time skip. It had been a few days since the crew ran into Yasaku and Johnny, when suddenly Johnny announced that they had arrived. The Straw Hats looked in awe at the floating restaurant, which truly looked like a cross between a ship and a restaurant. The main body was shaped like a restaurant. Yet it had masts and a fish-headed bow of a ship. On the front it read restaurant, Baridi. Unfortunately for our heroes, a marine ship was anchored just off to the side of the Baridi. Suddenly, a man came on deck at the marine vessel. The man was blonde and wore a striped suit and had, curiously enough, brass knuckles that seemed to be screwed onto his hand. The man introduced himself as Lieutenant Iron Fist Fullbody and mentioned that he had never seen that pirate flag before and then he demanded to speak with the captain. Luffy stepped forward and introduced himself before claiming that they just finished the flag the day before yesterday, to which Yasaku and Johnny seemed to find funny because there was no way such strong pirates were just a bunch of rookies. Fullbody then turned to the two bounty hunters and idly commented on how he'd seen the two at collection offices before and how the two seemed to be finally caught by pirates. The duo, not liking being looked down on like that, got ready to attack the preppy jerk. After what could only be considered a joke of a match, Tweedledum and Tweedledumer found themselves flat on their backs with their faces a bloody pulp. The marine lieutenant then stated that the pirates were lucky he was on a break today to eat at the restaurant, but the next time they meet they should consider their lives forfeit. Nami was momentarily distracted by a wanted poster that fell out of Johnny's pocket, when Yuzop cried frantically that the marine ship was aiming their cannons at them. Luffy jumped in the way of the incoming projectile and cried out, Leave everything to me. Before shifting to his monkey form and caught the ball bare-handed, much to Yosaku, Johnny, and Yuzop's shock, the animal man then used his momentum to swing the cannonball back in the marine's general direction with a cry of monkey hammer throw. Unfortunately, Luffy overthrew the shot and ended up blowing up a portion of the Baradi's roof instead. Who are you aiming at, idiot? Zoro shouted at his now human captain, who was in shock at how epically he failed at his counterattack. Time skip. Luffy was dragged into the head chef's office by two surely-looking cooks and his reaction was instantaneous when he saw the man, who had apparently been wounded during the attack. The chef, whose name was Zeph, was a sour-looking man who had a braided mustache and a goatee, and had on an incredibly tall hat on his head. W-A-A-H. I blew off your leg. I'm so sorry. Luffy screamed as he saw the man's peg leg, which had quite obviously been there for a while. After being told that the leg had been lost long ago, Luffy quickly relaxed a bit. This changed with what the head chef said next. One year, Luffy blurted out after finding out the amount of time it would take for him to pay off the damages done to the restaurant, seeing as he had no money to speak of. The pirate captain tried to haggle with the surly chef, which just earned him a drop kick to the face. Luffy still proceeded to try lowering the amount of work to one week, but then Zeph got a dangerous look in his eyes. You know, there is a way you can leave here earlier, he said with a straight face before pulling out a hacksaw from somewhere and said with a maniacal grin, you just have to leave one of your legs behind. And with that, the deranged lunatic jumped at the poor dimwit, causing the floor under them to give out. The two landed in the middle of the dining room, much to the inhabitants' shock. After Zeph was able to pull himself out of the tangled mess of limbs he found himself in, 
He quickly went over to investigate a disturbance in the dining area. Apparently, the assistant head chef, Sanji, had been involved in a disagreement with the marine lieutenant the Straw Hats met earlier. And by disagreement, I mean he literally kicked the tar out of the man for wasting food and for generally being an unpleasant human being. Sanji was a man around Zoro's age with a crisp suit on and had blonde hair that covered his left eye but showed his right that had a curiously swirly eyebrow, and he seemed to constantly have a lit cigarette in his mouth. Another chef named Patty, who looked like a flaky version of Popeye, asked Zeph if he could reason with Sanji before he tried to kill another customer. Zeph, in an irritated manner, proceeded to kick both Sanji and Fullbody in the head for causing a scene. An argument quickly developed between the three cooks before a bloodied marine came barging in and saying, Lieutenant Fullbody sir, forgive me but the prisoner escaped. This place is too noisy whined Luffy as he covered up his animal-enhanced ears. Fullbody proceeded to spout off on how that was impossible, that the man who was a member of the Krieg Pirates was half dead when they caught him and hadn't eaten since then and blah, blah, blah. Suddenly, the bearer of bad news was struck from behind and a man calmly walked in and took a seat at a table. The man looked like he had seen better days. With baggy eyes, a scruffy beard, and dirty clothes, he looked like he had one foot in the grave already but something about him screamed dangerous. The man idly looked at the assembled chefs and demanded something to eat. Patty suddenly came forward and said with a pleasant smile, Welcome, you squid-faced moron. Much to the other customer's shock, excuse me, idiot, but do you happen to have any money? To which the pirate pointed a pistol at the man's head and asked, Do you take lead? Patty calmly said, So you don't have money then? Before proceeding to punch the man straight through the table he was sitting at, much to the marine's shock and Zeph's ire, seeing as Patty broke another table, the beefy-looking chef then proceeded to kick the starved pirate out, saying that if he couldn't pay then he wasn't a customer, and the other restaurant patrons cheered while Sanji looked thoughtful. Luffy later came upon an interesting scene. Apparently Sanji had given the pirate food, despite his lack of funds. The chimera man gave a toothy grin, as he found a good cook. The newbie captain then joined in on the two and started a conversation. Luffy learned through Sanji that Zeph himself used to be a pirate before he opened the Barady, and the chefs that joined were as tough as any man you'd find on a pirate crew. It turns out the waiters had to quit a few days ago due to the constant brawls the chefs would get into with pirates. It was then Luffy's turn to ask Sanji if the blonde would become a member of his crew, but the man denied his request saying that he had his reasons for staying with the restaurant, but Luffy ignored this and continued to pester him about joining his crew. The pirate, whose name was Jin of the Don Krieg Pirates, then butted into the heated argument, asking Luffy what his objective as a pirate is. Luffy answered with a large grin that he was going to the Grand Line to find One Piece and become the king of the pirates. Jin gained a serious expression and stated, Seeing as you don't have a cook yet, I'm guessing you don't have a large crew yet, huh? Counting this guy there'll be five of us. Luffy happily chirped while pointing to Sanji, much to the chef's chagrin. You seem like a decent enough guy so let me give you advice. Jin cut in before another argument between the two could ignite, give up on going to the Grand Line. You're still young, so there's no need to rush into things. The Grand Line is only one part of the ocean. There are plenty other places you can sail to. The sickly-looking man said in all seriousness. Luffy asked the man if he knew something about the Grand Line, to which he replied, No, I don't know anything, and that's what makes it so terrifying, he said while trembling a little. Sanji then noted that for a member of the Krieg Pirates was acting like a scaredy cat and Luffy asked who Krieg was. Apparently, Don Krieg was considered one of the strongest pirates in the East Blue and was reported to command 50 ships that housed over 5,000 men. After chatting for a bit longer, Jin got into a small dingy and was getting ready to set sail, wishing Luffy luck on his voyage and gave his deepest gratitude to Sanji for saving his life. Suddenly, Zeph appeared on deck calling for them to get back to work and Sanji, after getting rid of the evidence of Jin's free meal, waved the man goodbye as he sailed off with his head bowed in thanks. Luffy then put on an apron and got ready to start his temporary career as an errand boy for the Barady. Little did he know, that things were about to get really interesting very soon. Pirates, was the shout that echoed through the Barady a few days after Luffy became the chore boy for the sailing restaurant. Let's just say, that whoever thinks letting Monkey D. Luffy work any kind of stable job is a good idea should be dragged into the middle of the street and repeatedly hit with a trout. He broke dishes when asked to wash them, never got orders right as a server, lazed around until he was yelled at, etc. It was getting to the point where Chef Zeph was almost ready to start pulling his hair out and wonder if he'd be able to make money by letting Luffy go. Meanwhile, the animal man had continuously begged the assistant head chef Sanji to join his crew, causing the blonde smoker to send him flying back with a kick to the face every dot 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 single dot 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 time. 
Luffy did learn a good trick though. When none of the other chefs were looking, Luffy would transform himself into a little puppy and would beg for food at some of the tables before he was missed, earning himself plenty of pets and scraps of food from customers who commented how adorable the floating restaurant's pet was, much to the other chef's confusion. Back to the present, the pirate Don Krieg's ship appeared in the distance. At first, the chefs and the customers were terrified at the idea of getting into a fight with Don Krieg. However, what they saw was anything but a dangerous pirate. The enormous ship looked like it had seen one too many storms and it looked ready to sink at any moment. The men on board were barely alive, looking thin and starved. And when Krieg finally appeared, he was too weak to stand on his own feet and had to be assisted by Jen. Krieg was an enormous man with short-cut gray hair and long sideburns, with a thick gauze wrapped around his head. The most notable aspect of Krieg's appearance is his golden woot steel armor that was made up of a chest plate, shoulder guards, and elbow guards, and it all seemed to be fur-lined. With a great effort, Krieg made it to the deck and began asking for food before he fell to the floor. Jin begged them all to help his captain, but some members, like Patty, laughed at that. Jin continued to beg, saying that they could pay so they were customers. The rest of the cooks refused, knowing all about Krieg's dirty reputation. Krieg was then bowing his head and begging for food as well and Jin was trying to stop him, tears in his eyes. But the Straw Hats, who were staying with their captain till he figured a way out of his dilemma, all knew that there was someone who was listening. Sanji had come in with a large bowl of food and actually kicked Patty out of his way who couldn't believe what he was doing. But as Krieg eats, another chef by the name of Karn told Sanji and the rest of them about all the horrible things that Krieg had done over the years, and it was soon clear that he lived up to his reputation. For once Krieg had finished eating, he attacked Sanji and even Jin was shocked at what he was doing. Krieg even went as far to injure Jin's shoulder as the rest of the customers went screaming out of the restaurant in panic. Krieg glanced around at the restaurant and stated that he liked it. He said that the second reason he had come here was so that they could take the restaurant. His old ship would soon sink and he wanted the Barady as his new vessel. He then demanded that they serve food for the rest of his crew. Predictably, they all refused and ready to fight. Krieg laughed as he yelled at them that he wasn't ordering anything, but that he was giving them all an order. And no one had ever disobeyed him before and lived to tell the tale. Holding onto his hurt shoulder, Jin apologized to Sanji, saying that he didn't think that Krieg would do this. Sanji stood up and was actually heading back to the kitchen and the rest of the cooks were horrified and shocked when he said that he was gonna start cooking. The cooks, who each had giant knives and forks, were now pointing their weapons at Sanji ready to fight him if he set foot in that kitchen. He then explained as to why he is giving them food, how he was a cook and it was his one job, but was then smashed to the ground by Patty, who then turned a cannon on Krieg and attacked, asking him if he wanted dessert. Krieg complained how awful the dessert was and then pulled out a private arsenal of weapons and began firing on them all as he screamed out why he was the strongest. But before Krieg could get into another rant, Zef almost knocked Luffy off the stairs as he had a giant sack with enough food for a hundred people, which shocked the chefs. However, upon hearing Zef's name, Krieg's jaw fell open in horror and he was gaping at Zef. Zef turned and looked like he wanted to leave the room. The rest of the cooks were all demanding to know what he was thinking for feeding them, about how they'd lose their ship for sure if the pirates got their strength back. That would be true, Zef answered coolly, but not sounding at all worried, if they still had the will to fight, much to the other chef's confusion. Tell me, Zef went on as he looked back at Krieg. Did your will survive defeat? The words slowly dawned on them all. That Don Krieg had run away from the Grand Line and now they were all staring up at him. His face replaced with a very ugly look. But he never stopped staring at Zef as Jin cowered by his side. Krieg then told the story about Red Leg Zef, the once famous pirate who was both chef and captain, and that it was his ability to kick that gave him his name. How he could smash bedrock and even leave footprints on steel. The nickname Red Leg or even just Red Foot came from the blood of his enemies. Krieg also stated that Zef was supposed to have died in an accident years ago, but he realized that he had only lost a leg which made him unable to fight anymore and forced him to retire as a chef of a restaurant, how he was now defenseless. But Zef didn't show any fear as he continued to look at them with a bored expression. I don't need to fight anymore, he said coolly, as he held up his hands, I'm a cook. As long as I have my two hands I'll be fine. Now enough chit chat, what do you want from me? The restaurant in Zef's logbook was what the villain wanted. Since Zef once went in the Grand Line and returned safely, Krieg said that he wanted the journal written at that time. Naturally, Zef refused. Krieg said that he'll then take it by force. He stated that Zef's journal will give him the information he lacked when he first tried to enter the Grand Line, eventually making him the king. This leads to a funny scene with Luffy stating in front of everyone that he will be the one to be the Pirate King. The other chefs told him to back off but Luffy wouldn't listen as Krieg snarled. This isn't a game, he said to him. Yeah, I know, Luffy said confidently, his eyes slightly becoming feral slits, but still, I'm gonna conquer the Grand Line. His words just seemed to tick Krieg off. No you won't. 
It's true we didn't have the information we needed but my fleet of 5,000 men were wiped out in just seven days you brat. That place is a nightmare. Most of the people in the restaurant were stunned to hear that and when Krieg was about to fight, Zoro and Yuzop made their presence known. Krieg saw them and mocked Luffy for having a tiny crew. Well, that's not all, Luffy said, holding up two fingers as his eyes went back to normal. I've got two more. I'm not a part of your crew, Sanji yelled in the background. Krieg then took the food and went to go feed his crew, giving them all a choice. He was taking the restaurant one way or the other and their only options were to flee with their lives or to stay where they were and die. They had until they finished eating to make up their minds. I'm so sorry for this Sanji, Jin said, and he truly sounded like he meant it. I never thought it would be this way. You have nothing to apologize for Sailor, Zeph said in an unusually kind voice as everyone looked to him. Every cook at this restaurant did what he thought was right. He finished. That's all there is to say about that. But boss, Patty yelled, sounding outraged. Why are you acting like you're taking Sanji's side? This mess is his fault. As the other cooks tried to speak up to that as well, Zeph lost his temper. You fools don't know what you're talking about. Everyone was a little shocked at the sudden anger in his tone as he explained. None of you have any idea what it's like to be on the brink of starvation. To have no food or water on the open ocean. There is no way you could possibly understand what a terrifying prospect that is. It's the most difficult situation a man can ever face. What? Patty said, sounding lost. I don't know what you're talking about Chef Zeph. Zeph looked over at them all. A strange expression in his eyes. The difference between all of you and Sanji is that Sanji knows. The chefs all looked completely lost at those words, but they weren't the only ones. The straw hats looked thoughtfully at the blonde chef. If all you're gonna do is stand around grumbling, Zeph went on, a hard look on his face, then leave this place, and never come back. Not a single one of them moved. They all held up their weapons, ready to fight. They had decided to protect the Bear 80, since it is the only place where they were accepted. Jin screamed at them to please leave, that they had no idea who they were up against. But Sanji walked forwards, moving one of the tables up and explaining that now that he fed them, he can beat them all. And he said all this with a terrifying expression on his face. Hey Jin, Luffy suddenly called out. You said you don't know anything about the Grand Line. I thought you'd been there. Doesn't make any sense. So Jin told them all what happened. How on the seventh day of their voyage through the Grand Line. Their entire fleet was almost annihilated. He spoke it all as if we're living a terrifying nightmare. For that entire 50-ship fleet, to be completely eradicated by a single man. He gasped as everyone stared at him, choking in horror at what they were hearing. Jin explained about how as soon as this man appeared he began to slice apart the entire fleet, and how, if not for a freak storm, the flagship would have been sunk as well. It all seems like a terrible nightmare burned into my memory. Jin cried out shaking in fear, his hands on his face, as if he hoped to claw out those images. I just want to forget. His eyes, they were like a hawk's, sharp and murderous. His gaze alone felt like the cold hands of death. On the stairs, Zoro gripped the railing tightly as he stared at him, eyes wide. Well then, Zeph said as they all turned back to him. That can only be the one known as Hawkeye. Jin looked fearful that Zeph recognized who it had been. Your description of his heartless gaze isn't proof of his identify in and of itself. But the way he so easily decimated your fleet confirms without a doubt that it's him. Hawkeye Mihawk. Zoro repeated softly. Luffy looked up at him. You know him Zoro? He asked curiously, remembering the matter at hand. He took several calming breaths as he answered Luffy's question. Yes, I do. He admitted, he's the man I've been looking for. He's the whole reason I set out to see. Luffy blinked up at him as Sanji asked Jin if Mihawk had some kind of a score to settle with them for him to go out and sink all his ships. We didn't do anything to him. Jin cried back to him. Zeph had an interesting suggestion. Perhaps you disturbed him during a nap. Stupid cook. Jin yelled in fury. Why would he destroy an entire fleet for something so trivial? Zeph smirked at Jin's fear. There's no reason to shout, he said coolly, as if telling a child to off for being too loud. It's just an example. I thought you'd like a little friendly advice on what kind of place the Grand Line? Yuzop gulped. And what kind of place is that? He asked in a croak. Zoro was the one who answered. He probably means that anything can happen there. Yuzop on the other hand now had tears of fear in his eyes. Hey L-U-F-F-Y, do we really, really have to go there? He yelled at Luffy who was shaking at the foot of the stairs. Luffy, he gasped. But their captain was smiling as he cried out. That's so awesome. This is gonna be such a blast. Don't you understand the concept of danger? Yuzop demanded loudly. Finally, Zoro said softly. My life's goal will be achieved on the Grand Line. What? Yuzop gasped up at him. Zoro leaned up against the wall with a similar satisfied smirk. My rival is out there somewhere and I'm gonna find him. Sanji looked up at him and asked, Are you that stupid? It's idiots like you guys who end up dead. That may be true, Zoro said as Sanji looked back at him, but lay off the name calling. I devoted my entire life to becoming the world's greatest swordsman. 
It was my choice so I'm the only one who gets to call me stupid. Just then, outside they could hear the sounds of battle cries and knew that their time was up. The Krieg pirates were all ready to go again. But then something happened. Just when they start to attack the restaurant, the great galleon was suddenly cut in half creating a lot of disbelief on everyone's faces and even a mini tsunami. Everyone was rocked around inside the restaurant and they were all trying to find something to hold on to. Zeph ordered them to raise the anchor before the ship sank in the waves. While the three straw hats all went running outside to where Nami and the guys were on the Mary. They followed them and they found Yosaku and Johnny floundering in the sea. They explained that Nami took the treasure and ship and left. What did you say? Luffy, Zoro, and Yuzop yelled together in panic. They heaved the two men onto deck as they told them the story of how Nami tricked them and took off with the Mary. Then Zoro lost his temper. He punched the side of the restaurant. Curse it. He yelled. She just had to make a bad situation worse. Yuzop was looking angrier than they had seen him in a long time. The heartless thief. He yelled. Kaya gave us that ship. Luffy jumped up onto the railing and searched over the sea to try and get a glimpse of the ship. Wait. He called. I see a ship. It's the going Mary. He turned towards Yasaku and Johnny. Tell me where your boat is. We have it moored to the restaurant. Yasaku said at once. Zoro, Yuzop, don't just stand there. Luffy ordered, turning to them all, take their ship and go get Nami. Calm down, Zoro stated, as if he could care less. Let her keep the ship. Trust me, that woman's way more trouble than she's worth. Luffy frowned at him. She's the only one I'll accept as the ship's navigator, he said firmly, and it was clear from this tone that he wasn't going to change his mind. Zoro threw Luffy an aggravated look. For a moment, there was a nasty moment of thinking that he would actually refuse. But he then sighed. Fine, I'll do it. Zoro snapped in frustration, though it was clear that he wasn't happy about it. You're one high maintenance captain, you know that. The ship's ready for action big bro Zoro. Johnny and Yasaku yelled together, once again, showing that these two were really two peas in a pod. Hey, what about you? Zoro asked, looking at Luffy. I should probably stick around here till I get things settled with the restaurant. Luffy said, jerking his thumb at the building, you know what I mean. Well, be careful, the swordsman warned. A slight trace of worry in his face. The situation here could get really bad really fast. Luffy nodded. Yeah, got that right. Just then they heard shouts coming from the floating pieces of the remains of Krieg's ship. Over there. It's that man. He came back. Don Krieg. The man who destroyed our fleet is back. Someone's voice screamed out above all the others. What are we gonna do? That got everyone, Zoro's especially, attention. They were all focused on a boat that was sailing towards them. As soon as they saw it, even Zeph's cool disappeared as he watched looked up, his eyes wide, that man is. And there, through the dust from the attack that destroyed the ship, the form of a single man slowly appeared. Zoro was shaking, sweat pouring down his face, on a small raft that was lit with several candles with eerily green flames, that looked as though something to fetch you from the netherworld. Some of them shivered at the sight of it, but their eyes were drawn directly to the man sitting in the boat. He was a tall and lean man with a short beard, mustache and sideburns that point upwards. His clothing was made of a wide-brimmed black hat decorated with a large plume, and a long, open black coat with no shirt underneath, with red, flower-patterned sleeves and collar. There was a small, golden cross-shaped necklace hanging around his neck and a large, black sword on his back. It had a beautifully curved black blade, in the shape of a cross, and with a golden handguard decorated by blue and green jewels, and a hilt wrapped in bandages, with a particularly big jewel at its edge. But underneath the hat they could see his eyes, pulled yellow eyes that resembled a hawk that was hunting its prey. The Krieg pirates were all so full of fear that they couldn't move and were shaking in their boots as Mihawk sailed by them. That psycho followed us back here. He's gonna kill us all. Luffy stepped forward when he noticed that Zoro had frozen. Zoro, who's that? He asked him as he glanced towards Mihawk. The man I've been looking for, Zoro confessed as he watched his rival sail closer. Hawkeye Mihawk. So that's... Mihawk, Luffy said seriously. He could sense the power inside Mihawk... His animal instincts were screaming at him just how dangerous this man was. Yeah, the greatest swordsman, Zoro said as he kept his eyes trailed on him. Zeph, Patty, and Karn were only a little ways away and were talking about him as well. That's gotta be the guy who destroyed Krieg's fleet, Patty said nervously. He sunk 50 battleships out on the Grand Line all by himself. Looks like he came back to finish the job, Karn said anxiously. But is that all he wants? Wait a minute, another chef said from behind them. He looks like any ordinary man. He doesn't even look like he has any special weapons with him. He carries his weapon on his back, Zeph explained and they stared at him in disbelief. That's impossible, Patty cried out in incredulity. He couldn't have destroyed a galleon like that using nothing but a sword. Karn cried in agreement. Zeph just stood there with his arms folded. Hawkeye Mihawk is a true master. He is without a doubt the greatest swordsman in the world. Here, Zoro was looking nervous, but excited at the same time. A wild grin appeared as he put his hand on the white blade. He was gonna fight. 
he was willing to fight Mihawk for his title, or die trying. You, you monster. One of the Krieg pirates yelled in a trembling voice, Why are you doing this to us? What did we ever do to you? Mihawk glanced up at him in uninterested a way, as if speaking was a waste of energy, just killing time. Just killing time. Another pirate cried out as he pulled out a pair of pistols and shot at him. But with the grace of a swan, he twisted his wrist very slightly. And just like that the two bullets were deflected and their courses were changed. W what? I missed. The pirate cried out. Not believing it, but I aimed straight for him. He diverted it, said Zoro's voice, appearing behind the pirate and making him jump. He changed the course of the bullet with the tip of his sword. That can't be. The pirate said in disbelief as Zoro coolly walked past them all. One hand on his swords, which caught the attention of the other pirates as the first demanded to know who Zoro was. He's got three swords. It couldn't be. Another pirate gasped, looking up to his face. But that Zoro didn't pay them any attention as he turned his full attention to Hawkeye. I've never seen a sword handled so gently or with such grace. He said truthfully. Hawkeye's eyes looked over at him without even turning his head as he casually replied. There is no strength in swordplay based on force. Did you also use that sword to slice up this ship? Zoro continued on, though it was clear from the wild, excited look on his face that he already knew the answer. I did, Mihawk answered, as if telling him that what he did was something that anyone could do. Then it's true, he asked, still looking like a child who was promised a big treat, you're the best. He went to his black bandana and untied it from his arm. I set sail for only one reason, to meet you. And what is your goal? Mihawk asked with only a slight trace of curiosity in his tone. To beat you, exclaimed Zoro, still grinning wildly as he tied his bandana on. Mihawk smirked at him, how foolish. Zoro then out the white blade and declared, you got spare time, so let's do this. The Krieg pirates, as well as all the cooks, all suddenly realized who Zoro was. Don Krieg was watching the two with great interest. Really, it's the pirate hunter, he said gruffly, though they were still standing on the Baradi's edge with Sanji. He heard what he just said and Sanji was stunned by that. Just then, Usopp was yelling at Luffy, telling him that they had to hurry or else they would lose sight of Nami and the going Mary. But surprisingly, Luffy didn't even look at him as he watched Zoro and Mihawk size each other up. Or rather, Zoro sized Mihawk up. Hawkeye didn't even seem troubled. A fight? Mihawk asked him, with a tone that clearly said that he wanted to make sure that he heard right. You're a weak, pitiful creature. Before anyone could blink, the world's greatest was suddenly standing not ten feet from the straw hat's first mate. If you are, in fact, a competent swordsman, Mihawk said in a skeptic tone as if he highly doubted it. You should see the disparity in our abilities before we even cross swords. I must ask you, why have you challenged me? Hawkeye went on, could it be your courage? Or, is it simply your ignorance? Zoro was grinning as he declared that it was his ambition that drove him to fight, and as he took out his swords he added, Also I made a promise I intend to keep. There isn't a person alive who can beat Big Bro. Yasaku yelled from the boat as he and Johnny began cheering. He's already the best in the world. At the same time, Mihawk took the little golden cross that was around his neck and revealed that it was actually hiding a short knife that looked more like for cutting someone's toenails than fighting. Zoro had already narrowed his eyes, realizing that he was being mocked when Mihawk held up the knife. Funny, what do you think you're gonna do with that? He demanded. It'll be more than enough. After all you wouldn't kill a fly with a cannon would you? Mihawk asked him coolly, you may have quite the reputation in the East Blue, but that doesn't mean much to me. This sea is by far the weakest of the four. He sighed a little before he said that he didn't carry any blades that were smaller than this, and it was like he was apologizing to him that this knife was too big for him to handle. I've had just enough of your attitude. Zoro snarled and he actually bit down on the sword with such force that he ended up chipping off a piece of tooth. But he didn't care as he charged at him recklessly. Now you die. You have no idea how big the world really is, Mihawk said almost forebodingly as he held up the little knife. Onijiri, Zoro yelled as he struck, but to everyone's amazement, Hawkeye didn't just catch the attack, but he stopped all three swords dead in mid-strike. W what the? Zoro gasped when he tried to move forward, but nothing budged. Zoro, Luffy yelled wordly from where he stood, but didn't do anything else as he could only stand by and watch. What? Big bro's Onijiri was stopped. Johnny yelled incredulously. But that's crazy, Yasaku shouted, also in disbelief, that attacks never fails to stop an enemy. What's going on here? Finally, either through a sudden burst of strength, or Mihawk simply grew bored, Zoro broke free of the standstill. I am not that far behind the world's strongest. He yelled as he attacked again, but this time no longer as calm or collective as he usually was in battle. It was here that they could fully see that Mihawk shook Zoro to the core. He now began to swing at Hawkeye viciously with his swords. But Mihawk barely had to defend himself as he parried each swing or merely stepped lightly out of the way, so he didn't even get a scratch on him. After a few moments of this, Mihawk stepped to the side and caused Zoro to fall to the deck, panting hard. 
You're just toying with him, right? Yasaku screamed, his eyes wide. Fight for real big bro. Big bro, added Johnny, sounding close to openly sobbing. But it was clear from the look on Zoro's face that he was past listening. You can't be that much better than me. He yelled, shaking with rage, and seeing the expressionless look on Mihawk's face just seemed to even anger. Again, he got up and began to violently attack. There was no skill or plan here, just vicious slashes. Using the dagger to block another attack, Mihawk stated, such ferocious swordplay. Using his mouth, Zoro moved his sword up to strike, but Hawkeye stopped it, creating a shockwave from the strength that both swordsmen created. How can he defend against Zoro's three-sword style with such a small knife? One of the Krieg pirate yelled in astonishment. He's even more of a monster with a blade than even the great Zoro. Another cried. The swings were so quick that all they could see were flashes of light. As Zoro lunged forward, Mihawk moved and then hit the back of Zoro's neck with the side of his hand. They watched Zoro's eyes roll into the back of his head and they knew that he was fighting to stay conscious after an attack like that. The green-haired swordsman slowly got back up, though now dazed from that last attack. He was exhausted as he marched forward, trying again. But he was so slow and worn out that even a weak swordsman could have easily stepped out of the way. With nothing to hit, he fell forward again, gasping for air as he lay there, with Mihawk looking down at him. But there was something different in his gaze this time. Curiosity perhaps. What is it then? Mihawk suddenly asked. What weight do you carry upon your shoulders? Speak up, weakling. Johnny and Yasaku were both ready to defend Zoro for that insult. How dare you call him weakling? Yasaku cried, his hand on his sword. You'll pay for that. We'll teach you a lesson. Johnny added and with screams they jumped, ready to get in the fight but Luffy wouldn't allow it. No, he yelled, quickly grabbing them by the scruffs of their necks. Yasaku, Johnny, get back here. He then held them both down as he commanded, just stay put. But Luffy was clearly just as upset as they were about it. His teeth were grit together and were slowly becoming fangs. His eyes were slitted, and fur and scales were popping up in random places before disappearing once more. Even Yuzop noticed it as he glanced over at him. Luffy, he began, but Zoro was up on his feet. Zoro was still looking angry, although it was clear that he was far from giving up. No, I won't lose, he declared. I refuse to be defeated. Mihawk didn't say a word as he watched him cross his three blades. Tiger. But Zoro barely finished finishing the attack when Mihawk rushed forward and impaled him with the small blade, just right above his heart. Despite the look of complete shock on his face, there was a steely-eyed determination there as he refused to back away from the blade. You are defeated, yet won't step back. Why not? Mihawk asked, as if wondering what he would do now. I don't know. Zoro answered honestly as blood trailed from his mouth and ran down the side of his face to stain his shirt. But, I will not run. Even if I retreat a single step I'd be shattering the promises I made. I can't run. I would lose my honor. You see, without that there'd be nothing left for me here. That's what defeat is, Mihawk stated simply. But Zoro merely answered. Then I won't accept defeat. Then you die, Mihawk pointed out coldly. Looking at him dead in the hawk-like eyes Zoro said without a trace of hesitation or regret in his voice, I rather die than give up. Hawkeye was now giving him a new look of respect as he pulled his knife out of his chest. He stepped back and resheathed it before he demanded Zoro's name. Moving his swords into an almost triangle shape, he proclaimed, I am. Burunoa Zoro. Mihawk reached behind his head to grab his black sword. I'll remember it. He informed him. No one as strong as you has come around in quite some time. So as a swordsman courtesy, Mihawk finished, showing off the bright gleam of the sword as he brought it swinging around. I'll use the world's strongest black sword to defeat you. Thank you. I appreciate it, Zoro said as Johnny and Yosaku pleaded for him to stop, which he naturally ignored. Spinning his swords, Zoro was ready to perform the strongest attack he knew back then, Mihawk charged. At first no one could see what happened. It looked as though Hawkeye merely ran past him, the two froze where they stood. And then, time seemed to slow as the two katanas in Zoro's hands suddenly shattered into pieces. Only the white sword in his mouth remained as Zoro fell to his knees in defeat. The straw hats couldn't believe it. They had never seen him lose in such a way. It wasn't even close. Without saying a word, Zoro carefully put his last sword back in its sheath as Mihawk raised his blade up to finish him off. But before he could finish the attack, Zoro spun around and stood up, his arms wide, and his white sword still in one hand. Even Mihawk looked startled at that and asked him what he was doing. Raising his head so that they could see the dark smile on his face, he answered simply, Scars on the back are a swordsman's shame. Hawkeye returned the grin. Fine, he answered. And with a single slash, he cleaved open a massive diagonal cut across Zoro's entire chest. For a second there wasn't anything. But then blood cascaded out so that the straw hats all felt green at the sight of it. Unable to stand any longer, Zoro's body slowly fell backwards to the sea. Z-O-R-O. Luffy screamed in horror. You shouldn't rush these things young man. Mihawk informed him coolly as Zoro's body fell. Zoro. Yuzop screamed out. Unable to believe what he was seeing. Big bro. 
both Johnny and Yasaku yelled, a fountain of tears falling from their eyes. N-O-O-O. Luffy screamed, tears also appearing in his eyes as he griped the side of the boat so tightly that it looked as if he would break it into pieces. Suddenly another voice sounded from right next to them. Don't be stupid, Sanji screamed out just as Zoro fell into the sea. Give up your ambitions and live. Luffy was shaking from where he stood. Darn you, he growled out, unable to sit still anymore. With a roar that sent miniature waves away from the Baraiti, Luffy went into his chimera form. However, the form he took looked even more feral than normal in his rage and he even looked bigger than normal at a staggering 20 feet tall packed with animal savagery, claws, fangs, and muscles. Two leathery bat-like wings burst from his back as he rocketed himself over to deal with Mihawk himself just as Johnny and Yasaku jumped in after Zoro, seeing his powers for the first time. Everyone was freaked out as they watched, even Sanji had dropped the cigarette from his mouth. It looked as though Luffy was gonna slam into Mihawk as he came flying right at him. But the world's greatest swordsman simply moved out of the way just in time so that Luffy crashed into the side of the wreckage in his blind rage. Are you that young warrior's comrade? Mihawk questioned calmly when Luffy got his head horn stuck and was now attempting to pull them out. I'm impressed with you for not interfering. Luffy managed to pull his head out and fell on his back. There's nothing to be upset about. Hawkeye informed him calmly. Your friend will live. At his word however, Luffy's eyes lost their savagery as he sat bolt upright at once and turned around to see that Johnny and Yasaku had already pulled Zoro out of the water. Big bro, say something please. Yasaku begged as Zoro hung over their shoulders lifelessly for a moment. Zoro, Luffy exclaimed anxiously. His voice slightly more bestial than it normally was in his chimera form. At hearing his name, Zoro suddenly came back to life and began to cough up water and blood. Zoro, Luffy called back again wordly, shifting back to human as the two dragged Zoro back to their boat where Yuzop was waiting for them. Together, they pulled him on board and Yuzop went to get some medicine for him. It's still far too early for you to die, Mihawk said as he folded his arms and proclaimed loudly. My name is Dracul Mihawk. You're strong, but there is still much for you to learn. No matter how many years it takes I will hold this title as the greatest in the world and wait for you. Until that day you must hone your skills. Then, seek me out. Orono Zoro. Chef Zef had stood there the whole time with that composed expression. Not just anyone can earn the regards of Hawkeye Mihawk, he said, and there was also a tone of respect in his voice. Mihawk turning to Luffy and asking him what his one goal was. Without any emotion in his face, Luffy answered with as little hesitation as Zoro showed to be the king. Again, Mihawk smiled. Your ambitions are even loftier than your friends, he informed him. That's quite the task. Even though you're strong, you both have a long way to go. Yeah, will you just let me worry about that? Luffy said defiantly, and even stuck his tongue out at him, letting him know just what he thought about that. He's alive. Yuzop's voice suddenly called out and they all looked to the boat. He was just unconsciousness. He declared as Zoro continued to cough up blood and seawater. Johnny and Yasaku were trying to get him to say something as Luffy called out his name worriedly. Gasping for breath, Zoro proved that he was far from dead as he lifted his white katana into the air, the sun gleaming on the silver blade. Luffy, can you hear me? He gasped out so hoarsely that they could hardly make out the words. Yeah, Luffy shouted, and they were all wondering just what he was gonna say. I'm sorry for disappointing you, Zoro gasped out, breathing hard as if every word was painful. I know you need nothing less than the greatest swordsman in the world. Luffy's eyes widened and he stood there, completely taken aback by what Zoro was saying was saying. I've let you down, please forgive me. Zoro's was suddenly coughing up more blood and water as the three around him tried to get him to stop, but he kept going on, ignoring their advice as he declared for them all to hear, I solemnly swear, from this moment forward, that I will never lose again. And to their amazement, he was sounding choked up, like he was crying, until the day comes. He went on, struggling for air, when I defeat him and take his title. Mihawk smirked at that, as if he was privately looking forward to seeing him try. But then Zoro finally called out, I will never, never be defeated. Is then okay, king of the pirates? There was silence at that and a huge smile spread over Luffy's face, yep. Mihawk seemed pleased also as he turned and headed back to his boat. You're a good team. I hope to see you again. Someday. Hey, Hawkeye. Krieg yelled jumping down to face him. I was under the impression that you had come here to take my life, he said, sounding insulted. Weren't you here to kill Don Creed, ruler of the East Blue? The thought had crossed my mind, Hawkeye admitted. Not even bothering to look at him, but I've had enough fun for today so I'm going home to get some rest. Krieg cracked his neck as he said with a grin, I don't care if you've had enough. I haven't even gotten started. As Krieg's crew begged him to change his mind, Krieg suddenly revealed guns and miniature cannons from underneath his armor and attacked. He just won't learn will he? Mihawk asked in a bored way as his hand went back to his sword. No one could see what happened to him, but when the smoke from the projectiles cleared Mihawk was gone. Luffy had jumped over and was hanging onto the bar and the rest of the crew was on the tiny boat. USOPP, 
Luffy cried out, towards everyone on the boat, go on ahead, I'll leave Nami to you. Roger that, Use up cried back, waving the straw hat around, don't you worry about a thing, Zoro and I are gonna get her right back, make sure you get the cook to join our crew. And then, he grinned wider as he threw the hat to him, the five of us will set sail to the Grand Line. Luffy stretched out to grab the hat, and he was grinning from ear to ear. Yeah, let's do it. The Krieg pirates were getting ready to attack them again now that the threat was gone and Yuzop took charge of sailing the boat after Nami. Hey Pops, Luffy cried out, still hanging on the side of the Barity. Can I stop doing these chores if I get those pirates out of here? Suit yourself, Zeph answered in a voice as if he couldn't care less. Grinning from ear to ear, Luffy leaned up, to continue hanging from the railing as he looked at Zeph. Okay Pops, you promised me remember, he said, just making sure he understood everything. If I run those pirates off then my debt to you is clear. No more chores. That's the deal, Zeph confirmed with a nod. There's no telling how much more of my restaurant you'll screw up if you stick around. Luffy laughed in agreement and bonked his own head, letting them know that he knew how clumsy he was. So kid, Zeph said in interest, you said you were gonna be king of the pirates. Were you serious? Well yeah, of course, Luffy answered without a doubt in his mind. I'm definitely gonna be king of the pirates someday. Zeph smirked, I've seen a whole lot of pirates in my day, but you're the first to state your desire so clearly and without a doubt. I heard, that back in the day, you were a pretty awesome pirate yourself, Luffy said. So did you want to be king of the pirates too? Luffy finished asked curiously. Zeph looked up at the sky to see a seagull soaring above and answered, I do my best to forget about the past. I'm the owner of Barity now and that's quite enough for me. Krieg gave the command for the pirates to start attacking the Barity. However, the chefs were ready to fight. Luffy launched himself over them and momentarily was lost from view. However, a huge shadow suddenly formed over the Krieg pirates and they all looked up, causing them all to pale and quite a few to scream out, holy crap, before there was a cry of, blue whale belly flop. With that, a huge blue whale crashed onto the pirates, heavily injuring most of them and knocking a large number out. The chefs cheered on their chore boy, which was quickly reduced to spluttering when the waves from the belly flop splashed most of them right in the face. It's hard to believe. The Grand Line is crawling with guys like these, Sanji asked, shaking his head both in disbelief and to get the water out of his hair. Sanji, Zef said, remarkably still dry, while staring ahead at the fight, but still addressing the Sanji standing next to him. Pay special attention to how this one fights. He said, don't take your eyes off him for a moment, until this fight is over. Is that clear? Sanji gave a hesitant nod and went back to observing the fight. Luffy, who transformed back and was now hanging from one of the broken masts, was looking down at the pirates calling out, so let me see if I got this straight. You're attacking the restaurant that gave you food. I got no choice but to beat some manners into you. Krieg laughed, mocking him to fight on the water as the whole restaurant began to shake. With a great rumbling noise, something was coming up from under the sea and some of them were screaming in fear. There was a cry from the chefs of Raise the Fins. Before dark wood broke through the surface, it turns out the fins were actually a wooden deck for them to all stand on. Suddenly, Patty and Karn pulled out a secret weapon that had been hidden in the fish head of the Barady and declared that they were gonna use it to protect the ship no matter what. It turns out, however, that Krieg was more than just some armor and pistols. He was able to stop the weapon with his bare hands and had actually threw it back towards the chefs. Thankfully Sanji took care of it when he jumped up and with a single kick, stopped it in its tracks. The fish head smashed into the fin and leaving the restaurant unscathed. Bursting out from the wreckage, Patty and Karn were yelling at Sanji for almost killing them just as the Krieg pirates jumped up to fight, boarding the fins and laughing. It started off as a standoff, but the cooks rushed in to fight, but they were no match for their sheer numbers. However the worst part was listening to them brag at how strong they were. The cooks refused to take it. They said that this restaurant was their home and they weren't giving it up to them without a fight. Patty and Karn were a lot stronger than the rest of them and were able to fight them off. At least until another one of Krieg's men appeared. He was a towering man, was dressed with two large iron plates covering his front and backside, as well as two small plates on his hands with large pearls embedded in them. I am Pearl, the invincible shield. He cried out. Pearl had taken out both Patty and Karn. But when the pirates tried to take Patty's knife from his hands, Sanji kicked them out, outraged that they would try to touch a kitchen knife. A chef's soul. As the pirates charged him, he took them all out with a few kicks as Pearl mocked him about only fighting with his legs. I'm a cook remember, Sanji demanded. I couldn't do my job very well if I ruined my hands in battle. He held up a leg and finished, so I'll be taking you down with my feet. Pearl merely went on to explain that he won all 61 battles without a stretch, that he never shed a drop of blood in battle. 
And no sooner were those words out of Pearl's mouth when Krieg pulled out a spiked ball and swung it around, trying to take Luffy out with it. Luffy was sent flying through the air. But when he landed, he ended up hitting Pearl in the back of the head with such force he gave him a nosebleed. As Pearl stared at the blood, his eyes were widening and he was shaking. The other Krieg pirates were all telling Pearl to stay calm, that it was only a nosebleed. These, these people aren't just mean, they're dangerous, Pearl muttered, his face twitching horribly at that. The other pirates meanwhile were getting more and more frantic by the look on Pearl's face. So, Sanji said slowly, looking around at everyone, wanna tell me why everyone's freaking out? Luffy, who was picking his nose, said, they're worried about a nosebleed. Pearl was banging the two shields on his hands together, looking close to freaking out, screaming out, danger. Danger. Jez, what is that guy doing? Sanji yelled in annoyance. Just then, Pearl set himself on fire. Pearl set the ship and even his own crewmates on fire and as the blaze spread, it had created a sort of wall of fire around him to keep any potential attackers at bay. Before you could blink the fire spread and soon the entire fin was now in flames. Sanji couldn't take it anymore as he jumped high, over the wall of flames, landing a drop kick on Pearl's face. After working off the minor concussion, Pearl looked horrified. B but these flames scare everyone away. He screamed out, looking ready to cry. Well, Sanji answered, holding out his cigarette, looking like he didn't have a care in the world at that moment. I wouldn't be much of a cook if I was afraid of fire. Pearl seemed to lose it completely as he shot out flaming pearls, aiming them directly at the restaurant, determined to set it on fire too. But Zeph was one step ahead of him. When the pearls neared him, he stood on his one good leg and used the peg leg to give a swift kick and the gust from that attack had actually put the fires out and caused them to drop to the deck harmlessly. But with the fire still raging, Krieg had decided to take out the fin himself with the spiked ball. When he threw it, he aimed it directly over where Sanji and Pearl were fighting, but with them both trapped by the fire, they had nowhere to go. But just before it hit, Luffy came jumping through the fire and saved Sanji by transforming his arm into a muscular, scale-covered claw in order to send the ball flying back towards Krieg with a hard punch. He tossed that thing right back. Sanji gasped in shock as Luffy was now attempting to put out the fire on his backside. The spiked ball was flung into another broken mast, smashing it apart even further and when it fell, it ended up breaking on Pearl's head, knocking him out and put an end to the fire. However the Krieg pirates have not said their last word. While they were fighting, Jin had snuck up behind Zeph and was now holding him a gunpoint. With this, Sanji was asked to surrender. Jin demanded to have the ship then threatened to kill Zeph if Sanji fought back against Pearl who managed to get back to his feet. But Sanji wasn't moving and he even went as far as to mock Zeph for the state he was in. However the whole time, he tried to get Jin to come after him instead. Pearl launched another attack, and without raising a leg to defend himself, Sanji was slammed into the side of the restaurant. Sanji, Luffy screamed out as blood started dripping down from Sanji's face, because, Sanji hissed to Luffy, answering his question, if I did that rat over there would have pulled the trigger on Zeph. There was silence for a moment as that sunk in. Jin tried to plead into just giving up the restaurant and that he wouldn't get hurt, but Sanji just couldn't. He couldn't give it up and he knew what was gonna come up. This restaurant is that old man's life, Sanji declared from where he lay, lowering his head in guilt as he confessed. I've already took everything else that man holds dear, his power, his dreams. So while I'm around, he then screamed out, I'm not gonna let anything else get taken from him. Seeing this behavior the other chefs asked Sanji what he meant by this before the blonde cook was once again attacked by Pearl, who took the opportunity for some payback and had slammed his shields into his head, and blood was now pouring out of his mouth and nose. Sanji was able to raise his head and told the cooks everything. He explained that he owed Zeph his life. How that, nine years earlier, when he was a child, he was working as a ship's cook on a cruise ship in the North Blue. One night, the pirate Red Leg Zeph and his crew attacked the ship and pilfered it for anything valuable. However, both ships were caught in a sudden storm and were destroyed. As they sank, Zeph managed to save them both from drowning, but had lost part of his leg in the process and the two were washed onto a rock outcropping, high above the sea. Apparently the two of them were the only survivors, but despite living through the storm, the island they were on was like a slow and painful death sentence. There was little food for them, only a few rations had washed onto the rock with them, but there wasn't any trees or plants, no animals, and no way to reach the water to fish. Splitting up what little rations they had, Zeph ordered Sanji to sit at the other end of the island and look for a ship. Zeph had given Sanji enough food for five days, but he had been able to make it last for about twenty, and how he had nothing left but a moldy loaf of bread. But still no one ever came. Weeks passed and then months. Finally it came to a point that it was like he had been trapped in a daze. He was stuck staring out at the sea for so long that he could no longer tell the difference between the sun rising or setting. 
After about three months, he was starved to within an inch of his life, hardly more than skin and bones. Emaciated and desperate for food, he decided to take a chance and kill Zeph for his food. But when he slashed open the old man's sack in a fit of rage, he discovered that there was only treasure inside. That was when he realized that, not only did Zeph give him all the food that they had, but Zeph had sacrificed his own leg for him as well. Soon afterwards, a ship finally appeared, and they were spared from death. Because of this ordeal, Sanji pledged to never refuse food to a starving individual, no matter how evil or poor they may be. The smoking chef was struggling to get back to his feet. His hand curling up into a fist he gasped out. That old fart gave up his leg so that I could live. Everyone in the area stared at him as he got to his feet and declared, There's no way to repay the old geezer for his kindness unless I risk my life for him. However, not everyone agreed. Luffy's eyes turned dark and was just looking at him as Jin asked Sanji why he got back up. Sanji smirked as he said, "Afraid I can't do that. It's a little too much like giving up. The other cooks were trying to warn Sanji that he was gonna get himself killed. Their words all feel on death ears because his eyes said that Sanji was ready to die for the barity. But then Luffy did something unexpected. He seemed to have lost it completely. With a dangerous look in his eyes, shaking in anger, he launched himself into the air before becoming incredibly large with a big snout and tough, grayish skin. No don't, Sanji screamed. Understanding what was about to happen, Jinnil shot the old man. But Luffy was no longer listening as he screamed out the top of his lung, Hippo. And like that, his body came slamming down from the sky so that when he landed on the fin, it was instantly smashed to pieces. As Luffy hit the fin there was a dangerous, wild look in his, still human, eyes that was nothing his normal, cheerful self as he finished declaring his attack, C-A-N-O-N-B-A-L-L. The world seemed to shake as his body came down and with a great booming sound, the shrapnel went flying every which way and the ocean water came down like rain. There was stunned silence for a moment as they tried to recover from what just happened. Luffy was smiling as he surfaced in human form, glad for what he did. But with fury on his face, Krieg ordered Jin to hurry and kill Zeph, except Jin seemed reluctant to do so. I don't see why you're all so upset, Luffy said as Sanji tried to tell him off for what he did to the bear 80. But as he got up Luffy finished, but I will. I'm gonna sink it. And by looking at the look on his face, they could tell that he was deadly serious. No one could seem to believe what they were hearing and Sanji even got right up in Luffy's face. You moron that's what you're doing. He demanded furiously, you can't sink this ship. But if the restaurant's gone then there's no reason to attack then is there. Luffy retorted, no, Sanji screamed at him. This ship saved my life. I owe everything to her. And you will not take that away. You're gonna die for a dumb old restaurant. Luffy asked him. And for the first time it sounded like he thought Sanji was the crazy one here. Are you stupid? What you say? Sanji growled. Getting killed. Luffy yelled out as he grabbed Sanji by his jacket and pulled him right into his face. That's how you're gonna repay your debt. The old man didn't save you so you could kill yourself. He did it so that you could do something with your life. Not to die like a fool. And so your big idea is to help them attack us. Sanji yelled back. The two almost nose to nose again. Like how he and Zeph usually fight. Meanwhile, Pearl was laughing, telling them all that they couldn't do anything so long as Zeph was their captive and that he was gonna kill them both himself. However, before Pearl could strike Sanji and Luffy, Jin suddenly abandoned his duty of holding Zeph at gunpoint and dashed forward so that he quickly defeated him, shattering his invincible shield in one blow with a pair of tonfas that had cannonballs welded to their ends. Krieg was yelling at Jin, demanding to know what he was doing, but Jin stated that he will be the one to finish off Sanji that he owed him this much. Here, the chefs found out that Jin was Krieg's chef commander, his second in command more or less, and the rest of the Krieg pirates all agreed that he was strong and a merciless monster to them all. Sanji, look, I'm just following orders, Jin said, sounding remorseful, I don't want to ruin this ship, but I think it's too late for that. Maybe, Sanji said to him darkly, but, if you think you're gonna get to this restaurant without killing me then you got another thing coming. Perhaps in our next lives we'll be friends? Sounds fair, Jin said, lifting his weapon on his shoulder. Then it'll be an absolute pleasure to kill you, my good friend. Jeez, that's comforting, Sanji said as he lit a cigarette. Crap face. You as well, chore boy, Jin added, looking over at Luffy. Jeez, thanks, Luffy said indifferently, but he didn't seem worried at all. But I'm not afraid of any Krieg pirate. Jin was looking annoyed as the rest of Krieg's crew were all angry and were shrieking out insults and death threats, just outraged he had the gall to say something like that. We are the Krieg pirates, the strongest in East Blue. One of the pirates declared without a doubt in his mind. Luffy looked at them all, as if pitying them and said, only because you outnumbered the other pirates in the East Blue. There was nothing but silence, all the pirates grinding their teeth, looking like they wanted to dismiss it, yet at the same time, they couldn't declare that was a lie. Oh boy, Sanji said, now you really ticked him off. 
Guess I was right, Luffy answered. The Krieg pirates saw this as unforgivable, and they started to rush in, ready to try and prove themselves. However, they are immediately stopped by Krieg, telling Jin to hurry up and kill them. The battle went on and soon it was Jin and Sanji going at each other. Though strong, there was no doubt in anyone's minds that Sanji could have beaten him if he hadn't been injured by Pearl. Jin was fast and able to keep up with him, as well as even breaking some of Sanji's ribs by the sounds of it. But in the end, the injuries were what was making it almost impossible for Sanji to attack without terrible pain. It ended when Jin managed to pin him down and have his weapon above his head. With Sanji in pain, Luffy went after Krieg, but Krieg releases his armor and planned to kill Luffy there. He shoots Luffy with bombs and spears. Luffy was able to use his knife to deflect most of the spears and his animal honed reflexes to jump over the others. However the bombs blew him far away from the armored pirate. Then, Luffy asks if Krieg is not serious to fight with him as he brushed himself off from the explosions like it was an everyday thing for him. So, Krieg answer if the important thing in fighting is strategy to kill the opponent. Krieg jeers Luffy as a monkey because he just attacks without strategy, causing Luffy to gain a mischievous grin. With Luffy dealing with Krieg, something else happened. Just as Jin was about to land the final blow, Sanji found himself before a supposedly heartless pirate unable to kill him. Even with Krieg bellowing at him do it, Jin was crying, declaring that because of Sanji's previous kindness, he just couldn't bring himself to finish the job, he just can't forgive himself if he killed him. Krieg was disappointed with Jin. Although, before that, Jin was the person he trusted the most. Krieg sees excess in Jin's personality that will win in the battlefield with anyway. Then, Jin said that he always followed every order that Krieg had ever given him and that he will always respect and admire him. But, Jin still cannot kill him and begs to let the Baradis ship go. While this saved Sanji from being bludgeoned by Jin, it angered Krieg. You little brat. Krieg yelled furiously as he stood up. You think you can defy my orders and then tell me what to do? Jin could say nothing as tears continued to flow down his face. It's pathetic. Morality. Sympathy. Weaknesses I never expected to see from you. Krieg yelled. You are not my chef commander anymore. Krieg continued to yell as he grabbed part of his armor and pointed it directly at the three of them. Pirates. He called to his crew, step aside. Just then, the skull on the shield opened its mouth to reveal the nozzle of a miniature cannon. At the sight of it, Jin gasped in horror. No, not the gas. He cried. All the other pirates freaked out as well. He's gonna use the MH5. We're all gonna die. Where's my mask? Just breathing it and can kill a normal person in just a few minutes to even a few hours. The pirates all fished masks out of nowhere and were covering their faces. The only thing that matters in a battle is who ends up winning, Krieg stated before he smirked. Even if more have got to die, poison gas is just a means to an end. Victory is all that decides what's right and what's wrong. If you're dead, no one's gonna hear you complain anyway. When you don't hesitate to do unspeakable, horrible things, Krieg stated, grinning ever wider, that is true power. Luffy's face was cold and they were all sickened at the thought. Might as well throw that gas mask away. Ordered Krieg as he saw Jin pulling out his mask. You're no longer worthy to be a Krieg pirate. Luffy charged at Krieg, trying to make one last ditch effort to stop him, and even proclaiming that he wasn't going to let him do it. You're wasting your time. Chore boy, Krieg said as he punched the mask Luffy was running on, shattering it to pieces and causing him to lose his footing. In his desperation, Luffy dove into the water out of sight. The military pirate seemed surprised and pleased at this turn of events, thinking that he'd won as he prepared to fire the MH5 thinking that now he only had to deal with two small annoyances, believing Luffy to have drowned. Suddenly, a hammerhead shark, wearing Luffy's straw hat, burst from the water and nailed Krieg right in the stomach with a cry of hammerhead butt. Unfortunately the blow only knocked Krieg slightly off balance as he was still protected by his armor, and he was able to fire the gas bomb directly at the Baradi. Both pirates and cooks dove into the water as Patty and Karn took Zeph inside, but the two on the platform didn't have time to move anywhere. Thinking fast, Luffy dove back into the water to try and intercept the bomb but he knew it would be too late as the bomb landed on one of the platforms. A giant explosion rocked the area and a wave of purple gas filled the air, shrouding everything in front of them so that they couldn't see anything. It was deadly silent. The only sound came from the cry of a seagull above them, but soon it fell from the sky, dead before it hit the water. They waited and waited, every minute feeling like it stretched onto an hour. But after a painful five-minute wait, the gas finally started to clear for them to see just what happened. Luffy was safe as he hoped out of the water in human form, but the problem was Jin. Sanji yelling through his mask to get Jin off him, who was holding it there, making sure that he couldn't move. Jin are you okay? Luffy gasped. Jin didn't answer him, but his skin was now a sickly, dark purple and he was struggling for breath, coughing up blood from his mouth and nose. Every single painful gasp was weaker than the last. It's your mask, you gave it to Sanji, Luffy whispered, staring at the mask on the blonde cook's face, realizing what happened. Jin collapsed just as more blood erupted from his mouth. 
No, Luffy yelled, heading towards them as Sanji quickly caught him and held him up as he fought for his breath. But when Krieg started to laugh at it, Luffy stopped and turned to glare at him. What a fool, Krieg said, having removed his own mask, and was now mocking Jin's condition. You're paying for a plate of food with your life. Oh well, maybe you'll learn. When you're dead, Sanji was still holding Jin, who was gasping out Krieg's name. Whether it was in anger or pleading, it was hard to say as he wheezed for air. Jin, Sanji whispered softly, so it seems. He glared up at Krieg with disgust. That Don Krieg wasn't the right man for you to follow, was he? Krieg just laughed, and the sound of it was making them long to hit him. It figures that you would still feel for that pathetic scum, he said loudly. Scum, Sanji exclaimed in rage. That's right. Anyone who loses focus and betrays my ship is worthless to me, Krieg said as he grinned again. He would almost certainly do it again. Putting him out of his misery is an act of mercy to keep him from dishonoring himself in the future and endangering my crew. The Krieg pirates, meanwhile, just couldn't believe that Krieg would kill Jin. No one was more loyal to Krieg than Jin and the chefs all learned that when they escaped from the Grand Line and were being pursued by full body, Jin went out alone and masqueraded as Krieg. Jin always sacrificed himself to save Krieg and he did anything to win. That's why people called him Demon. Sanji turned to Patty and Karn and told them to get the kit used for food poisoning as Zeph told him to put the mask on to detoxify the gas in his lungs and then to take him to the upper deck of the Barity where the air was fresher. Krieg just laughed and claimed that because of the poison, Jin will die in one hour. Luffy suddenly spoke again. Don't you dare die, Jin, he said. And though his words were quiet, everyone seemed to have heard it and turned to look at him. Even Jin raised his head a little to try and see him, though it was hard to tell with the mask over his face. You can't let someone like him win, Luffy told him, his eyes as sharp and cold as Mihawk's had been as he glared at Krieg. Stick around. Now I'm mad. You'll want to see what I'm gonna do to him next. Jin, however, didn't believe that Luffy can defeat Creek. Even Sanji tries to stop him too and yelled that he will be killed if he attacks him head on. To make everyone stop worrying. Luffy just said, I'm not worried. And then he started his attack at Creek's front. Go ahead and give it your best shot. He screamed as Creek grinned cockily and Sanji cried for him not to do it. But Luffy ignored him as he charged ahead. And they knew that he wasn't going to back down this time. You are only running towards one thing, sure boy. And that is, Krieg said as he threw several small bombs into the water, your funeral. My funeral, Luffy repeated scathingly. The bombs went off to both blind the animal man and to prevent him from jumping back into the water. The water splashed up around him and that was when Krieg took out his spike machine gun again and shot through the water. But Luffy still ran through it. And when he burst out of the waves the chefs noticed his body was covered in a shell-like material from the front of a turtle. Unfortunately this didn't stop several of the spikes from hitting Luffy's unprotected limbs. But Luffy ignored the pain as he neared Creek. Reeling his arm back as scales started to cover it Luffy cried out, Turtle, realizing that he was going to try and attack. Creek revealed a robe made of dangerous spikes to deter any attacks. Jab, Luffy yelled, as he went and punched him right through the metal spikes, the spikes scraping against the scales on his hand, and managed to strike Creek dead in the face. Both pirates and cooks were staring in horror at what Luffy had just done. Someone then summed up all their thoughts by shouting out three words. That's messed up. Luffy was standing there almost like a zombie for a moment before he went and began to pull the spikes out. It was then that everyone noticed that the cuts on Luffy's hands weren't much worse than paper cuts. Most likely the worst of the damage was blocked due to the tough scales. So is this my funeral? He asked as he pulled out the first spike and threw it to the ground and went on, or yours. He went for another spike. You can't kill me. With little spikes, out came that one. My funeral. He threw out the last spike, we'll take more than this. Breathing hard for a minute and biting back the pain, he went on, you'll have to do better than that, if you wanna beat me. He looked back up, grinned wildly, cause I don't think it's time for me to die just yet. Sanji, who was nursing his wounds from Jin, was now looking over at him. I know one thing, he's nuts, he said to Zef. Zef smirked down at him before he said, I've seen one or two like him before. Stubborn kids who rather die and have to turn away from a fight once it started. He'll stay, Sanji said knowingly. That's for sure. I'm glad he's with us cause guys like that are hell to fight, Zeph said conversationally. I don't care if he wins or loses, Zeph finished. I consider it an honor just to be able to watch him. So boy, it's not your funeral yet is it? Too bad. Krieg snarled from where he lay and slowly began to lift himself up, because one of us has got to go. And since I'm here, I'd really like to pay my respects. He charged Luffy and slammed one of his shields at point black, die. He screamed as he fired a miniature explosion. But Luffy easily jumped to avoid it and even hooked his foot on Krieg's shoulder when he jumped over him, knocking him down twice in under a minute. You first, Luffy shouted out as the bulky armor hit the platform with a resounding thud. Unnoticed by all was how dark hair was starting to creep up the Chimera boy's limbs and the beginnings of a tail started to sprout from his spine. 
Meanwhile, this creates severe anguish amongst his crew members, as Krieg has always came out of a battle unscathed. It was the first time they had ever seen Krieg being knocked down and they were all wondering that he wasn't invincible after all and his reputation would be destroyed if a kid was able to defeat him. However, when one crewmate began to believe that Luffy might just be stronger than Krieg, that got his attention. Shut up maggots. Never doubt me. Krieg screamed before combining his shoulder plates together to form his mighty battle spear, which he slams into the ground next to Luffy, creating an explosion. The Krieg pirates were finally rejoicing as they see Krieg's secret weapon, as he discards his cape and explained that it was stronger than the spikes he fired at Luffy earlier. While Luffy wondered out loud how the spear made an explosion as he hid behind a broken part of the ship, Krieg gave him an answer by bragging once again. My mighty battle spear, he boasted, it's different from any other. When this thing hits you, you won't just be wounded and failing. You'll be blown straight into the afterlife. Continuing the battle, the surrounding wreckage was eventually reduced to sunken rubble with both combatants having very little room to move on. Krieg swung it again, sending Luffy flying over the ocean, but after the swing was completed, Krieg couldn't see Luffy at all. Noticing that his spear felt heavier for some reason, the villainous pirate looked at the spear's end and was shocked to see Luffy hanging upside down from the head of the spear with a long brown tail wrapped around the shaft. Not just the tail, but Luffy's arms, legs, and part of his face were covered in dark hair while his feet had gained opposable thumbs, the pirate going for his monkey man form. Seeing the cheerful grin on the straw hat wearing monkey boy, Krieg lost what little patience he had left and started swinging his spear like a baseball bat in order to throw off the annoyance. Luffy was able to easily flip off the spear before he was thrown, however, and landed gracefully several feet away from the larger man before slipping into a battle stance. You said earlier that I fought like a monkey with no plan at all, Luffy chittered. Well let me show you how a real monkey fights. Krieg gave a roar as he made several attempts at stabbing the agile monkey, all of which Luffy either dodged with ease with impressive acrobatic movements or was able to punch and kick the spear away before it could make contact. Krieg was looking slightly out of breath after five minutes of this and the Chimera Man's victory looked assured. But just then Luffy's one leg buckled leaving him kneeling and trying to catch his breath, a dark reed starting to stain his fur from the wounds on his arms and legs. He's lost way too much blood, Sanji said, still holding onto his hurt ribs. He can't fight for much longer. This better end quickly. Krieg continues his assault on Luffy, who is now dodging for his life as the wounds started to take their toll. He jumped to the section of the ship Luffy was resting on and ended up blowing it up. On and on, Luffy was being attacked and was forced to only dodge until he found a way out of it. He was able to keep it up for a while before he finally lost his balance, which makes him wide open for an attack. However, just in the nick of time, Luffy grabbed the lance before it can hit him once more. Enraged, Krieg slams the spear into the ground, forcing Luffy to let go. Krieg proceeded to ram the spear at Luffy, who punched the tip, creating an explosion which sent him flying through the air. But already, Luffy was forcing his wounded body to get back up. And like before, Krieg swung the spear at him. And again, Luffy punched the blade, making it explode a second time. Krieg swung again, declaring that he was stronger than Luffy. Nonetheless, Luffy took each hit without budging an inch. Crap, Sanji hissed. There's no way that chore boy can take much more of this. That spear is way too powerful. No, you're wrong, Zeph said to Sanji in disagreement. Even with a hundred thousand more weapons, our chore boy can still bring him to his knees because he does not know fear. Sanji looked up at Zeph in confusion as Krieg dished out another attack at Luffy. And of course Luffy met it head on. Burnt black with his fur now smoldering. Luffy landed flat on his back on the wreckage, smoking lightly. Krieg smirked as he turned and walked away, sneering that it was too easy. But at those words, Luffy began to push himself back up, stopping dead in his tracks. Krieg turned to look as he raised the spear back up. Now that's impressive, he muttered, but he was looking angry now. Stand or fall, Zeph went on, life or death. In a struggle for your very existence, you cannot have even the slightest bit of fear or you will be lost. But Sanji didn't seem to understand as he asked him what he was talking about. That kid out there, Zeph answered impatiently, as if speaking to someone dumb, as Luffy charged again and took another blast to the face. When he's fighting, Zeph said as Luffy pushed himself back up through the broken boards with a grin. He's not afraid of anything, not even death. Still smiling, Luffy got up once again and went up for another blast to the face. Is it all instinct? Zeph asked suddenly. Or all a plan? He grinned, as if he figured it all out on his own. We'll know soon. If he lives. What plan? Sanji asked him. Killing himself, Krieg was getting more annoyed, veins sticking out on his head as he snarled at Luffy, cursing him out. But Luffy just continued to grin as the chefs all cheered from the background. I told you, Krieg yelled as he ran with his spear, today is your funeral. Another boom went off, I am invincible. Just then, Luffy threw himself back at Krieg one more time. Another boom sounded off and there was silence for a moment. 
There is no doubt that Krieg and his pirates are strong, Zef continued one. But Chore Boy has something they'll never have. Krieg may have more pirates at his command than anyone else before him. He may have terrible weapons of mass destruction to everything in his path. But he will never have that kid's heart. Sanji was just watching it before his one visible eye suddenly widened in understanding. No sooner did he say that did Luffy slam his foot into the deck. And the shockwave from that broke the tip of the spear, much to Krieg's confusion and horror. The great battle spear. Krieg yelled in disbelief. What did you do boy? Luffy grinned at him. I just punched it in the head five times. It looks tired. Maybe it needs a rest. Luffy's eyes narrowed as he said, now it's my turn. Be ready for this. Because that was all I needed, Luffy said with a huge grin. Now that your little toy's broken, you're nothing to me. Krieg's eyes narrowed. Oh yeah. Yeah, without the blade, it's just a bomb on a stick. And let's face it, that's pretty lame, Luffy stated. Krieg smirked again before going in for another attack. But Luffy dodged it and jumps up to the mast, swinging around like how an actual monkey would from the tree. Then Krieg breaks the mast, missing Luffy completely as he threw the mast like a javelin back at him. But, Krieg destroyed it by shooting fire at it from a miniature flamethrower attached to his wrist. Once they were on a stable platform Luffy ran forward to hit Krieg with a series of punches and kicks with his animalistic strength. Krieg's armor, however, withstood the attack. Finally angry, Luffy ran forward, becoming more muscular as his tail disappeared and reared back his arms so that he could hit him once again. When his fist hit the armor they could hear the deep ringing noise like a bell when he hit. Luffy kept going, but Krieg hit him with the remains of the spear and he was sent back across the deck. As Luffy was trying to recover, Krieg jumped to the top of the tallest remaining mast and sneered down at him, calling to him to get him to look up. You don't stand a chance boy. He yelled down, real power comes from deadly weapons. They're the source of true strength. He sneered, see, only the strong are meant to live. And that's me. You're just a stupid, filthy animal. Krieg threw out bombs from his place on top the mast but Luffy chased him to try and stop him. The whole time, there was an evil grin still on his face, yeah. He challenged, that's what you think. He threw his muscular and hairy arms back when he got near enough to the cocky jerk. Krieg hit him with his weapon one more time, but it wasn't enough to stop the gorilla double hammer. That came flying at him. Through the explosion and smoke, Luffy charged through and finished crying out his attack, Krieg screaming in shock. And that was when he was sent flying into the air, his bombs falling from his hands. Something was wrong though, as there was a blank look in Luffy's eyes, smoke coming out of his mouth from that last detonation. That's it, Krieg bragged as he went flying backwards. After all that big talk that's all you got. But then he blinked in surprise to see that his golden arm was cracking apart and was then yelling in disbelief about it. However, his smirk was back soon when he noticed that Luffy still didn't move. To him, his destroyed armor was enough of a price for this victory. But Sanji realized what those bombs were and screamed up at Luffy, it's a trap, get out. The bombs Kriegs dropped exploded and destroyed the rest of the battlefield. There wasn't anything left but splinters. The rocking waves put everyone in the water in danger and Sanji cried out over the noise and fear. Once again, Luffy surprised them all. Bursting through the smoke with his arms now changed into a bird's wings, Krieg screaming out in terror at the sight of his face, losing all his cool. What? Krieg screamed in utter shock. Luffy quickly shifted his arms back to human and then once more into their gorilla form and gave another yell of gorilla double hammer. And when this attack hit, it did the job. He destroyed the armor by shattered it to pieces and sent Krieg falling to the ocean. I totally win. Luffy screamed out, his hands in the air in victory. This I sent over yet boy. Krieg screamed, and Luffy looked taken aback by the fact that he was still in it. Krieg shot a steel net from the same arm that had the flamethrower and wrapped around Luffy. He was now trapped and Krieg was laughing as he pulled him to the sea, confident that Luffy would still get tangled up and drown in the net, believing he could only turn into larger animals. Krieg laughed in triumph as he as he pulled Luffy towards the sea. You can't escape. This is a steel net. Luffy struggled in the net, as Krieg screamed out triumphantly, It's over. That's the ocean down there. Looks like I'll be getting the last laugh after all, chore boy. But Luffy suddenly had an idea, transforming into a small humming bird and slipping right out of the net before going back to human, much to Krieg's shock and horror. Falling towards Krieg at neck-breaking speeds, Luffy laughed out, I got that jerk right where I wanted him. Luffy began to grow bigger as his skin took on a grayish hue and his nose turned into a long trunk while sharp tusks poked through his mouth, turning him into an elephant. The straw hat-wearing elephant wrapped his trunk around Krieg's head and spun around to trap him, spinning like a propeller as he aimed it right at the Berrydee's fin. Time for me to end this. Right now. Elephant. He cried out eagerly. The two were both screaming, but for different reasons. Giant hammer. And with that, Luffy slammed Krieg's head into the fin, shattering what was left of it, where Krieg finally lost and backed out. Luffy, going back to his normal form, grinned before exhaustion took over. He was out cold before he even hit the water. Scene break. Luffy was sitting up in bed, looking around sleepily and realized that he wasn't alone. 
Sanji was sitting in the window, looking out at the sea. Luffy blinked a few times, and they could see that he had several bandages wrapped in the places where he pulled the spikes out as he put his hand on his head and screamed out in panic. My hat. Where's my hat? It's right there. Calm down, Sanji said loudly. Luffy's hat was sitting on a shelf with things like cigarettes and even a picture of Sanji and Zeph when they first opened the restaurant. Luffy sighed in relief and put it happily on his head. Have a good nap, Sanji asked as Luffy looked around the room. Hey, those pirates, Luffy asked in confusion. And it was clear he was trying to figure out how he got here. They're gone now, Sanji answered, all thanks to you. Bay, he asked in surprise. Yeah, though you're lucky. One of those spikes hit a vein and with you both jumping around and changing so much, it's a miracle you didn't bleed to death. You're one freaky guy, you know that right. To which Luffy smiled sheepishly while scratching the back of his head. Sanji gave an amused chuckle before continuing. Oh and before I forget, Jin asked me to tell you that he said he'll see you on the Grand Line, Sanji said, looking back out at the ocean. He did. Luffy asked in surprise, to you. No, to you. Sanji yelled back as he climbed out the window to the balcony and walked to the railing. There was silence all around them for a moment before Luffy reminded him that he didn't have to be chore boy anymore since he got Krieg out of here. That's the deal, Sanji confirmed for him. Hey, I was wondering, Luffy said but Sanji already guessed what he was gonna say and beat him by telling him that his answer was still no, he wasn't going to become a pirate, that he was going to stay here at the Barady until Zeph acknowledged him as a real cook. Luffy sighed, his eyes overshadowed as he told him that he finally gave up. However, his words and his actions didn't match. His arm became scaly and reached out to grab hold of Sanji's collar like a snake and the blonde chef was gasping at him to let go. Sanji was telling Luffy that he couldn't leave just yet, but that he did promise himself that one day he would go to the Grand Line. Luffy beamed as he stretched out to join him on the balcony. Well, let's go right now, he said. It just isn't the right time. Not yet, Sanji said. They continued to look out at the sea for a moment before he said, There is one place. And without another word, he turned back to Luffy and asked, his face suddenly lighting up with exhilaration as he asked, Say have you ever heard of All Blue? No, Luffy answered bluntly. You've got to be kidding me. Sanji asked, still never losing his smile. That sea is a miracle. Luffy's eyes widened as he went on and on about his dream of one day seeing the All Blue. In the All Blue there are fish from the East Blue, the West Blue, the North Blue, and the South Blue, he said breathlessly. That one stretch of ocean has it all. To us cooks it's a culinary dream come true. A place that fantastic has got to be on the Grand Line somewhere right. Luffy was intrigued, because he'd talked to several fish by his island yet none mentioned anything like the All Blue. Of course, most fish aren't known for their attention spans. This continued on for some time about Sanji's dreams of seeing the All Blue and what he would make once he got there. When Patty screamed out that lunch was served, the two decided to go down and get some as well. But they came before a surprising incident. First there wasn't any seating left and he and Luffy were forced to sit on the floor. Luffy decided to eat in dog form, since it was much more comfortable eating on the floor that way. That is until several chefs, including Sanji, whacked the clothed dog over the head, correctly guessing that he was the one playing the cute puppy act to win table scraps from the customers. Things settled back down as the chefs went back to their meals. Soon though it got nasty when all the chefs kept going on about how they hated his food. It ended with a big fight with Zeph and Sanji before he went charging out. The only one who didn't have something to say about Sanji's cooking was Luffy, who was gulping it all down. What's all the fuss about? He asked, ladling himself more and licking some off his muzzle. This soup's totally awesome. All of us know the soup is good, Zef said and Luffy looked up in surprise. I know he's an outstanding chef. Everyone here on the Barady does, Zef said. Not a single one of the other cooks disagreed. All of them nodding the same way and told him what they all thought. But that thick scold idiot wouldn't listen to us if we tried to reason with him, he said. Luffy continued to enjoy the soup when Zef made a surprising request. Hey, listen, you were saying that you needed a cook for your ship, right? Well, this isn't something I want to be asking anyone but, would you mind taking that little brat along with you? Take him to the Grand Line. He smiled, that would be best for him. The Grand Line is his dream. Geez boss, you sure made us put on a heck of a show, Patty said, looking close to laughing. Oh man, Karn laughed. I was worried he was gonna figure it out cause of your bad acting. Patty laughed. Come on your acting was way worse than mine. But their fight was interrupted when Luffy said something that made them all almost fall over, no way. But earlier you mentioned you needed a cook for your ship, Zeph said loudly. And he was now sounding angry. Just what are you trying to say? That he's suddenly not good enough for you. Oh, he's good, Luffy admitted, turning back to his food, and I'd love it if he joined my crew and came with us. He swallowed and finished, but it seems like he really wants to stay here and cook with all of you guys. You can ask me all you want but I'm just not gonna take him. 
So you're saying you can't agree to it unless he tells you himself? Zeph said, playing with his mustache. Is that right? That's right, Luffy said before he held out his plate in his mouth and asked for more food. Zeph thought it over before he said, Well, I suppose that's fair enough. But who knows if that hard-headed little brat will ever agree to join up with you. Yeah, Patty added. Once that guy makes up his mind there's nothing anybody can do to change it. No sooner did he said that when something came with a crash right through the wall, causing Luffy to leap up into human form as he got into a battle stance. Through the dust they saw that it was a large panshark with Yosaku hanging from his mouth and with Sanji underneath them. After they pulled Yasaku out of the thing's mouth, it went back to the water and took off as they heard what happened. They had Yasaku with a blanket and he explained that though they weren't able to catch up to Nami, they figured out where she was heading. But Yasaku also added that he came back here to get Luffy, explaining that they needed his help because the place they were going to could mean certain death for them all. All right, Luffy said, I don't really get it, but I got it. Sanji was leaning against the railing outside as the two got up and walked past, going to get ready to leave. But as soon as Luffy walked past him, he said to wait. Your dream is foolish, he said when Luffy did stop to listen, but then again, so is mine. Luffy didn't look at him as Sanji looked up to the sky. Now's as good a time as any. Why not start my quest right now, Sanji? Luffy asked, turning his head slightly. Pushing himself off the banister Sanji looked at him and said, I'll be joining your little crew on your journey to be king of the pirates. Luffy turned to stare at him as Sanji finished up. You hear me? I want to be the cook on your ship. They sized each other up as he finished. All right, want to say. A big grin appeared on his face and he screamed out, Yeah, of course. He and Yasaku were both jumping around, dancing and singing happily as Sanji looked up at the cooks. Are you guys happy now or what? He asked grumpily, but he was smirking when he saw their sour expressions. Sorry, really. I'll leave now. Hattie snorted and said that he wanted to throw him out himself for up and abandoning them. I'm especially sorry for making the lot of you resort to bad acting, Sanji told him. Hey wait, Patty yelled. How'd you know? I heard everything, you bunch of jerks, Sanji answered, now turning to glare at Zeph. Was stomping on my pride the best plan you could come up with? Was it, you old geezer? Every little thing has to be a fight with you, Hattie yelled, holding up a fist. I'm sick and tired of it, bring it on. But Zeph was holding Patty back as he looked to Sanji. I have never liked children. As a matter of fact I hate children. There wasn't a day past that I didn't regret letting a useless little brat like you live Sanji. Fine by me you rotten old man, Sanji smirked back. Enjoy the rest of your miserable life. With that, Sanji made to leave with Luffy and Yosaku. He told them that he was going to get his stuff and that he would meet up with them later. Later, as he was packing, Luffy got a surprise when Zeph had offered him his logbook. But Luffy had refused, and caused Zeph to smirk again and leave. Soon, with everyone on board, Luffy and Yosaku were waiting with all the other cooks outside on the fins. That was patched together rather sloppily. Finally, Sanji appeared in the doorway with his knives in his case and a sack over his shoulder. He stood there for a minute in the doorway. As if realizing that this was all for real, he slowly walked forward. But Patty and Karn jumped him, ready to give him a beating. Of course with two kicks, Sanji took them out. Really guys that was just dumb. A chef said to them as they bled on the deck and Sanji continued on as if no one interrupted him. It was silent after that as Sanji walked with all the cooks on either side of him, only the sounds of his footsteps and the waves could be heard. It was as if he was about to leave for a dangerous war and might never come back. Though, thinking about it, that wasn't impossible. He reached the boat and said, without ever looking back, let's get going. You don't need to say goodbye. Luffy asked a little surprise, but Sanji smiled as he said it was fine, and was about to get in when Zeph called out behind him. Sanji, he said from the upper balcony, take care of yourself okay. Sanji was standing there frozen at those words. Even after all this time, those words seemed to have echoed inside him. Though those simple words wouldn't mean much to others. To Sanji, those words meant so much. Zeph, a man who usually belittled him one way or another, asked him to take care of himself. He was fighting the tears that threatened to come out but was quickly breaking down as an understanding smile appeared on Luffy's face. Chef Z-E-F-F-F. Sanji screamed out into their astonishment he spun around and fell to his knees, his forehead touching the Baradis' deck. He was so completely moved by what Zeph said, that he just couldn't hold it in. Thanks you Gazer, I'll never forget your kindness. I owe my life to you old man, so thank you. Tears had also appeared in Zeph's eyes. Soon all the other chefs were crying as well, saying how much they were gonna miss him. There wasn't a dry eye around and Sanji was smiling through his tears. Stupid words, Zeph said, his eyes bloodshot as he rubbed them. Real men should part without a word let alone tears. Luffy stood grinning as they watched them all try and mop up their feelings and Sanji finally stepped onto the boat. Let's go, set sail. Luffy hollered and they pushed off, with Sanji waving to them all, still crying the whole way. I will see you again. He promised them. I'll come back someday. 
The whole time the chefs waved him off, yelling they wished him good luck and that they would miss him. With an emotional bear 80 behind, they watched the three head off as the chefs waving him off even after he was out of their sights. It has been a couple days since the group had left the bear 80 in search of their absent crew members. Yasaku and Sanji were near the front of the ship and resting there as Luffy jumped around like a little kid hopped up on sugar. Finally, Sanji yelled at Luffy to calm down. Still excited, he came over to sit at the very front of the boat and turned to Yasaku, so... Are we getting close to where Nami is? You know, the island. Suddenly, Yasaku slammed his hand down on his knee and got their attention. Pointing an accusing finger at him he yelled out, You're way too naive and way too young. Don't you get it? Don't you realize every second that passes brings us closer to the infamous Arlong? Yasaku spoke to Sanji and Luffy that, due to Nami's suspicious behavior being connected to their copy of Arlong's wanted poster, he and Johnny suspected that there had to be a connection between them. Of course Luffy and Sanji didn't seem at all concerned as Luffy asked for food. Yasaku looked ready to fall over at how clueless they were and went on to yell about everything he knew about Arlong. But Sanji was starting to swoon at the idea of mermaids and Luffy made gills appear on his neck along with a fish tail to mimic the idea, but was knocked out of it by a well-placed kick to the head courtesy of Sanji. Yasaku was getting frustrated and told them all about the seven warlords and mentioned Mihawk and a member who was also a fishman and just how dangerous they were. Arlong has taken control of 20 towns since coming to the East Blue, Yasaku said with fear in his voice. His strength easily surpasses anyone you've encountered, including Don Creek. He's devastating. But Sanji couldn't understand why Nami would go after him by herself, which Yosaku responded that she was trying to get his bounty, with Sanji now fantasying about her being a mermaid. Sanji then went to get food done as Luffy said they would worry about it when they got there. But as the three were sitting down to really enjoy their food, there was a rumble beneath them. Suddenly, what sounded like a moo came from beneath the waves. The sea rose up on the side of the boat, and through the giant wave were a pair of horns. Sanji looked overboard to see a giant sea cow rising up out of the sea. He had a big round nose with a gold nose ring, cow-esque face and horns, green spots throughout his body, with a great big seal-like body. Yasaku screamed in panic as Luffy and Sanji looked at it in mild curiosity. Luffy, wanting to know what the creature wanted, dived into the water and suddenly another giant sea cow erupted from the water, startling everyone present. Yasaku screamed while foaming at the mouth before Sanji calmed down and pointed out the second sea monster. Unlike the first monstrous cow though, this one had black spots on its body, as well as a highly familiar scar under the eye and straw hat resting on the top of his head. The two creatures seemed to be talking to each other for a minute or two, the soft moose being the only thing the two humans could make out. Suddenly though, the black spotted sea cow's eyes went white with rage and it gave a devastating headbutt to the first one, sending it flying back into the sea with tears of pain streaming from its eyes. The straw-hatted one suddenly turned back into Luffy, who landed gracefully on the railing of the ship before turning back to where he sent the cow flying, screaming out, Bad sea cow, stay away from our food. As the sea cow mooed in anger and pain, Sanji told him off for that and went over to where the sea cow had swam to. He went to try to feed him, but as soon as it opened his mouth, Sanji kicked it so hard that he was thrown backwards into the sea. What the crap are you doing? You jerk. Yasaku bellowed at him furiously. He was gonna eat me with the plate, what could I do? Sanji asked casually, one leg up on the side of the boat, clearly waiting for it to come back up. The beast roared in fury, falling towards them, but Sanji ran up the mast and kicked him so hard in the neck that it hit the ocean, out cold. And to add insult to injury, Sanji and Luffy sat back down at the table to finish their food. You guys are insane, Yasaku whispered, staring at them with admiration and horror. Would have been a waste of good food, Sanji said causally. Soon enough, the boys finished their meal and tied a rope around the cow's horns once he woke up tearfully. Onwards cow, Buffy cried out, and a terrified sea cow set off. Soon they were almost flying across the water as the cow pulled them. Only fifteen minutes later they spotted land in the distance. Buffy jumped to the bow of the ship and enjoyed the ride, yelling out that he could see Arlong Park from here to the other two. The building, several stories high and Arlong's Jolly Roger at the top, was conspicuously placed at the coast to show that they had no fear of the law, and where the pool on the outside was linked to the outer seas with a pair of steel gates that kept it close. Luffy yelled excitedly from the front and yelled at the large cow to pick up the pace. I feel sorry for it, Yasaku said with his hand on his chin. Sanji's kick must have really taken its toll. The monstrous cow suddenly began to turn away from Arlong Park and headed more to the right of it. Not that way. Luffy yelled as he pointed back to the building, your other left. To the building, stupid. The cow ignored him and kept going in the wrong direction as Luffy continued to laugh in excitement as they headed straight for the shoreline. The cow then crashed into the shore with such force that when the sea cow hit, it knocked itself out and launched the little boat right into the air so that it was sent soaring across the island. Oh, it's almost like we're flying, Luffy exclaimed happily. 
We are flying you moron. Sanji yelled as he and Yasaku clung on. No we're falling. Yasaku screamed. Luffy gave a scream of delight as they descended into the forest and started to slide across the ground like a skate would on ice. Landing successful. Luffy cried happily. But Luffy suddenly stopped laughing and was shouting out. Hey Z-O-R-O. The swordsman was standing there staring at them with a gapping mouth. The boat crashed into him. But the pain didn't last long however as they finally burst through the trees, over some wetlands and they finally crashed right into a high cliff, destroying the boat. Eventually, they tried to get out of the wreckage. As the smoke and dust of the crash disappeared, Luffy's voice was calling out, Awesome. We're here guys. After dusting off his hat, he was standing up and looking around eagerly as a muffled voice beneath the boards. What the heck? Zoro forced the boards off him, screaming out at them all, What are you doing? What do you mean? Luffy asked innocently as he stood up. Sanji was still sitting on a crate, also a mess but didn't seem to have moved from his seat. Yasaku on the other hand was in the background, his legs up in the air as the rest of him was buried in the debris. We're here to pick up Nami, duh. Luffy went on as if it was obvious. How come you haven't found her yet? He paused and thought as if he just remembered something. Oh yeah, and what about Yuzop and Johnny? But then Zoro's eyes suddenly widened as the mention of Yuzop. Yuzop, he exclaimed as he stood up. Oh no, come on, we gotta hurry. He started to run off. Why? What's wrong? Luffy asked after him. That idiot was caught by Arlong, he explained quickly. We gotta hurry before they kill him. He's already dead, a familiar voice stated for them. Jumping at the voice, they looked up in time to see Johnny slowly coming towards them. He was looking tired and out of breath as tears fell from his eyes. What? Zoro exclaimed as he came towards them. We're too late. Johnny continued numbly as he fell to his knees in front of them. Big bro Yuzapa's dead. Johnny punched the ground bitterly and cried out. Nami. Murdered him. You can't be serious. Yasaku cried out. But it was Luffy who was looking furious, shouting out. That's a lie. Yeah, it's true. Johnny exclaimed as he fell back to the ground and sat cross-legged. She was a traitor all along. She's been winning Arlong's favor so she could have the treasure buried in Kakoyashi village all for herself. He slammed his hand on the ground. That woman's just a cold-hearted killer. She won't stop till she gets what she wants. Naomi had us fooled the entire. But Luffy wouldn't hear any more of it. He charged again and screamed out that Johnny was a liar as he grabbed him by his collar and shook him so violently that he even let his hat fall off. Say another word and you'll regret it. Easy Luffy, this has nothing to do with Johnny, Zoro said in a calm voice. Johnny turned his head. Go on believe whatever you want. But I know what I saw. Nami killed big bro Yuzop. Shut your mouth. Luffy yelled as he shook Johnny again, refusing to believe anything he said. His pupils had taken on a slit, feral appearance. Never in a million years would Nami kill Yuzop. She wouldn't do that to her friends. But, but I saw it. Johnny stammered out as Luffy looked like he was ready to throw a punch. But then another familiar voice spoke up in a contemptuous way. What was that about friends, Luffy? They looked up to see Nami was standing on the road. She had changed into a green spotted shirt and was now sporting a tattoo on her shoulder of a sawnose shark turned to the left with the tail curving inward. Around the shark is a semi-oval with three curves emitting from it. She stood there with her staff in her hands, arms folded, and staring at them all as if they were strangers who were bugging her. Nami, Luffy exclaimed in surprise as he dropped Johnny, calming down almost at once and his appearance went back to normal. She didn't answer for a moment as her eyes narrowed coldly, and they all had their eyes widened in surprise. What are you doing here? She asked, her voice bored, as if she couldn't care less for the answer. What are we doing here? You're our friend, Luffy said in surprise, we came to get you. He picked up his hat, as she just jeered at him. What a pest, she said. Nami, Luffy questioned, wondering as she spoke in the same cold voice. Friends, huh, don't make me laugh. You're just pathetic enough to deserve each other, she said with a sneer that make her look quite unlike herself. Damn you, you killed him. I watched you do it. Johnny yelled angrily, pointing a shaking finger at her. And now. Big bro Yuzop is gone. Yep that's right. So why don't you kill me get your revenge? Nami said without batting an eye. What? Gasped Johnny, who seemed stunned that she answered him so causally. Word to the wise, fellas, she said sarcastically. Because of your friend's stupidity, she looked to Zoro and rolled her eyes and explained, Arlong is preparing to kill Zoro along with his entire crew. And I don't care about how monstrously strong you guys think you are. You're no match for the real monsters. She played with the staff on her shoulder and that was when they all noticed the thick bandage around her hand. I promise you, you stay on this island, you will die. So you have a choice to make between life and death. Nami finally finished as Zoro was now growling angrily at her. Sanji on the other hand was looking love struck once again and cried out. Her heartless face is so hot. He waved his arms excitedly as he swooned. Hi Nami, it's me Sanji. Let's run away together. Can it, Romeo? This isn't the time or place for that. Zoro yelled in annoyance at him. Excuse me. Sanji challenged. Love is like a hurricane. So back off. 
But Zoro was no longer listening as he turned his back to him and looked directly at Nami, something that ticked him off. Hey, look at me when I'm talking to you. He was ignored as Zoro demanded to know where Yuzop was. With the fishes, she answered and some of the crew shivered at that. Dang it. He yelled as he pulled out his one sword, cut the crack. He looked ready to attack her, but Sanji stood in the way and Zoro had to dodge the kick aimed at his face. How sad. A swordsman attacking a lady. He asked him coldly. Idiot. Zoro growled at Sanji. Can't you see what's happening here? You're starting to tick me off. Sanji just laughed. If someone stopped me that easily, I'd be mad too. What? Zoro demanded hotly. You should watch your mouth. I'll say whatever I want. Jerkwad. Sanji growled right back, and it looked like they were going to have a fight as Yasaku was now trying to get them to stop from fighting. Big bros, we're all in this together okay. He yelled, this is no time to fight. Your pal's right. Nami agreed darkly, now quit your bickering and leave while you still can. You outsiders have no right to butt into this island's affairs. Don't you get it yet? The only reason I got close to you idiots was so that I could rob you of everything you had. But now that you're broke, it looks like your dream's dead. So go, take your ship. Go on, find a navigator dumb enough to join you and go to the Grand Line. Continue on your quest to find the One Piece or whatever. She went on before she pointed her staff at them all. Just leave here. You're an eyesore. Johnny and Yasaku growled furiously at her, looking like they wanted to attack, convinced that she had scared them away. Nami sighed and her eyes were now being hidden by her bangs as she told them all goodbye. But there, her voice had changed. It was no longer cold or scolding. It was sad. Buffy just looked at her with a blank stare. Nami, he said softly. For a few more seconds he stood there before he closed his eyes and fell back onto the ground. Big bro Luffy. Johnny exclaimed in surprise. Sleepy, Luffy stated. Sleep. Johnny exclaimed in disbelief. Right now, in the middle of the road. Yasaku questioned him. Well, I'm pretty tired. Luffy answered coolly before he yawned. I'm not gonna butt in their affairs. Not interested. But I'm not leaving either. Night. Yasaku's jaw fell open. Unable to believe what he was hearing. Big bro. Johnny stuttered and even Zoro face palmed himself at those words. Nami seemed to snap at this. She lost all coldness in her expression and she was now shaking with rage and she finally screamed out, Whatever, just go ahead and die. And without a backward glance she turned and went running away as fast as she could, as if afraid to stay near them any longer. When Luffy awoke to the yelling of Sanji and Zoro, he gave a shout of surprise as he rushed to Yuzo, who was both alive and a mess. His face was smashed in from both sides as if he got stuck between two boulders and blood was dripping down from his mouth and crooked nose. Yuzo, he screamed out, shaking him a little. Did Nami do all this to you? Luffy shouted, his eyes wide as he continued to shake him. Sanji answered by pointing to Zoro and explained, Sorry, Zoro and I did that. No, you did. Zoro disagreed darkly. Yuzop was slowly coming too and had to focus hard on Luffy. Luffy, you're here now. Yep, sure am, Luffy answered, sounding truly relieved that Yuzop wasn't dead. I'm here too. Hi there. Sanji greeted and Yuzop seemed to have instantly recovered as he stood up and began yelling. One of these days I'll kill you. Oh, you just made a full recovery, Sanji said, greatly impressed as he clapped him on the shoulder. Shut up. He yelled, knocking his hand away and looking ready to go into a shouting match before Zoro reminded them of something. Oh, and by the way, we kinda heard you were dead. Killed by Nami, he stated causally, as if they had been told that he went out to the store instead of getting killed. Yuzop blinked, as if remembering that as well. Stupid Johnny, Luffy growled. Getting up, he was sprouting nonsense that entire time. Well, Yuzop stated, his anger gone and looking thoughtful, in a way. It is the truth. Blinking in surprise they looked at him. But I'm alive. He went on frowning. Cause you see, she actually saved my life. They looked completely lost as he explained everything. The fishmen had captured him and were going to kill him. But he made things worse when he asked Nami for help, which made the fishmen suspicious of her. He then used a smoke star to try to escape but Nami intercepted him and announced that she would kill him herself. However, instead, she stabbed her own hand to make it look like she killed him before she kicked him into the ocean so that he could swim away. When they told him that Johnny said that he saw the whole thing, Yuzop supposed that Johnny must have been watching from a safe distance and was tricked like the fishmen. So that's it, Yuzop said, finishing up telling them. That's how Nami pretended to kill me and make sure I could escape from Arlong Park. He looked up at them and finished. Looks to me like she's got some sort of hidden motive for hanging out with a bunch of renegade fishmen. Fine, Zoro said, his arms still folded. What next? Are we gonna destroy Arlong Park? But Yuzop was waving his hands around in front of them, trying to get their attention before they did something they'd regret. Well, hang on just a second. He said loudly, don't you think we better find out what's going on with Nami first? Suddenly, another voice spoke up, it's no use either way. Looking up, the group saw a young woman was there with short, light purple hair and an even tan skin. Her right arm and chest were heavily tattooed very similar to Nami's, but she was giving them all a dark and stern look. 
No matter what you guys do, Arlong's rule won't come to an end, she informed them. Najiko, Yuzop exclaimed in surprise. Who's she? Luffy questioned him. Nami's big sister, Yuzop stated. Sanji was already smitten as he swooned. What? Nami's sister. No wonder she's so hot. What do you mean that it's no use? Zoro questioned her. Just trust me. Don't get yourselves involved here. Najiko said bluntly, and for those who haven't met her could tell that she was just as stubborn and strong-willed as her little sister. And leave poor Nami alone. I'll explain the situation. Situation, Sanji repeated in confusion. Yuzop was now giving her his complete attention. Do you mean that you can tell us why she joined up with Arlong's group? He asked. Yeah, Najiko admitted, folding her arms. And if that doesn't get you to leave, I don't know what will. I'll pass, Luffy said as he walked past Najiko and Yuzop called for him to wait. But Luffy barely paid attention I don't care about her past. Even as Sanji called out to know where he was going, he just kept going. For a walk, he answered coolly. A walk, Yuzop yelled after him. Do you mean you're not gonna listen to this? Nope, he answered back before leaving the area. The Chimera boy walked for a while until he ended up on the edge of the village. But suddenly he saw a group of marines closely following a man covered in scars and a spinning pinwheel on his hat. Luffy stopped walking and watched them walk past him. Luffy watched after them for a while when he said to himself, That pinwheel is so cool. Soon, Luffy was leaning his back up against a tree and staring up at the sky with a thoughtful expression. A pinwheel, huh, whispered Luffy's voice and brought them back to the matter at hand. When they looked, he blinked before he suddenly smiled to himself. I just thought of a new move. But all too soon there was a commotion not too far away and soon there was a gathering of people with the man called Genzo calling out for a doctor. Genzo, what is it? A man with a white coat and sunglasses yelled as he came running over and she stared at him as well. Najiko's been shot. Genzo explained as he and Nami gently lowered a body to the ground. When Genzo explained, the villagers were all horrified. The marines. The doctor repeated in disbelief. As Luffy spotted Nami and got up to head towards her. Her face was hidden by her hair and she was shaking hard with her teeth grounded together. As he got near, her sister's head was lying in her lap and she was holding her very gently. Najiko, the doctor asked as he checked her. I, I'm alright, Najiko whispered back through gritted teeth. Arlong has been working with those damn marines. Genzo told them all and the doctor looked up at him in outrage. He's been lying to Nami for the last eight years. He explained, he never intended to honor their agreement at all. That monster, a villager yelled out furiously. And soon there were shouts that were filled with anger and shock. Oh, no, a woman whispered, horrified at the thought, that means. That scoundrel, he lied to our Nami. Someone else shouted. But Nami just carefully moved Najiko's head from her lap as she got up, her fingers curling into tight fists. Nami, the doctor whispered as she stood there. Hey Nami, Luffy greeted happily, waving as he came up behind her. What's up? Need help with anything? Instead of answering she turned and glared at him so fiercely that the smile was wiped off his face. Her eyes weren't the cold ones she had seen before. They were full of rage that seemed to burn a hole in whatever she stared at. Why are you still here? She screamed at him as she grabbed him by the front of his shirt and pulled up to her face and continued to yell into his fearful face. Stay out of my business. Just get away from our island. Tears were beginning to burn and she then threw him down to the ground as she went running off before she lost all control. Buffy picked himself up from the ground and went towards a nearby tree and leaned up against it much like before. He was looking deeply annoyed as he muttered darkly, What's her problem? And here he sounded like a little boy would when faced with a girl on the playground who didn't want to play with him. Luffy continued to lean against the tree as the other three crewmates arrived together. All of them were close together so that they could see what was going on, but out of the way so that they couldn't be seen. Here, what looked like the entire village was out holding weapons, mostly things like clubs and homemade spears that were knives tied to staffs. There wasn't even a gun among them as they all gathered around, with Genzo cheering them on to take up arms. Eight long years ago, Genzo told the townspeople, we promised we wouldn't live our lives in vain. No matter the pain and humiliation we had to endure under Arlong, we swore we would fight the long fight so that Nami could meet their demands. But they lied, he shouted out, getting them all riled up. They never intended to keep their end of the deal. Instead they stole our only chance at freedom. So now, his eyes were bloodshot as he finally called out. We should make those filthy fishmen pay for the years they manipulated a kind young girl. Am I right? Yeah, let's do this. Someone yelled out. We've always been ready to fight those monsters. Someone else yelled. Time to show those lousy, stinking fishmen what we're made of. More shouts came and they were all ready to go. The four straw hats were all watching calmly. They looked like they wanted to join in, but something seemed to be holding them back. But what that was became clear when they heard someone shouting for them to stop. Looking up the road, they spotted Nami coming towards them with a big forced smile. But all present could tell she was fighting back tears as she came towards them. Calm down. It's not that much money. I can make it back in no time. I'll take care of it. Don't worry. 
It'll be easy this time, I'm used to it. I'll be fine, Nami said, still in that fake confident voice that fooled no one. Just relax, it'll be okay. Hey, it's nothing compared to back then. She came in front of them, come on everyone, I'm perfectly fine. The straw hats each felt as if their insides were shriveling up at how hard she was trying. It was clear that she was still in denial, just trying to stop the people she loved so much from getting themselves killed. But Genza wasn't fooled as he walked to her and embraced her tightly. She stood there frozen as tears fell from his eyes. You've done enough, he said softly but firmly. You have to know that there's no point now. You've struggled so hard, carrying our lives on your back this whole time. I can only imagine that joining them must have been more painful than getting stabbed in the heart. You fought very well. Genzo, Nami whispered in a broken voice as she also started to cry. Genzo pulled away, his hand firmly on her shoulder before he said, Set yourself free from this village. Nami looked horrified at those words and she cried out, unable to believe what he was saying. Genzo, Nami, do it. Najiko encouraged, now wearing a heavy bandage around her shoulder and arm. What? Najiko, Nami yelled as she looked around for some support, but it was clear from the rest of their faces that the entire town agreed. Najiko gave her a brave look. No fear in her face as she said, you're an exceptional young woman and you have a dream. Everyone, listen. Nami yelled desperately, still trying to stop them. I won't let you go. And to some surprise, she pulled out a knife and pointed it at them with shaking hands. Just stay right there. I'm not going to let anyone else get hurt by these monsters. Her eyes were pleading as she told them, you'll all die. We know that. Chenzo told her as he grabbed hold of the knife and gripped it so hard that he was starting to bleed. She looked startled at that as the doctor also spoke up in a grim way. Nami, it's no use, we've made up our minds. Still crying, she shook her head, not wanting to do it but Genzo wasn't taking no for an answer. Get out of the way. He finally yelled and she backed off, startled as he pulled out his sword and yelled to the people behind him, move out. We may not win, but we will give him hell. The doctor added, and without anyone showing any fear they charged off, past Nami, and heading towards Arlong Park. Nami just stood there, not moving as they ran past her before the knife fell from her limp hand and she fell to her knees. The young thief was shaking as she glared at the mark on her arm and dug her nails into it so hard that it looked like she might have ripped her own skin off. Tears fell as she stared at it and her eyes widened as she finally snapped. She hated that disgusting mark with so much loathing and detest and she couldn't stand to look at it anymore. And the tears of pure, uncovered feelings were smearing her face and falling fast as she grabbed the knife again into some of the straw hat's horror, she began to stab her arm. With each stab with the knife she screamed out the venomous name of the pirate who robbed her of her family and her dreams. The one who had given her so much hopelessness and hatred. She kept going and probably would have gone on until she either bled to death or simply severed her entire arm. But then it stopped. Luffy had come over and grabbed hold of Nami's wrist and stopped her from another stab. She didn't move for a second before she slowly turned to see who it was. Luffy's face was blank, his eyes hidden by the shadow of his hat, but also letting her know that he wasn't going to let her hurt herself like this anymore. Luffy, she whispered softly as her hand went limp a second time and she seemed to lose all strength as she let the blood-soaked knife fall onto the road. What do you want? Nami demanded in a choked-up voice. You don't know anything about this. You don't know what has been happening on this island for the past eight years. Nope, I don't, Luffy answered honestly. She was shaking as her hands gripped handfuls of dirt as she cried softly. This has nothing to do with you. She said louder, I told you to leave this place. Yep, you sure did, Luffy said, without any doubt. So leave, Nami yelled as she threw a handful of dirt behind her. And with every word she threw more dirt, now desperate to get him to leave. I told you to leave. Get out of here. Get out of here now. Go, go away. Go, go, go. But she finally ran out of steam and openly cried out sobbing and no longer trying to hold herself back as she let out all the feelings she kept inside for those eight miserable years. Luffy didn't react at all as he watched, just standing there as she finally said the words that he had been waiting to say. At the end of her rope, she whispered, Luffy. She looked back, tears in her eyes, dot 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 help me. She finally begged. For a moment, Luffy didn't do anything, but then he silently took off his straw hat and placed it on her head, and for a moment the tears stopped flowing as he turned and walked a few steps away. Of course, he answered, that's what friends do. He suddenly stopped and took a deep breath before he screamed out at the top of his lungs. He's gonna pee 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 a a a why 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 why. His words echoed around them and they could all feel the determination in that tone. He was going to clobber our lungs even if it killed him. Luffy, Nami said, her hand to her face as the tears continued to fall again. Only this time they were tears of happiness when she noticed the other three waiting for orders, all of them ready to fight. Let's go, Luffy ordered. They all looked up. Right, they said, and they left Nami there, not speaking a word to what they were going to do, but she didn't need it as she sobbed openly. Her hand still on the straw hat. The four were all side by side as they walked along, no one speaking a word as they marched along the road. 
They were ready to fight for each other merely for the sake of defending a single friend as they got nearer to the gate. Thankfully, the villagers hadn't even made it past that point. Johnny and Yasaku were there, both looking severely beat up. When they neared the villagers, Luffy told them all to step aside, and they parted almost at once without a word. Zoro smirked wider as they walked past them all, as they stared in disbelief. It was worth it just to see the looks on their faces. Johnny and Yasaku moved aside respectfully as they got to the door. Take them out big bros. Yasaku cheered on. Show them no mercy. Johnny added, holding up a fist and grinning. Luffy didn't even smile, as he cracked his knuckles and held up his own fist. Oh, don't worry. I intend to. Before they knew it. He pulled his fist back and punched the door enough times to make it seem as if a bomb went off as the front gate was smashed apart and exploded. Through the rubble, they could see fishmen of all shapes and types staring at them. And there, sitting in a lawn chair, was Arlong. Arlong was large and muscular. He was a light blue saw shark fishman and his nose proved that for its saw-like shape. His black hair sprouted from the back of his neck and reached down past his shoulders but they could also make out a shark's fin on his back and the gills on both the sides of his neck sporting the tattoo of the sun pirates on the left side of his chest, and the identical mark that he had given Nami was on his arm. His eyes were wide in shock as he looked at him. What the, now, which one of you is Arlong? Luffy asked threateningly, holding up his fist and glaring at each one of them, daring them to speak. The fishmen all glared at him, all of them outraged that they had come here on their turf. Once the shock was over, Arlong leaned back in the chair, not believing that he was worth the trouble. Arlong, he repeated darkly, well, that just so happens that I'm Arlong. Luffy walked to them, his head held up high and without a fear in the world as he marched in. However Arlong seemed to be different from the other fishmen. He was calm and relaxed, but there was something dangerous in him that seemed to earn the respect of the rest of the crew. Not sure why he thought he deserved it. Good, Luffy said as he gave him an empty look, I'm Luffy. Luffy, Arlong repeated, obviously not recognizing the name, and clearly wondering just what he was doing here. What are you supposed to be? A pirate, Luffy answered bluntly. Hold it right there, one of the fishmen said as he and another attempted to cut Luffy off. Where do you think you're going? You want to talk to the boss? The other asked, well, you gotta talk to us first. Get it? They smirked evilly as they put their hands on his shoulders, but Luffy banged their heads together and knocked them out as he told them to all move it. The other fishmen looked startled at that as he walked right up to Arlong. So what does a pirate want with me? Arlong asked causally, though there was a hint of irritation in his tone. Luffy stopped in front of Arlong. He glared at him for just a moment longer before he seized his wrist and threw it back. And by the time he swung it back, he sucker punched Arlong so hard that he was launched from his chair and hit the ground, rolling over several times before was smashed through the wall. As Arlong pushed himself from the rubble, everyone was staring, slack jaw, at Luffy. Who the heck are you? Arlong demanded furiously. Luffy's face was filled with nothing but fury. His face making look like some kind of monster as steam actually came out of his nose. That's for making our navigator cry. He yelled at him. Sanji came running up behind Luffy. After this declaration of war, the fishmen started to attack Luffy, but the cook easily took them all out with a few kicks. Back off. You're out of your league. Sanji yelled, kicking their asses and walked on to stand next to Luffy so that he could scold him for going in by himself, which Luffy responded not to worry about him, and that he could take care of these guys on his own. You fool, Sanji said in annoyance. I never said anything about being worried. I just don't want you hogging all the actions. Oh, Luffy said in understanding. Well, Yuzap said nervously. Also coming up, I just want to let you guys know that I don't mind it if you hog it all. Zoro came up and rolled his eyes. I see that you're raring to go, as usual. As soon as he saw him, an octopus fishman named Hatchai cried out in anger that Zoro tricked him before. But soon Hatchai screamed in fear when he saw that Yuzap was alive and a ray fishman, who was named Kirubai snarled that Nami was a traitor. Arlong began to laugh and sent waves of cold down the villagers' spines. A pirate, of course, Arlong said, highly amused. This is all starting to make sense now. You've been after Nami this whole time. He burst out laughing again. Louder than ever, the girl is mine and I'm not giving her up. Hatchai also laughed as he walked up confidently. A bunch of idiots like you aren't worth Arlong's time. He declared, we know how to deal with you. And he blew through his long mouth like a trumpet. Suddenly, the giant sea cow appeared from the waves, still sporting a giant, swollen lump on its head. Hatchai then greeted him as Momo. It leaned forward to see what he wanted, but it stopped dead as soon as it saw Luffy and Sanji there. Oh, look who's back, Luffy said, folding his arms. Seems he's a friend of the fishmen. Sanji nodded in agreement. Momo was now crying as he saw them and mooing softly to himself. Momo turned and was about to leave, still crying as Hatchai yelled after him to come back. But the sea cow didn't stop until Arlong told it to. Just a few words from him had apparently scared him enough to want to attack. Too bad for him that Luffy was ready for it. 
Luffy stuck his legs firmly into the ground and transformed his arms until they resembled the tentacles of an octopus. He then used them to grab Momu's horns, showing off his powers. As everyone else freaked out, Zoro yelled at Sanji and Yuzop to get back as Luffy yelled out, Time for something new. And with his great strength, he was actually able to pick up Momu and was spinning him around, just like a giant pinwheel. Everything in their path, Fishman and the building behind them was either being taken out or destroyed. By the time that he was finished, there was only Arlong, Hatchai, and two other fishmen who were left standing while the front of Arlong Park was smashed to pieces. But Luffy focused only on Momu. In the end he was finally able to throw the sea cow as far away as he could from them while the rest of Arlong's crew lay out cold all around them. Everyone was staring at him in shock. Once he caught his breath and transformed his arms back to normal, Luffy was yelling out, All right that's it Arlong, I'm done playing games with you, I didn't come here to beat down all your cronies. I came here to teach you a lesson. He pointed at him in a challenging way and yelled, so step up. They looked to Arlong. Though he was still smiling, his eyes were now angry. Oh, I will, don't worry. Actually I was just thinking about how painfully I'll end your life. He said this in what sounded like a purr. But they weren't sure Luffy heard this as the other three straw hats gathered around him and told him off for that stunt. That was the worst plan ever. Sanji yelled, kicking his head. Yeah, were you trying to kill all of us too? Yuzop yelled in his ear. The citizens behind them however were amazed and were cheering them on. They even heard the doctor scream out, I just can't believe there's a human who can throw that giant monster. What are you doing? Yuzop screamed with bloodshot eyes as Luffy was now trying to get his feet out of the ground. Are you ruining something else? Luffy just looked down at his feet in polite confusion. How dare you hurt our brothers? Hatch I demanded, waving his six arms around crazily. Very well, Kirubai added, it seems like we must join in on this fight. Now you'll get an education on the inferiority of your species. Chu, the remaining fisherman with the long lips, who was named Chu, spoke up. Oh, really? Zoro smirked, I'd like to see that. Arlong chuckled to himself as Kirubai and Chu both declared that they'd take them out for him. Please let us kill these weaklings. Hatch I yelled. All right, Arlong answered agreeably. They're all yours. Sanji and Zoro were both looking confident. However, Luffy was looking to the others and said a little nervously, Ah, guys, there's something I should tell you. But just as Sanji mentioned the best way to cook octopus, Hatchai attacked them with an ink jet, squirting black ink at them. Though the other three were able to dodge it, Luffy stayed behind and was quickly doused with ink from head to toe. Because of that, he was now blinded. And Zoro was yelling at him to why he didn't dodge it. Hatchai then picked up a large chunk of the building that Luffy had destroyed when he threw around Momu, and turned back to Luffy, his attention all too clear. Yuzop was screaming for him to run, but then came the sad truth. Luffy couldn't run, his feet were stuck but you're the one who stuck them into the ground in the first place. Yuzop yelled. Zoro smacked himself in the face frustrated, thankfully. When Hatchai threw the broken stone on top of him, Sanji stepped in and destroyed it with a single kick. You're such a pain. He hissed in annoyance as Luffy cheered him on. But then he smirked again as he confessed. Looks like I picked one hell of an idiot to be my captain. We all did, Zoro added in light amusement. Sanji added. Though in truth, our idiot captain is far better than a gang who prey on a lady. A lady huh? Kirubai asked skeptically, huh? You rush into certain death for one lousy girl. I think that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Sanji glared at him. Lousy girl, he repeated, and they could hear the anger in his voice. If you insult Nami one more time, I can promise you'll go from fishman to fish sticks. He took out his cigarette and said threateningly, got that. Kirubai didn't look concerned nor the least bit impressed. Your skills are quite exceptional, he admitted after a minute, for a human. But I must admit chivalry from a pirate seems just a little fake. Sanji sneered back at him as he admitted smugly. I'm dead good at what I do, he said as he put the cigarette back into his mouth. And I guarantee that there's nothing fake about my desire to help a beautiful lady in need. Sanji and Kirubai faced off as Yuzop tried to pull Luffy's feet out. As the monkey brain captain started picking his nose. Hatchai picked up more stone and was determined to go after him. But Zoro was one step ahead of him. He pointed his sword threateningly at him, taunting Hatchai to come after him instead. It worked. Furious Hatchai yelled out, You're Zoro. I forgot. He threw his stone at him which Zoro dodged easily as he finished yelling, You can't get away tricking me. That stuff's old news octopus man, Zoro said. Holding up the white blade, I personally don't care what reasons you have for wanting to kill me, the situation has changed. You see, the tables have turned. Holding his blade and carefully unsheathing it so that no one could miss the gleaming blade, you're not the hunters anymore, understand? Now it's you fish freaks who are being hunted. L-U-F-F-Y. Yuzop screamed out at his moron of a captain as he just realized something. Use your powers to transform your legs. That way they'll become unstuck, he explained. Luffy bopped his fist into the palm of his other hand and you could literally see the light bulb go off over his head. 
With a minute of concentration, Luffy's legs seemed to increase in mass and become grayish like that of an elephant or a rhino's and the resulting pressure cracked the pavement around his legs, allowing him to easily pull his now human legs out. Yuzop cheered but then noticed the last fishman, Chu, who had killing Yuzop in his sights. However, Yuzop went running off past all the citizens so that Chu was distracted for a moment. Once Chu realized that they were all there, he was planning on killing them all as well, but Yuzop sent an exploding star at him from a safe distance away. Did you think that it would be easy? Yuzop challenged him. You're dealing with me now. Enough. Chu yelled, losing his cool completely, and went charging after him. I'm going to get rid of you right now. As they watched them go running off Genzo was asking who he was. Brave one minute and cowardly the next. The doctor said confused. He's a baffling man. Arlong finally got up from where he sat and walked towards them. You morons are a pathetic sight to behold. He growled. Now sounding ticked off. I'm sick of watching this so get out of my way. But sir, Kirubai said quickly. There's no need for you to go on a rampage, think of Arlong Park. Don't worry, Arlong said, I know. I'll make sure this will be over quick. Luffy charged at the approaching fishman and his arms became scaled as he balled his hand into a fist. Going for a clothesline, Luffy cried out, Lizard Lariat. However, Arlong simply opened his mouth wide and bit into Luffy's arm, causing him to cry out in pain. Fortunately for Luffy, the hard scales on his arm prevented a majority of the damage. The worst of it was a few small lines of blood under some broken scales. Growling like an animal, Luffy used his other arm to punch the evil pirate across the face. Arlong cried out as the rough scales grazed his face, but like with Luffy his rough skin prevented a majority of the damage. You stupid human. Arlong raged as he grabbed Luffy by the head with both hands and prepared to slam his face with a rising knee. Thinking fast, a hard shell started to coat the Chimera pirate's forehead, blocking the blow. Phew, I'm glad Hercules beetles have such hard heads. Luffy sighed in relief, confident that blow would have definitely hurt. His relief didn't last long, however, as he gave a yelp when Arlong tried to spear him with his saw-like nose. Gritting his teeth, Luffy shouted out, let's see how you like it, as his nose suddenly gained the long horn of a rhino. Rhino rapier. He cried as he used the horn to stab Arlong right in the shoulder. The shark gave a cry of pain before he gritted his sharp teeth and pulled Luffy out of his shoulder. Curse you, let's see how well you can fly. Arlong screamed in rage, grabbing Luffy by the head. Arlong got into a pitcher's stance and threw the animal man with all his monstrous strength. Luffy cried out as he was flung far into the air. He sailed out of Arlong Park and was far out over the open water before he was able to slow down enough to transform into a seahawk and started to fly back towards the island. Unfortunately, due to how far he was flung and his own bad sense of direction, it still took Luffy a good 15 minutes before the park was back in his sights. When he flew to where he started off at, a bad sight greeted him. It was a mess. The whole battlefield was mostly destroyed, and Arlong was on his feet, holding a wounded Zoro by the throat. Suddenly something was sent flying high in the sky, and Luffy's voice was screaming out, I quote him back. Luffy saved Zoro by switching places with him and actually throwing him off into the distance. Luffy, he was now launching several attacks against Arlong. They seemed to be inefficient against him, though Luffy claimed it was just warm up. Arlong pulling himself from the side of the building that Luffy knocked him through. What a bunch of fools, he hissed menacingly. You think you can actually beat me? You were better off flying over the ocean. No, I don't think so, Luffy answered back, still stretching out. I like it down here. Yep. Arlong glared up at him before he snarled. Do you not understand my anger? He then got up on his feet. I saw my brothers crushed like worms. You'll realize soon enough. You should have quit fighting long ago. Luffy, Yuzop cried from a hole in the wall and they were surprised to see him there with blood dripping down from his face. I got your back pal. If he loses, Sanji's voice set out and they looked up to see him soaking wet and leaning up against the wall with Genzo and Najiko. He was trying to light a wet match before he just gave up. Then we'll all. He flicked the match away, die. Yeah, Genzo agreed softly as they watched the match go flying off, almost as if in slow motion, we will. If that happens, Najiko also added softly, it's the end of the East Blue too. After a few minutes of silence, Arlong finally spoke. Do you know what the biggest difference between you and me is? He asked conceitedly. The nose, guessed Luffy, and as a joke he turned his into that of a saw sharks. The jaw, Luffy then suggested, baring his now sharp teeth before then held up his hand, webbing, as webbing grew between them. Arlong's eyes turned white in rage. Species, he screamed and he lunged forward to try and bite him, but Luffy easily dodged it. Again and again Arlong tried to bite, like a wild animal, but Luffy moved back. They went at it until Arlong had finally grabbed hold of his head and slammed him against a pillar. He would have bitten him here. But Luffy shrunk into a mouse that got out of the way so that Arlong bit the pillar and shattered it into pieces. Luffy snuck away from the collapsing building. Arlong turned back to sneer at him as if he just proved a valid point. You see, he asked him mockingly. 
This is the inherent power of fishmen. While you may be able to look like a fishman, you are but a pale imitation. I feel sorry for you humans for having been created with such limited powers. He slowly walked towards him still taunting him the whole time. We've been on a different level since the beginning of time. You are inferior. It only makes sense for you to bow before us. He stopped and stood before him as he proclaimed, You're so weak. Your presence on this planet is deplorable. Don't you think your time has come to an end? Arlong demanded again. He chuckled, as if he told a funny joke. I'll show you. Show you the real difference between you and I. Luffy just smiled as he turned back to human. Sure, he told him pleasantly, go ahead. There's no way I'm losing to a big fish, because I'm gonna be king of the pirates. Arlong picked up a piece of the stone pillar and tossed it up and down like a ball in his hands. King of the pirates, don't be foolish. A puny human like you couldn't possibly conquer the Grand Line. You can't even crush a pillar with your jaws. And like that he crushed the rock with little effort. Yeah, so what? Demanded Luffy. He then went and broke through the stone with his fist. Stop your bragging. You aren't that awesome. Besides, smashing stone with your teeth's not that smart, Luffy added, holding up a fist. That's right. You're the best big bro. Tell him like it is. Yasaku cheered on in the back. Yeah, yelled Johnny, also agreeing. What idiot bites a rock anyway? Vane stood out on Arlong's neck. Fools. He yelled out furiously, knowing that he was being mocked. That's not the point. Every member of the human race is ignorant and weak. Arlong pointed at Luffy and demanded, What good are you if you can't even pull yourself out of the water? He then flew at him for another bite as Luffy dodged it and was able to grab hold of a couple swords that lay discarded. As a matter of fact, Luffy said pulling the swords back and then getting right into Arlong's face, I'm worthless without my friends to help me out. Luffy chuckled as he held out the swords and took everyone by surprise, thinking that he knew how to use them as he swung and attacked. But he wasn't really using them, just swinging them around much like how Zoro did when completely losing it against Mihawk. Arlong effortlessly broke the swords, but it turns out that it was a ruse. With Arlong overconfident over destroying the swords, Luffy delivered a powerful blow shattering his teeth. Luffy stood up and thought it all over for a moment. You're right, I don't know how to use a sword you bastard. He yelled after the brief pause. I'm a terrible sailor, I definitely can't cook, and I can't even lie. Without my friends to help me I would have been dead a long time ago. Arlong chuckled from where he laid his hand over the place where Luffy struck. So you fully admit how pathetic you are. You may be a fool, he said as he sat up, but you're certainly honest. How much your crew feel, tolerating this idiocy day in and day out. I bet they're sick of it, but that makes me wonder why they tried so desperately to save their half-wit leader. Arlong finished. Luffy glared at him as Arlong held his hand to his mouth still to his broken teeth. Someone like you doesn't deserve a ship or a crew. What good is a helpless whelp of a captain to them? Arlong finished, what can you possibly do? I can clobber you, Luffy responded confidently. Yuzop and the rest of villagers cheered him on as Nami smiled. Even Sanji said irritably, well get to it you numbskull. Cheer all you want, but it won't change a thing. Arlong shouted out, and within seconds he regrew his teeth. Luffy gasped out, he's got new teeth, he said in shock. I'm a shark, Arlong reminded him, new teeth will grow one after the other, and with each set, I will grow stronger and stronger. Within seconds, his teeth had regrown and, using this, he pulled his teeth out to create handheld castanet weapons for each hand. And when he attacked, they thought the worse for a minute as he laughed hysterically at each attack, one after another. However, it took him some time for him to realize that Luffy used one of his crew as a human shield the whole time. Enraged, Arlong hollered at such a dirty tactic and screamed about how he dared to use his own crewmate as a shield. What are you talking about? Luffy asked, as if he was being scolded by his parents for something that someone else did. You're the one who attacked me don't you remember? Don't move a muscle, Arlong warned, clinking the teeth together, animal boy. Luffy thought it over before he said, say, now that's an idea. Again Luffy was forced to dodge it before he was able to get in another kick. When he came back up though, his body was much bulkier as his skin took on a bluish sheen complete with gills, web digits, and a small dorsal fin. Luffy grinned, showing rows of razor teeth similar to Arlong's. Let's see who's got the bigger bite. The shark boy declared as he rushed at the enemy fishman. The two got into a grappling contest for a few minutes before Luffy saw his opening. Rearing his head back, the shark-like man was able to sink his teeth into Arlong's side, causing him to yell in pain. Snarling like a mad dog, Arlong was able to get Luffy's arm inside his mouth. Big bro's gonna get his arm bitten off. Yosaku screamed and Nami looked horrified. But to everyone's surprise, Luffy reached up and grabbed Arlong's hair. In the end, he was able to pull him down so that he could slam his foot into his head to get him to let go. They both fell to the ground exhausted, lying on their backs, both now injured. Arlong had gotten up, and quick as a flash, he jumped for the sea. Luffy also got up as he shrank back down to normal and pulled the teeth out of his side. He was already looking around just as a dark fin appeared above the water. 
Nami was screaming for him to look at the water. Wow, a shark, he said eagerly and the straw hat sighed. Really, he hadn't noticed who it was. Yuzap almost fell over and yelled, No, that's A-R-L-O-N-G. The fin suddenly disappeared and they were waiting for him to come out almost anxiously. Luffy got ready to dive in after him. When suddenly Arlong launched himself like a torpedo, his attack shark darts increasing speed was able to break through all solid objects. Luffy was sent flying and crashed painfully on the ground as Arlong went smashing through an upper floor of the building. Through the hole in the building, he stood there, still cocky. Wow, I'm impressed you could dodge that. Arlong proclaimed as Luffy looked up. Good job. But the longer you evade death, the more painful it will be. The fishman dashed down with another attack and landed like an arrow with his nose embedded in the concrete, posed there perfectly on his nose. Thankfully Luffy had been able to dodge it in time and Arlong's nose eventually broke through the solid stone, pulling out to face Luffy. He went flying towards him again. Luffy had no time to transform into one of his quicker or sturdier forms. He narrowly missed a death shot, but there was still blood splatter. After a third failed attack, though Luffy was sent flying, Arlong dove back into the sea again. The others were all screaming for him to hide before Arlong came back out as Luffy regained his footing. But he was shaking in anger as he declared that he wasn't going to hide this time. Stop being so stupid, Sanji yelled at him angrily. Go run for cover before you become a target. No way, Luffy yelled back stubbornly. I'm not running anywhere. I'm gonna catch him and break his nose. He turned to the water and yelled, Come on, you shark. Didn't you hear from us to go somewhere and hide? Yuzop yelled at him furiously. You barely escaped his last attacks. One direct hit will kill you. Luffy, listen to us. Go and hide. Ignoring him, Luffy dived into the water, much to the shock and horror of the spectators. The water was still for a moment before waves started to pick up, as if something was thrashing under the surface. Bubbles came to the surface and before anyone could blink. Arlong was shooting out of the water once more like a rocket. However, he wasn't alone this time. A black dolphin, one with a curious scar under the one eye, was quickly darting after the fleeing fishman. The dolphin was suddenly right on top of Arlong and it cried out in Luffy's voice, Dolphin Slam. With a mighty swing of his tail, Luffy was able to send Arlong flying right into the side of the main building. The wall easily shattered on impact as Luffy, now fully human, landed gracefully on the shore. Here, it was the last straw. Arlong snapped, and his eyes changed to a wild, insane look. That's similar to a monster. Oh no, Sanji stated uneasily. It's the same expression that a sea king makes just before they snap. He must have snapped with Luffy's last attack. I guess he finally went over the edge, Zoro said as the red veins were standing out in those cold eyes, his head swirling around wildly, trying to find him. His eyes, Nami whispered, her hands to her face, I've never seen them like that. You wretched human, screamed Arlong as he grabbed hold of Luffy by the head and swung him around like a lasso before slamming him into the building. Luffy was sitting up. Whoa, that was crazy, he said to himself, it didn't really hurt but I can tell he's really like... Matter, Arlong jumped towards him and then punched through the wall when Luffy hopped on cricket legs to safety. But judging how indifferent he was to this, they couldn't help but wonder if this was what Arlong had planned from the start. Now the fishman fumbled his hand around for a moment inside. He knew the building well enough to know exactly what he was reaching for. And when he pulled his hand out, they saw just what it was that they stared at it. It was a giant black pole with six saw-toothed patterned black blades, resembling a shark's saw-like teeth with a katana handle. The saw blade, Nami screamed. That thing's gigantic. Johnny screamed as Yasaku screamed in terror. With a battle cry, Arlong was now determined to end it as he jumped to the first roof with Luffy having to jump higher and higher to avoid it all. Up and up they climbed, with Arlong destroyed everything in his way. On the top floor Luffy had finally ran out of room, but then noticed the window next to him and went diving towards it, smashing through the window. Luffy came crashing through the window with Arlong screaming up that he no longer has a place to run. They were in a room that was filled with maps. Thousands of them were scattered everywhere in stacks, some of them still hanging from the ceiling as they were left to dry while there were shelves full of books and tools. Luffy was up and was now trying to catch his breath. That was a little too close. He gasped. Arlong came walking through, stepping on the shards of the broken window and glared at Luffy, the saw-like blade still in his hand. There's nowhere else to run, Arlong said in a low voice. You and me, here, the highest level of Arlong Park. He grinned evilly and they knew that he was planning something terrible. At last, the time of your death has come. But Luffy was looking around at this place. What is this room? Lots of paper. This isn't just any room. Arlong explained. This is the room where I had Nami draw all of her sea charts for me. This is Nami's room. Luffy questioned now looking around with a more focused look. These sea charts are all that she's worked on for eight years. Arlong paused for a moment as he looked almost fondly at the maps. Just look around you. These maps are more valuable than any amount of treasure. You see, to us fishermen, collecting data about the ocean is a simple affair. 
but assembling that information into a usable chart is a difficult task. That's why we needed a navigator. In fact that's the sole reason why I'm so keen on keeping that woman in my possession. She's absolutely brilliant. The accuracy of her charts is beyond comparison. Luffy continued to blankly look around at everything. But Arlong didn't seem to be expecting an answer. She's too good for human trash like you. He went on. Her talents should be used solely to build up the mighty Arlong Empire. Arlong pointed the weapon at him, still grinning. Now listen. Nami belongs to me. Is that so? Luffy's voice suddenly said. And you're interfering in our business. Arlong said smugly, you human scum. Luffy narrowed his eyes dangerously as the shark saw was now being pointed at his head. He then sneered as he said slowly and carefully so that he couldn't hope to miss his words. She's not your friend. Luffy sat there for a moment without saying anything. But then, I don't care, he answered, still staring defiantly at him. I don't care what you say, he said firmly as Arlong looked annoyed that he wasn't agreeing with him, but with his eyes not showing any signs of fear. Luffy declared loudly, because Nami is our navigator. 1. Hirubai had dragged Sanji underwater in hopes of getting an advantage but the fight ended up like in canon. 2. I would imagine for a proud fishman like Arlong, having someone like Luffy being able to mimic a fishman's appearance is a grave insult. However, he isn't as surprised by Luffy's powers as the previous villains have been, because he had seen similar things on the Grand Line. The same could be said for Buggy, but he's a cowardly idiot so it's no wonder he was caught off guard, because Nami is our navigator, proclaimed Luffy so loudly that his voice echoed through the room. Really? Arlong asked mockingly. You want her to navigate your pathetic little ship for you? Huh? I guess you truly have no idea what a monumental waste of talent that would be. He gestured around to the maps in the room. Look, there is no one else on the face of the planet who can draw sea charts with such accuracy and efficacy. That young lady has a gift. Luffy kept looking around as his eyes went to the desk. A small pen fell and clattered on the floor. Luffy stretched his hand over to grab it and stare at it himself. And there isn't really anything as ultimately regrettable as wasting natural talent. Staying here and drawing up charts for me is her only chance of living up to her full potential, Arlong declared, not noticing Luffy was no longer paying attention to him. But when Luffy next spoke, he said in a quiet, but dark voice, this pen is stained with blood. Arlong, ignorant of the chimera boy in front of him was continuing to boast. In order for me to obtain world supremacy her sea charts are absolutely vital. He took his shark saw and held it to Luffy's neck so that his neck was between two of the blades. She will continue drawing her sea charts for my own ambitions. And once her charts give me full knowledge of all the world's oceans, we fishmen will be totally invincible. And the world shall kneel before us. Luffy still just sat there, holding the pen before he finally sighed. The first step is, this island, then we'll move on to the whole East Blue. Arlong continued to rant. You can never use her like me. She would be wasted on you. Luffy, who had just put the pen carefully on the floor in front of him, almost reverently. Those words had struck a nerve and you could sense that there was something in him that was now filled with a great anger. It could even be felt in the air as Luffy very gently took hold of one of the blades on Arlong's shark saw. His head was down and his eyes were shadowed. Arlong kept smiling until it was wiped off his face. His arm was shaking slightly and he seemed to be completely confused to what was happening. Luffy's fingers tightened on the blade. He could see that he was shaking too, but from anger not fear. Then, all of a sudden, Luffy broke the blade as easily as if it was made of glass. No, Arlong exclaimed in shock, so that he was left holding a blade with only two of the six blades left. Luffy's expression was terrifying and the fishman felt his own spirit freeze at the look. There was no trace of his usual happy-go-lucky attitude, not even the blank or usual angry look that he got when he was faced with an opponent. There was cold fury in on his face, a sense of a hidden power radiated from inside him as if there was a wildfire burning inside him. Use her. Luffy repeated in a voice that was filled with as much rage as his face. You jerk. What the hell do you take her for? Arlong just laughed as he said, she is an inferior creature, but she has risen far above her peers. If all other humans are sewer rats, then she's a feisty little kitten. After all, she is adorable. She has her place and it's here beside me. Can't you understand that? I can give her everything she needs. Arlong finished with a wide grin on his face. And all she has to do is continue to draw those marvelous charts for me. Arlong went on. But what he said next raged Luffy to the core. So, Nami will forever be my tool. No, she'll be my friend. He laughed again. Finally, Luffy had gotten back to his feet, but instead of attacking Arlong he kicked the desk right through the wall. Arlong stopped laughing and his grin was wiped off as if Luffy had kicked him. He blinked before he stared at the giant hole where they could see the desk hover in the air for a moment before it fell. Before he could register what happened, Luffy had kicked a bookshelf and one of the stacks of maps out as well. What do you think you're doing? Arlong screamed but Luffy completely ignored him as if he couldn't hear him as he continued his destruction of the room, making sure to take out as much as he could with every kick so that the sky was filled with paper. Stop it now. 
Arlong screamed as he then waved what was left of his weapon at him. But Luffy easily dodged it so that Arlong ended up destroying an enormous stack of maps and he screamed, horrified at what he had done. The charts. Once he landed, Luffy then kicked another stack out. My charts. Arlong continued to yell as he watched all his plans and ambitions being destroyed before his eyes. His anger now growing out of his control. He finally pinned Luffy against a wall and held him there with his hand at his throat. Curse you. Arlong yelled. That's eight years of work. Eight years of planning and ambition. Luffy turned his arm into a long mantis-like scythe and used the extended blade to take out more of the room and they could hear the books and papers smashing to the ground or splashing in the water below them. Enraged, Arlong snapped even further as he bit down on Luffy's neck. Now you've gone too far. Arlong yelled as blood sprayed everywhere. Luffy was growling with pain, but he didn't back down as he changed his arms into that of a monkey so that he could use the extended reach to grab Arlong by his nose behind his head and started to pull on it. You keep jabbering on about how much better fishmen are. He said loudly, stuttering a little from pain, and how much you need those sea charts. I don't understand anything about that stuff. His monkle-like hands started to bleed as he cut them on the sharp nose. But I finally figured out how to save her. With one huge heave, Luffy snapped Arlong's nose like a twig, causing the fishman to scream in pain and as he opened his mouth to yell, he pulled his teeth out of Luffy's neck. Luffy was still on his feet, his eyes wide, looking worse than ever before. This room isn't anything but her jail cell. He declared with a hiss, there's only one way for Nami to escape, I gotta tear this place apart. Arlong glared up at him, looking ridiculous with his bent nose as Luffy suddenly grew larger and larger while his nose lengthened and he grew tusks, becoming a human-elephant hybrid. With a mighty leap, the Chimera captain was able to jump to the point where he broke through the roof and hovered for a few seconds before he started to descend. Elephant, he began but Arlong wasn't beaten yet. You fool, Arlong yelled and was getting up. Arlong Park cannot be brought down by some inferior human. Arlong continued as grabbed hold of his nose and straightened it with a sickening cracking sound, especially not by some animal freak like you. Shark tooth. Drill. Arlong screamed out before he jumped and began to spin like a propeller, or even a drill, towards Luffy's falling form, his teeth bared. Luffy's eyes widened in terror, but he managed to finish the attack as he landed on the tower. Cannonball. Arlong's teeth sank deeply into his side just as Luffy's heavy body came down and slammed his face to the floor. For a moment, they were there, frozen as they stared at what happened. It was almost as if time had stopped here, but then the floor began to break apart. With Luffy's trumpet-like scream echoed as the force of the attack was so great that Arlong started to cough up blood just before Luffy's body slammed him down floor after floor of Arlong Park and hit the ground with an almighty boom. As Luffy stood from where he landed the rest of the building was starting to collapse. The walls crumbled and the roof was falling in. Luffy just didn't seem to get to the hole he made in the wall in time. The ceiling gave way and the floor broke apart as he fell through it. The noise was so loud, but then everything went dark around him as the night sky came back. But suddenly the top of the rubble was moved and Luffy burst through so that he was standing on top of the remains. He slowly shrank down back to his human form, showing that his thicker hide prevented a majority of the damage along with his natural resistance. No one spoke as they all stared at him, though he didn't say a word. Their eyes were all drawn to him as if he had shouted. Luffy then took a deep breath and yelled out, N-A-M-I. He finished screaming out, N-A-M-I you'll always be my friend. It slowly dawned on all the crowd what just happened as they were all screaming in joy, all of them cheering and crying as well. Finally, their nightmare was over, and the cry that echoed through the village was Nami's happy tears while Johnny and Yosaku screamed out, Big Bro won. Later, back in Kakoyashi village, after a small altercation with a group of marines, an enormous party going on. The villagers were all dancing and feasting, music and laughter was in the air, and every single person here was smiling. You moron. The doctor snapped as Zoro was gritting his teeth and moving painfully around on the bed as Johnny and Yasaku slept in the background. Well, almost everyone was smiling. The doctor continued, did you think this would heal on its own? Seriously, pirates are supposed to be smarter than this. Zoro tried to defend himself but the doctor shoved his hand in Zoro's face to keep him still as he continued stitching. Don't you have a doctor for this? Just then a familiar face appeared in the window above Zoro's head, with a leg of meat in his hand, and he repeated, Doctor. Never thought of that. Good idea. Luffy, Zoro said in surprise. But we need to get a musician first right? Luffy asked, as if making sure that he got it. Why's that? Zoro asked him. Cause pirates really like to sing, he said as if it was obvious. Zoro actually laughed at that and sounded sarcastic as he said. That's true, but why is that first? Luffy didn't answer, but he grinned at him before he looked up to the doctor and asked where Nami was, claiming that she wasn't in the village. Well then, the doctor said, looking away as he thought it all over, if she's not in the village, there's only one place she'd go. Later still, it was still a dark night around and the only thing that had changed was that Genzo was in the more quiet location. 
He was on a cliff that overlooked the ocean. A bright moon was reflected in the sparkling sea below them, and there was a very simple grave raised there with a wooden cross. Genzo had poured an entire bottle of sake over it, as if the one who was buried there could enjoy it as well. It was very peaceful for a few quiet moments, but that soon ended when someone yelled out, Where's the food? Genzo had jumped and spun around to see who it was. Luffy was barely aware that he wasn't alone as he looked for food. Oh, no food out here, he said to himself, sounding disappointed before he turned around and muttered something about leaving. Wait, boy, Genzo suddenly shouted, stopping Luffy so that he would look back and they looked over at him. Huh, a grave? Luffy asked before he asked tactlessly, did somebody die? Genzo turned back to look at the wooden cross and admitted to Luffy that someone did die a long time ago. Oh, I'm sorry, Luffy said, bowing his head, though it probably would have been easier to take him seriously if he took the food out of his mouth first. I give you to my conveniences. Luffy realized that he said it wrong and tried again. Wait, my sincere compliments. No my deepest. He said several times before Genzo corrected him. My deepest condolences, he said. Yeah, thanks, Luffy said. Listen boy, Genzo said, still not looking away but his voice was very serious. I know Nami is going away with you. She has her mind set on becoming a pirate in that. Dangerous business. And I'm fine with that. It can't be helped. But if any of you do anything to hurt her. I will kill you, Genzo said, his voice deadly serious. We're not gonna hurt her, Luffy said to him firmly. But Genzo spun around and yelled out at the top of his lungs, You sure? Luffy looked startled at that before he nodded, I'm sure. Genzo moved his cap back down so that he couldn't see his eyes. But a satisfied smile was tugging at the scarred man's lips, as if he just had a hard question answered for him. Day of Departure The four straw hats were already on the deck of the Going Merry as they began piling on crates and boxes of food and supplies. It looked like the whole island had come to say goodbye. Suddenly, Sanji had run to the side of the ship. There she is. He screamed out, barely able to contain himself. Looking up, they saw Nami standing far along the road and everyone was looking directly at her. Her eyes were hidden by bangs before she screamed out, set the sails. And suddenly she started sprinting towards them as if she was being chased by something. I don't get it, Yuzop said, watching her sprint towards them, why is she running? She said set sail, Luffy reminded him and he jumped a little at the seriousness in his tone. No, Jinzo suddenly cried out as Inajiko, and the doctor all looked surprised at Nami. She's planning on leaving without letting any of us thank her or say goodbye. Set sail, Luffy yelled and they did as Zoro pulled up the anchor, soon they were moving away from the dock. Wait, don't go, someone screamed. They're leaving, stop, at least let us say goodbye. Nami didn't respond to any of their words as she continued to sprint with the citizens trying to stop her. Genzo fought his way through to the front. N-A-M-I. He yelled, come back here. You can't leave this way. So, Sanji said to Luffy, you sure you want to let her leave like this? Not my decision, Luffy told him, she does what she wants. They sailed farther and farther away, with Nami now in danger of being left behind. But they didn't need to worry. Nami started to run between them all zigzag, diagonal, up and down. She ran past all of them all, slipping away without any trouble, thanks to her years of stealing. Once she passed the doctor and her sister she jumped, almost flying through the air, just barely made it to the ship. Why? Genzo cried out as she landed on the Mary's deck, breathing hard. She didn't move for a moment before she pulled back her shirt to show dozens of wallets and coin purses falling out. At that they all checked their pockets and realized that she stole from each of them. Nami was pulling out some of the money. She kissed it before looking back with a smug smirk, thanks a bunch. The looks on each of their faces was priceless. Why you little brat? Genzo shouted as their jaws all dropped. Yuzop whispered to Zoro darkly, great. She hasn't changed a bit. I'd watch my back if I were you. Zoro agreed, giving Nami a shady look. But Luffy was laughing as Sanji gave her a thumbs up. You lousy p-i-c-k-p-o-c-k-t. Genzo cried out, well I'll miss you. But then Genzo suddenly yelled at Luffy and got their attention. Boy, Luffy looked back up, as he finished by yelling, remember what I told you. Luffy just smirked and gave him the thumbs up. You got it. Nami began to scream out, waving goodbye, goodbye everybody I quote tell I'll miss you. Take care. She then turned to the rest of the crew and said, now that that's over with, I say it's about time we head off to the Grand Line. Everyone cheered and started to laugh together, glad that was finally over. It was another beautiful day later and the whole crew was relaxing on the Mary's deck. Nami was stretching out on a lawn chair as Yuzop sat there, mixing together some of his infamous Tabasco stars. Zoro was on the upper deck and taking a nap, and after looking around for a minute, they spotted Luffy cautiously reaching for some tangerines that had been put on the top of the cabin. Sanji came out of nowhere and kicked him so hard that he was flung backwards right into Yuzop who had some of it get splashed into his eyes. Luffy however was glaring up at Sanji and yelled, Ah, come on, I just want one of them. 
No, Sanji yelled, standing there in front of the trees like a bodyguard, his arms folded. This is Nami's tangerine orchard. I won't let anyone lay a finger on it. He then turned to Nami with his eyes as hearts and cried out, his arms now wide. Nami can you see how well I'm protecting your trees? Yes, she said, without turning to look at him, you're doing very well. Soon, Nami was still going over the paper as Luffy sat up on the railing, looking hungrily up at the fruit as Yuzop lay on his back with a cool cloth to his red eyes. I only want one tangerine. Luffy whined. Just give it here. You're so mean. He stuck his tongue at him. No, Sanji yelled again. Oh well, Luffy said, beaming widely, I'm pretty happy anyway. The world sure is a turbulent place, Nami suddenly stated, telling them what she was reading. She flipped the page and a stray piece of paper fell out. What's that? Luffy asked just as it fluttered to the deck and they saw what it was. Everyone gasped at what they saw and soon they were all screaming, some of them were joyous or horrified. Luffy jumped up and picked it up to stare at it. His eyes were as big as dinner plates as he stared at it and held it up for them all to see, laughing out proudly. All right guys, we're wanted criminals. Yuzop leaned over to look at it. Wanted, dead or alive. 30 million, that's a whole lot of berries. Luffy cried out still laughing. Check it out. Yuzop cried out, pointing at it as a dreamy look came over his face. I'll be seen all around the world. What? Sanji screamed out, staring at it. They put long nose in but left me out. He was then looking all over the poster, now demanding to know where he was because he couldn't see him. Yuzop pointed in the lower corner where the back of his head was and began to laugh as Sanji sat on the deck to pout. It's the back of your head. That's not so great. Yuzop giggled and said, Awa, don't be so glum. You don't have to be a captain to get your picture on one of these things. Sanji cheered up almost at once. Is that true? He asked excitedly. Yeah, Yuzop said, just work really hard. The three male straw hats were all celebrating and dancing as Nami looked like she wanted to crack their heads together. Let's go to the Grand Line men. Luffy shouted out and the other two cheered along. Yet again, you guys don't understand how grim our situation really is. Nami yelled at them before she slapped her hand to her head. This means all of our lives will be in constant danger. Soon they were back on the Mary's deck. And the five of them were all on the upper deck with Nami pouring over the map and find a way to the Grand Line. We're getting closer, she informed them. We've almost made it to the Grand Line and it looks like the only way through is here. Reverse Mountain. There's not, Sanji suddenly said. From what the geezer told me that's the only place to enter. Yuzop looked over at him. Well, how come? Cause it's really dangerous. He answered as if it was obvious, which soon led to the two arguing. Again, see, the reason is, Nami began, but Luffy interrupted, I got an idea. Why don't we sail right into it? Nami looked deeply annoyed and snapped at him, are you really that clueless? My way sounds a lot more fun. He said brightly, smiling, plus it'd be a whole lot better to dive right into it right. Nami put her hand to her head as if she had a headache and said, talking to you drives me completely insane. First off, Luffy said, sounding more serious, we have to stop by an island. We need to pick up some meat. Made meat. Giving him an annoyed look, she pointed to a small island on the map and explained, there's a famous city on this island, known as Louge Town. Louge Town. Luffy repeated mildly, why is it famous? They got delicious meat. You know, Sanji stated, I'm surprised you love meat so much. I mean, you turn into most animals anyway. Shouldn't you be a vegetarian or something? Luffy went wide-eyed before sticking his tongue out in a yuck face and declared, no way. Vegetables are gross. I'm pretty sure I've heard of it before, Zoro said as he looked up at the sky, ignoring the captain and chef's developing argument on the values of vegetables. It's the city of the beginning. And the end. Luffy looked confused and Nami explained. It's the town where the old king of the pirates, Gold Roger, was both born and killed. The straw hats were all looking at the make with new interest as Luffy asked in a hushed tone. That's where the king of the pirates died. She looked at him with a small smile. Well, yeah, let's do it, Luffy said seriously. This was the man who had the one piece, everything the world has to offer. I need to see where he was born and executed. Before long they were standing in a large town in what looked like the main square. Though it was wide open it was filled with people. After agreeing to meet up later, the straw hats soon went their separate ways. Before long, someone in the crowd at the town square yelled that someone was up on the execution's platform. When the other members of the crowd looked up, they could see a tall metal structure, several stories high, and starting to rust from the years of being exposed to the elements. Standing at the top, with his eyes shielded so that he could see everything, was Luffy. In the crowd someone screamed, Hey, you up there. Looking down, Luffy saw that a police officer, dressed in attire very similar to Genzo had been, was there with a loudspeaker. Get down from there, immediately. But why? Luffy shouted back, like a child who had been told that he had to go to bed and didn't understand why he couldn't stay up later. You are standing on an execution platform that belongs to the world government. The officer yelled. Now, get down from there right now. Fine, I'll come down. Luffy yelled down agreeably. 
But first you have to say the magic word and smile too. I'm not playing. I will arrest you if you don't come down. The officer yelled, and he truly sounded annoyed. But before he could make good on his threat, someone came out from the crowd with a colossal iron mace over her shoulder before she hit the man so hard that he was out as soon as he hit the ground. She was a truly beautiful woman that was slim, well endowed, with dark green eyes before his brown and full ruby red lips. But the most noticeable thing about her was her silky looking skin that looked so soft. Ahem, what was I saying? Oh yeah. The woman spoke. Now's not the time for such trifles, she said in a sweet voice that seemed strangely familiar. The woman was looking up to Luffy and cooed out, Long time no see, Luffy. I've been looking for you. Apparently Luffy didn't recognize her as he looked down with a confused look on his face. When she noticed this, the woman sighed. Now that's just rude, she said. You mean to tell me that you, of all people, this face? Forgot. I'm pretty sure we haven't even met, Luffy said in confusion. Who are you? I'll never forget you. You were the first man who ever truly strike me, the woman said fondly, causing the other people around them to scowl up at Luffy, outraged that he had done something to this girl. What? I never hit you, Luffy yelled in credulity, looking a little lost as to why everyone was glaring at him. When you struck me with your powerful fist, she answered, her hand over her stomach, it felt good. Luffy looked most uncomfortable at this and his eyes were darting around, as if hoping for a way to escape. Listen up boys, who is the most beautiful person on these seas? The woman suddenly asked the crowd. That would be you. Everyone in the crowd yelled as they got down on their knees and held their arms out to her. That's correct. The now highly familiar sounding woman said with a smirk, holding out her arm. I am quite breathtaking aren't I? There isn't a man alive that won't crumble before my beauty. But I prefer strong men. Like you. Looking back to the platform she cooed out. I'm gonna make you all mine, Luffy. Just wait. Luffy shouted out, now sounding completely sickened at the thought, gross, no way, just who the heck are you? You still haven't figured it out, she exclaimed in annoyance, losing her patience. Several officers came running to the square with their weapons and telling the woman to put her mace down and come with them, I placing you under arrest for assaulting a police captain. Another officer yelled before he turned up to Luffy and shouted out, as for you up there, get off that platform, hold on, who did you say you were arresting? The woman asked, as if she just wanted to make sure she heard right. We, we're arresting you. The officer stuttered, taken in by her beauty as she batted her eyelashes at him. Are you really going to arrest me? She asked sweetly, smiling as hearts now appeared in the officer's eyes, causing them to start saying that they couldn't arrest her because she's too beautiful. I don't give a crap. Another yelled, though he was now looking close to proclaiming undying love as well, arrest her. But before they could act, a large cannonball came flying from behind them and it hit the fountain so that it ended up blowing it apart in large chucks when a large part of the fountain flew at the woman. But as it hit, it slid right off her as if it had been a giant bar of soap and went flying off near Luffy's direction but moved in time. Aw oh man, that's weird. Luffy exclaimed loudly as everyone stared at her. That little stunt was dangerous you know. The woman asked, sounding just a little irritated as she turned her attention to a group of people who had come from the direction of the cannonball each of them wearing a dark cloak to cover themselves. I'm flashily sorry, the one out front said softly. But that smooth skin of yours is unharmed of course, so there's no need to worry fairest Alvida. Alvida, Luffy repeated to himself, as he finally made the connection. Or maybe not. I don't see Alvida. Don't be so dense you nimwit. The woman yelled angrily. I quote M-A-L-V-I-D-A. W-H-A-A-A-A. The collective fans of One Piece screamed out upon reading this. You sure? Luffy asked. Cause I don't think you're her. Alvida smiled. I guessed I really did change after eating the fruit called. She removed her heart cloak to fully reveal her new body to them all, and get the whole picture to how much she had changed. Smooth smooth fruit. No attack can hurt my skin because it slides right off. Unfortunately, a lowly fruit could not improve on my already stunning good looks. Alva sighed in disappointment as she touched her cheek. One big change you may have noticed was that I lost my freckles. Ah, uh, sure, that must be it, Luffy whispered, though it was clear that he didn't believe a word he said as he continued to look around for a way to get away from her. After becoming a whole new person, Alvida went on. I decided to join forces with someone who shared my goal of finding you. She then finally gestured to the cloaked men. Here, the cloaked man laughed insanely as he and his crew threw off the cloaks, revealing to be Buggy the Clown and his whole circus was back. Now that I flashily made my entrance, time for the real star of the show. He screamed out and pointed up at Luffy. Monkey D. Luffy, ever since the day you sent me flying, I've been obsessed with exacting my revenge on you. That alone led to me finally finding my crew. My travels are an epic saga. I went to hell, found friendship, I even lost parts of my body. I call this tale Tiny Buggy's Great Adventure. The first thing that happened was, why the hell am I telling you a story? Luffy stared blankly at Buggy. Don't know. Now, he folded his arms as he said, what was her name again? Boggy. Buggy. Do I? Baggy. Uh, I know. 
he said proudly. It's buffoon. Buffoon. Buggy screamed, enraged. You got a lot of nerve you bratty animal. And now Buggy the Clown is gonna make you pay for that. Hey, that's Buggy the Clown. One of the people yelled in fear. And at the mention of pirates, all the people there turned and began to try and run, wanting nothing more than to get away from the square as fast as they could. But the buggy pirates seemed to be prepared for this as they each pulled out guns and swords, making sure that they wouldn't move. You people flashily stay where you are. Buggy proclaimed to them all. I want every single one of you to see exactly how scary I can be. Oh yeah, Luffy yelled proudly, having just remembered Buggy's real name, Buggy Wright. You mean you just now remembered it? Buggy screamed. Too late, with Luffy distracted, the man who fought Zoro on the unicycle, Kabaji, appeared behind him and slammed a large metal and wood board down on top of him to trap him so that he was pinned in the stocks that held his head and hands there. Hey, Luffy questioned in surprise looking around up at Kabaji. What gives? Long time no see, animal freak. Kabaji greeted with a scolding tone as he sat on the stock and asked how Zoro was doing. Good shot, Kabaji. Buggy praised as he began to laugh and call out to everyone, to all of my followers, hundreds of billions of them around the world. We will now begin the most flashily public execution. You're trapped Monkey D. Luffy. You can't move so much as an inch. Luffy attempted to pull his head out of the board, but he couldn't pull his head out of the hole. And it wasn't easy for him to do so while he was being held like this, he honestly couldn't move at all. Suddenly he felt weaker for some reason and could no longer feel like he could transform into one of his animal forms to escape. Tell me straw hat. Buggy yelled up at him as he laughed. Feel honored. You'll die in the same place as the king of the pirates. Again, despite his weakness Luffy was trying to move as a wind began to pick up and dark clouds were being blown over them so that the entire square was cast in shadows. And perhaps it was just the trace of electrical energy in the air that caused it. But there was also a strong sense that something big was going to happen here was building with each minute. Ignoring this, Buggy started speaking again like an announcer. Pirate Monkey D. Luffy of the Straw Hats will be flashily executed for the crime of being stuck up and making me angry. Buggy yelled as he lifted his arms, suddenly standing beside the trapped Luffy. At his words, all the pirates around them were screaming in celebration, shooting off guns and jumping as if a great show was about to take place. Now live it up, flashily. Buggy shouted as his men all cheered at that. Luffy was looking down at them excitedly. Oh boy, I've never seen an execution. Well you're about to kid, Buggy informed him with a dark chuckle in his voice. Luffy blinked at that and looked up as he slowly processed what he said. What? He screamed out in horror, stop joking. It's no joke. Buggy screamed as Luffy was now trying to desperately pull himself free and call for help. I even got a little bit of sea stone just for you so you won't turn into something like a rat and escape. It wasn't easy, I'll tell you that. Now, he said as he turned away from the struggling straw hat. All right. Buggy yelled to the crowd as Luffy continued to try pull his head free. I hereby flashily begin the festivities of this public execution. Luffy finally stopped struggling and was now lying there with a pout on his face. I'm so sorry. Really I am. Please spare my life, he said in a droning voice, and it sounded as if Nami forced him to apologize for breaking something instead of pleading for his life. It couldn't have been any clearer to them that he didn't mean a word to what he said. Why would I spare your life? Buggy bellowed in frustration. This is what happens when you go against us, Kabaji commented, moving back down to the ground so that he could watch with the others. Alva sighed a little regretfully. I guess this is it for the man I had my eye on. Buggy held up a long sword and looked down at Luffy as he stated, You've got quite a big audience here today, Straw Hat. You want to say a few words before you die. Luffy continued to sit there with a grumpy look on his face, even as Buggy stepped on his head. Alwa, Cat got your tongue, Buggy asked, still taunting him. That's all right. Stay quiet or say a few words. It doesn't matter, you're still gonna die. Luffy lay there for a moment before he took a deep breath. Just as a great wind swept over them all he bellowed out at the top of his lungs, so that the words seemed to echo all around them. Listen, I'm the man who'll be king of the pirates. There was stunned silence all around them as the crowd stared at him in disbelief. Yet at the same time it was as if they could feel a strange energy coming from him, as if confirming his words. Buggy however wasn't impressed as he grinned evilly. We're finally getting to the best part of the show. He asked him, looking truly pleased at what he was going to do. Bye bye now. Luffy had tried to pull his head out one last time. But it was clear that he was trapped here. But then Zoro's voice echoed out behind them. Stop the execution. There they were. Zoro and Sanji had finally shown up and were now standing at the edge of the crowd as they watched on. Now, they both screamed out at Buggy, clearly warning him that they weren't playing around here. Zoro, Sanji. Luffy yelled in relief. Luffy you idiot. Zoro teased, his hand resting on the two new swords hanging at his hip. Guess all that fooling around finally caught up with you, huh? You starting a sideshow? Sanji added, looking around at the buggy pirates. Or is that how you look? Pretty sad. He continued as he smoked. Now, all we gotta do is drive these goons away. 
The citizens all screamed Zoro's name in terror and fled. Thankfully the buggy pirates turned their full attention away from them and onto the two men. Hey guys, Luffy screamed again happily. You made it here, Zoro. Buggy yelled cockily. But you're just a little bit too late. He raised his sword over his head, ready to cut Luffy's head off and that got their attention as they rushed in to try and take down the platform before that sword fell. Of course, that was difficult to do since the pirates were now standing in their way, with Alvida now taking control and telling them what to do. Though the two members of the monster trio were easily able to plow through these weaklings, they were outnumbered and it was taking too long already. Buggy laughed victoriously as he held his sword high as the sky continued to darken overhead. The storm was almost here. Not even the great Zoro can stop me now. There's nothing you two can do. This is the end of your captain. Luffy's expression became terrified as he stared up at the blade as Buggy continued to laugh insanely. Zoro and Sanji were now fighting tooth and nail to reach the platform in time. They were quickly becoming more frantic and scared as they tried to force their way through. Creep! Sanji screamed at Buggy as the thunder roared around them. As the Straw Hats all watched the two fight to get closer, Luffy's voice from above them sounded out, Zoro. Sanji, use up. Nami. They looked up to see Luffy looking up. Everyone in the square was now staring up as the fear completely left Luffy's face. Instead, he was smiling. Each of the Straw Hats felt as if they had frozen in place as they stared at him. It wasn't a forced or painful smile, but serene, as if he was truly happy. This lingering smile. Luffy truly believed he was going to die here, but he wasn't upset about it. Sorry, Luffy went on. And he truly did sound like he meant it this time, but this time he was apologizing to his crew, not Buggy. But, undead, he informed them all. And he kept smiling even as Buggy brought his sword down on his neck. Idiot. Zoro as he stared up in horror. Don't say that. Sanji yelled, now desperately kicking five or six pirates out of his way to get to them. But as the blade fell, it sparkled with electricity from the air and with a great explosion from above them a single bolt of lightning came crashing from the dark clouds and struck the tower. The entire tower burst into blue flames and the skies opened up to the rain. In a matter of seconds, it was pouring, but the platform continued to burn, slowly bending and twisting around as it broke and landed with a crash sideways. The sound of when it hit the ground echoed throughout the square. No one said a word. On one even moved as they watched. They were all staring with their mouths open in shock at the twisted heap of metal and burnt wood. Just at that moment, Luffy had pulled himself out of the debris, his head still on and his body looking only slightly singed and dirty. Buggy wasn't so lucky, taking the brunt of the blast. He was lying on the ground and was badly burnt and out cold. Like a puppy finding its owner, Luffy's straw hat dropped at his feet and Luffy picked it up to put it back on. As soon as he did he started to laugh, a laugh that cut through the silence. Hey, I'm still alive. That's nice. The people in the crowd hadn't recovered as quickly as they had and were all staring in stunned disbelief at what they just saw. Sanji's own mouth had was open so that his cigarette fell out. But Zoro's face didn't react at all. But there was a strange contemplation expression there as he looked at Luffy coming towards them, talking about how lucky an escape that was. That was divine intervention. Sanji suddenly declared. Stop talking nonsense, Zoro said at once, the first one to really recover. Though still shaken up by what just happened, he grasped the seriousness of the situation as he said loudly, looking around them, we gotta get out of this town. Our troubles are not over. It looked like he was right, because at that moment, a small army of marines came charging out from all sides. It was clear that they had the entire place surrounded from the moment that the pirates began fighting each other and were now trying to round them all up. Luffy was looking ready for a fight but Zoro grabbed him and reminded him that they had to run now. That if they didn't get back to the Merry now, they weren't going to leave at all. So, with everyone's attentions on each other, the three turned and went running down the street in the direction of the docks. As they ran through the empty streets, the rain was now coming down harder than ever before. Zoro yelled in frustration. What the hell is up with all this rain? Nami was right about this storm, Sanji said loudly, trying to shield his eyes from the water with his arms so that he could see where they were going. If we don't get back to the ship and set sail soon, then we'll be stuck here for good. On they ran, even when the marines were right behind them. They kept going, not bothering to stop and fight. With every step they seemed to take however, the rain seemed to become thicker and fall harder so that it was getting hard to see anything in front of them. But eventually, they spotted someone standing in their way. A young woman with short navy blue hair and a sword in her hands. I didn't know you were Zoro. And a pirate as well. You lied. The woman said, her head down. But then she looked up and glared at Zoro and said loudly, You're just another liar. Zoro told her irritably, You never asked what my name was, did you? So I never lied did I? The woman got angry at him and declared that she wasn't going to let him leave town with his sword. In the end, Zoro decided to stay behind and fight. A woman, Tashigi, charge ahead in anger and pull out her blade. But Zoro was more than able to hold her back. His eyes held a thoughtful expression as Sanji yelled that he shouldn't fight a girl. 
That got Tashigi even angrier than before and told him off for that. As Zoro told them to go on ahead, Luffy nodded, deciding to leave it all to him as he and Sanji left, with Sanji threatening to kick his ass if he hurt her. As Luffy and Sanji ran through the raging storm that suddenly appeared in Logtown, Luffy met up with another Marine. This particular Marine's name was Smoker and he was the leading officer in Loungetown. He was around Zoro's height with short white hair and wore a white marine jacket that looked like it was made to look like a biker's. He had a large metal jet strapped to his back and, most curiously, had two cigars in his mouth with more strapped along his body. Luffy and Smoker weren't waiting around as they began to fight, but here, no matter what Luffy threw at him, none of his attacks did any good. Any attack launched at the marine passed through him as his body turned to smoke, showing the marine to be a devil fruit user. Luffy jumped around on cricket legs and tried multiple rapid fire kicks on Smoker. However his attacks just ended up going right through him like smoke. The marine then flew a smoky fist that caught Luffy in the face during one of his failed attacks, sending the young pirate crashing to the ground. What's wrong? Smoker challenged, had enough already. Luffy slowly go back up and tried to attack, but nothing he did worked. This is bad, he thought frantically. I can't think of any animal that can hurt smoke. Smoker trapped Luffy in a cloud of smoke and slammed him to the ground, his face in the concrete and his hand on his head. I told you, Smoker yelled at him, you gotta go through me to get to the Grand Line. You're not worth 30 million berries. Huh, your luck's run out. But as Smoker reached for his weapon, someone stepped out of the shadows and took hold of it to prevent him from moving. The man's face was a mystery. Not only was the rain obstructing their view, but the man was wearing a long, dark green cloak that hid him completely from their view. I wouldn't be so sure about that, the man said in a hoarse voice, though his tone carried no trace of a threat. They could tell that he meant business. There was something in that voice that seemed to demand attention despite speaking so softly. It's you, Smoker snarled almost exactly as Robin spoke. Hey, what's going on? Demanded Luffy with a muffled voice, hard for him to speak with his face to the ground. Who's that? The most wanted man in the world, Dragon the Revolutionary. How nice, Smoker said to him. Now the government can have your head. Dragon didn't speak for a moment, but then he went on in that same hoarse voice, the world is still waiting for our answer. Just then the whole area was surrounded with an eerie green light and a great wind came rushing out of nowhere. A wind that was so strong that it was as if they were in the middle of a maelstrom. Luffy screamed as he was sent flying back, falling backwards onto soft grass. After recovering, Luffy was soon standing on the going merry, but it was still raining hard and the storm raged around him. Fierce gales and heavy rains and battered the ship something awful as Nami was shouting out instructions as they just left Logtown. Feels like she's gonna capsize. Luffy yelled from the front, but instead of worried, he sounded excited at the thought that they might end up drowning. Hey look, the light. Nami suddenly screamed out and they looked up to see a bright light burning in the distance. Point the way through the storm. Is that a lighthouse? Usopp screamed over the noise of the storm as he hung onto the mast to keep himself from slipping. The grand line is just out ahead. Luffy repeated in awe, his eyes bright as he grinned at the lighthouse. Nami smiled just as brightly as she looked to him, and she was as excited as he was here. Zoro smirked and Sanji grinned wildly, giving them a thumbs up. Luffy and Nami were grinning at each other as Luffy held onto his hat to keep it from being blown off. Sanji then yelled out, Okay then, I think we should say something to mark the occasion. Good idea, Yuzop exclaimed, finally able to pull himself off the mast at the suggestion as Luffy yelled in agreement to that idea. Sanji rolled out a large barrel on the upper deck and the five crewmates stepped around it. Each one had an excited gleam in their eye, because they all knew that this was the first time of them fulfilling their dreams. They smiled at the barrel, as if each one was thinking the same thing as the others. Sanji stepped up first and put his foot on the top of the barrel. I'm going to the Grand Line to find All Blue. Following suit, Luffy also put his foot up and proclaimed that he was going to become the King of the Pirates. One by one, they all put a foot up and told each other their dreams. The reason they set out to see with each other in the first place was for these reasons. Zoro and Nami both proclaimed their reasons for being here and looked to Yuzop who stood there thinking, as if he didn't know what to say. But then he quickly put his foot up and said, I guess I'm going to be a brave warrior of the sea. Though the five of them held their feet there for only a few seconds, it felt so much longer. They looked at the barrel that held their goals and hopes, each one smiling through the rain. At this moment, there was no fear or hesitation in any of them. There was no turning back for them even if they wanted to. They all knew what they wanted and it was here that they decided that they were going to go to the ends of the world if that's what it took to get it. And no matter what happened, they were going to do it together. And now, Luffy yelled as they all raised their legs high and brought them down to smash the barrel to the Grand Line. Yeah, the straw hat shouted, with the little boat continuing on through the rough storm, following the light. One, I thought this'd be funny to add, showing Luffy's line of reasoning for why he's not a vegetarian-like beast boy. 
Not quite sure what Luffy's actual opinion on vegetables is, but due to his childish behavior and his obsession with meat I'd assume this is spot on. 2. This is the only way that I could think of for Buggy to successfully capture Luffy. I imagine that with all the sea stone the marines used to capture pirates, chances are there is some black market stuff that Buggy could get a hold of just for capturing Luffy. 3. Buggy acted as a lightning rod and cannon, and with Luffy's durability I'd imagine he'd survive with or without rubber powers. He did get a bit more damage than in cannon, but not enough to be noticeable. 4. I myself can't think of any animal, real or otherwise, that can hurt Smoke but I plan on researching this so that by the next time Luffy and Smoker fight, it'll be much more interesting. This will be because Luffy himself will be trying to find any animal that can fight smoke. Also, he couldn't use his other forms that might have worked because, in his hurry, Luffy couldn't come up with a strategy in time. While smart while fighting, that doesn't mean Luffy can come up with an answer for everything. After all, it took him three tries before he could take down Crocodile and Cannon. The Straw Hats all enjoyed the breakneck ride down Reverse Mountain. The wind blowing past them as they continued to pick up speed as they went, the water sprayed everywhere creating more mist. The entire crew was shouting in joy, obviously loving every minute of it. Downwards they sped, almost as if they were on a water slide, breaking through the clouds so that they couldn't see anything but the white fog in front of them. All five were laughing, sounding as if they didn't have a care in the world. But then Zoro was shouting out, Did you just hear something? Huh, what's that? Nami yelled over at him as the straw hat stopped laughing long enough to hear them. That groaning sound. Zoro shouted out, Didn't you hear it? It was probably just the wind. She dismissed at him as they started to go even faster. At this speed, everything sounds distorted. But then they heard it, a distance wailing that sounded like a foghorn had come through the clouds. Yuzop began to look through his goggles to try and find that answer as well. Nami, screamed Sanji from the mast. I see a mountain up ahead. What? That's impossible. Nami yelled up at him in panic. But it's right there. Sanji screamed back as he pointed in front of them. I can see it. Who cares? Luffy yelled from the Mary's head. And it was obvious that he couldn't have cared less to what might happen. Go. Nami began to scream that they should be home free after they passed the twin capes. But then that groaning wail sounded off once again, louder than ever so that no one could deny that they didn't hear it. Luffy was now trying to squint his eyes through the thick fog, trying to make something out. Just then, they broke through the white sheet and all that could be seen was a vast navy blue, almost black, which caused the five straw hats to scream in shock. It's a black wall. Luffy screamed in fear. No, it's not. Nami shouted in horror as she grabbed hold of the railing, tears in her eyes. Then what is it? Zoro yelled before she could finish. It's a whale. Yuzop screamed. To say that this whale was enormous would be the understatement of the century. In front of them was a magnificent creature that was so large, it looked like it could swallow an entire island in one gulp. The whale's massive mouth opened a little so that they could see the row of sharp teeth, and a single tooth about the size of the Mary, if not bigger. And his great head was also covered in dozens of scars, both old and new. But unaware of what was going on around him, the whale wailed out once again, the loudest one yet, that made the entire mountain shake. They all covered their ears, the noise piercing their brains and their eardrums felt as if they were about to burst. The straw hats, however, were all screaming in a panic. W. Wah. What are we gonna do? Yuzop screamed out, looking ready to faint as he stared at them all, desperate that one of them had a plan here. Should we fight? Luffy suggested quickly. Idiot, how are we supposed to fight a hundred-ton whale? Nami demanded hysterically. Well, do something. Yuzop screamed at them both. Our path is blocked. How do we escape? Calm down, Sanji yelled. Though he too sounded close to losing his mind in blind fear, if this creature looks like a giant wall to us, we must be a speck. Zoro yelled out that it wouldn't matter if they were small to him because they were going to crash right into him unless they changed course. Look, he then shouted, pointing to the titan's side where there was an opening. We can get by on the left. Port. Hard to port. The rudder's broken. Yuzop reminded him loudly. Do something for Pete's sake. Zoro yelled. And it was strange to see him lose control of his calm like this. Anything. Wait. I know. Luffy yelled as he jumped off the figurehead and headed straight down to the hull. This'll work. It has to. Nami yelled after him what he was up to. But he didn't stick around to answer as he disappeared through the front of the ship. The other three men went and tried to pull what was left of the rudder to the left. This is pointless. Yuzop yelled as the other two cursed. The ship's not gonna turn. Just as they had almost reached Laboon, below deck there was an enormous blast which could only mean one thing. The cannon. They screamed. The impact of the blast shot the ship back slightly and blew up in front of them once it hit the whale. The cannon had stopped them from crashing right into the whale and being destroyed. But it wasn't enough to stop them completely. The ship had slowed down considerably but when it bumped into the whale, it ended up breaking off the Mary's figurehead. The sheep's head broke with a loud crack and went flying overhead so that when it hit the deck they could hear Luffy's scream of horror. Hey. That was my special seat. 
Once everyone had caught their breath and let sink in what happened, they broke out the paddles and were now trying to slip past the whale without him noticing anything. Zoro, Yuzop, and Sanji were all yelling at each other about what just happened. All right, let's get out of here before it's too late. Zoro began, someone mind telling me what the heck is going on? Yuzop shouted back, looking ready to cry. It's so big that the cannonball didn't even make it flinch. Sanji cried as they were working hard to paddle. That, or his reaction time is really slow. Who cares? Zoro yelled at him, at least we're alive. Once again, the gigantic whale howled out, feeling as if his voice was a shockwave. The straw hats were all trying to block out the sound and only focused on paddling right past him. They kept rowing until they were passing right underneath the whale's eye, which was easily more than four times bigger than the little ship, when Luffy came back up to the deck, looking furious. Luffy, Nami whispered, wondering just what it was that he was going to do now. You think you can break my special seat and get away with it? Luffy yelled as he balled his fist. Leaping off the ship, the wings of a hawk sprang from Luffy's back as he flew full force right into the whale's eye. Take this, you moron. All the straw yelled. Each one of them had tears of fear in their eyes. For a second, time seemed to freeze for nothing could be heard but the sounds of the waves hitting the ship. But then the massive eye suddenly looked down at them and they screamed in terror. It sees us, they yelled, and looked ready to start paddling like crazy away from there. Luffy, naturally, stood his ground as he used his wings to hover in between the whale and his ship. I'm not through with you. There's a lot more where that came from. However, before their idiotic captain could escalate the situation even more, Nami threw a lasso from the ship's rigging that snagged the childish captain around his neck. With a yank, the noose dragged Luffy to the merry where Zoro and Yuzop proceeded to kick him in the head, yelling at him that he could get them all killed. The massive aquatic mammal groaned angrily, before he slowly opened his massive mouth, revealing the large teeth once again. Please, no, Nami croaked out, now crying hard. But the rushing water going into the gaping mouth was like a current and their little ship didn't stand a chance as it was quickly pulled in. It acted as a black hole. They were pulled right into the whale's mouth and there wasn't anything they could do but hold on tight and hope for the best. But as they were swept away into the mouth, Luffy was knocked overboard, screaming the whole way as his crew called after him earnestly. Luffy almost hit the water, but had enough sense to regrow his wings and grab onto one of the iceberg-sized teeth and hung on tightly, least the powerful winds brought up by the behemoths breathing suck him in as well. I am not gonna die here. Luffy growled as he held on for dear life. Through the wind he struggled to climb his way up. After a few moments, the whale closed his mouth, eating the going merry hull, the ship spinning as if it was going down the drain. However, it was almost anticlimactic when it was over. Just then, Luffy had been able to climb up to the head, breathing heavily as if he had run for hours. As he attempted to catch his breath, he had anger and fear on his face as he looked around, wondering what to do. Aw oh man, Luffy stated, barely controlling his panic. Everyone was swallowed whole. Hey, he screamed as he started punching the rubbery skin under him, yelling that he spit them all at once. With each hit, Luffy shifted between some of his heavy hitter forms such as a grizzly bear, an elephant man, and a tiger hybrid, seemingly ignoring the, for all intent and purpose, Zoo hitting its hide, the whale stared to submerge. Where do you think you're going you jerk? Luffy demanded, sounding more and more angry with each second. Listen you big whale I'm not gonna ask again. Stop sinking. I mean it. My friends and me are on an important adventure. I can't lose them. Luffy seemed to be going nuts as he took his chimera form and roared out. Give them B-A-A-A-A-C-C-C-K. Meanwhile, the whale was continuing to go down and it would only be a matter of seconds before Luffy would sink along with it. The water was rising up quickly and as he stared around looking for where he should swim off to and thinking of any form that could do any damage to the whale, Luffy noticed something embedded in the whale's head. Luffy noticed it looked like a hatch for a submarine. Without thinking, he ran over to it and opened it so that he could jump in. He managed to close the door just as the entire area was submerged into the water. While he could have turned into any number of sea creatures, Luffy didn't want to lose track of the whale and by extension his crew. Despite the whale's size, Luffy didn't want to risk it. I might not know what kind of whale this is, Luffy said to himself after he got a good look around and found himself to be standing in an iron hallway with light hanging every few feet. But I'm pretty sure most animals don't have doors and lighted hallways in them. What kind of whale is this? The chimera boy started to walk down the hallway, but then something else happened. The room seemed to tilt and Luffy was knocked off his feet so that he went tumbling down. Luffy was bouncing around like a rubber ball down the hallway until he ended up in a large tunnel with metal walkways on either side of a river. He was going so fast that he couldn't even concentrate properly to get into a form that would prevent his fast descent. Luffy bounced around violently and landing with a painful thudding sound on the walkway. Gasping for breath, Luffy raised his head and stared around. Hey that's weird, the whale's got a river inside it too. He gasped as the room began to shake again and was tilted up one way. Luffy tried to hold on so that he wouldn't go sliding down again, but it was too steep for him. He slipped and fell, 
Despite all the constant rocking back and forth, after a few minutes, Luffy had been able to straighten up enough so that he was now running down the hall, looking like he wanted nothing more than to get out of this place. He was waving his arms around in panic, trying to stop himself, but before he could, he looked up in time to see two people standing in front large of a large, metal door. The two were a strange-looking duo. There was a middle-aged man with a large crown on the top of his long hair, and the numbers nine written on each of his cheeks. The second was a young woman with long, wavy blue hair tied in a tight ponytail and a bit of a stuck-up expression. The duo didn't see pleased to see Luffy. They looked scared stiff at seeing someone come running at them, screaming at the top of his lungs, before he slammed right into them with such force that the doors were forced open and they were flying through the air. It was a bit of a shock to find that they were back under a blue sky and clouds, along with a small island, complete with a coconut tree and shack with the Mary right alongside it. Luffy, Zoro's voice came from the ship, and he saw the four of them standing on deck as they watched Luffy and the other two go flying by. Zoro, is everyone okay? Luffy yelled in relief before he realized that there wasn't much to stand on and he was falling fast. So ah, uh, I can use a hand. He yelled before the three of them hit the digestive juice. Later, the crew had just fished Luffy and the other two out and were all on deck, and the constant shaking had stopped and there was a deep, almost humming sound that they could hear echoing off the whales, whose name turned out to be Laboon, Stomach Walls. I don't claim to speak whale, Nami said, going to the railing and looking around but it seems to have calmed down a bit. Seems that way, Zoro said, looking at woman and the man. Now, we saved your lives for the time being. He told them irritably. You better talk and make it quick. Sanji was right up next to woman and was almost drooling when he saw her. She looked at him with a mixture of apprehension and repugnance as she moved closer to her partner. They then heard her whisper, Mr. Nine. These heathens are pirates. Mr. Nine looked to her and they heard him whisper back. Yes, that's painfully obvious Miss Wednesday. But if we speak to their humanity and compassion, they should understand our plight. Maybe, you know, we can hear every word they're saying, Yuzop said, all of them shaking their heads at this. Well, I noticed that some people do tend to think that pirates are stupid, Nami proclaimed, and she admitted that when you met people like Luffy, Zoro, Sanji, and Yuzop, she could understand why. You parasites are still here, yelled an aged voice from above them, and they looked up to see an old man standing up on a small iron platform next to the enormous gate that they had come charging out of. He had a rather stocky and muscular body, with a bald patch on the top of his head, but with white hair with yellow flower petal-like things. The man, Crocus, declared loudly, I grow weary of this and for the last time. As long as I draw breath you will not lay a single harmful finger on Laboon. He's back again, Yuzop said as Luffy looked to them and asked who he was. Suddenly, the two weirdos were laughing. You can't bully us into abandoning our mission. Miss, Wednesday said in a conceited voice as she picked up one of two bazookas that they had been carrying with them. We were sent here to hunt this whale and that's exactly what we're gonna do. Mr. Nine yelled in agreement as he also picked up one. And this time we won't let you interfere. They held up the guns as Luffy looked on. We're about to give this whale a new blowhole. Fire baby. As they launched the two cannonballs at the walls of Laboon's stomach, Crocus jumped right into the line of fire, protecting the whale from the weapons. Crocus, burnt and injured, fell into the pool of acid as the straw hats all gasped at what he had done. The woman let out an annoying laugh and proclaimed, Your defiance is pointless. Go ahead. Waste your time. Mr. Nine yelled and miss. Wednesday continued to laugh, but make no mistake. That hulking beast will provide food for our town. With Crocus now trying to stay afloat in the acid, the two continued to cackle and Luffy seemed to lose his patience. He slammed their heads so hard that he knocked them out. Uh, what was that for? Yuzop asked him. I just, Luffy said looking up in aggravation, wanted to hit them. After they fished Crocus out and tied the two up, the old doctor invited them over to the island, which was actually a ship with an iron bottom so it could float here without worry of dissolving. I thank you for saving my life, Crocus said gratefully once he made himself comfortable in a lawn chair, though I must ask, why did you do it? I wasn't trying to save you. Luffy answered bluntly as he started to climb the tree, there was just something about those two I didn't like. Okay, I think it's about time we got some answers, Nami said in annoyance as Yuzop tried to pull Luffy back down the tree. Who are these guys? She asked, pointing to Ms. Wednesday and Mr. Nine. And how did you end up inside this whale? These two are thugs from a nearby town looking for whale meat. Crocus answered grumpily. If they caught him, Laboon could feed the townspeople for at least two or three years easy. All they're concerned with is feeding their fat, greedy bellies. Laboon, Nami repeated in confusion. That's the whale's name, Crocus answered gruffly. He a unique and magnificent creature. An island whale, a rare species that can only be found in the West Blue. I won't allow them to slaughter him for food. None of them noticed Luffy's ears perking up as he stored that tidbit of information away for later. But if these whales are found only in the West Blue, how did we end up meeting them in the Grand Line? Yuzop asked in confusion. 
You saw how big they were. I guess that even an entire West Blue Sea isn't big enough all the time, Sanji answered. I mean, it's not that hard to think that such a large pot of whales don't visit the Grand Line from time to time. They're bigger than some sea kings and I'm sure they can take care of themselves. It's a shame he's stuck here so far from his domain. Crocus went on with Sai. You see there's a reason he keeps hitting his head against the red line and hollering at Reverse Mountain. There is, Nami asked a little quietly. Yes, Crocus answered looking at them. To put it one way, inside Laboon's body beats the heart of a human. He has most impatiently awaited and is eternally devoted to a certain band of pirates. He paused and added, going on fifty long years now. All who have seen Laboon ask the same questions. Crocus went on, why does he continuously strike his body against the red line? Why does he keep howling at Reverse Mountain? Listen closely and I will reveal Laboon's tragic story. Crocus sighed and began, one fine, sunny day. While I was fulfilling my duties as lighthouse keeper, some good-natured pirates came down from Reverse Mountain. They were followed by a baby whale, Spry and Chipper, who I would soon come to know as the one and only Laboon. And so he told them the whole story, how these pirates had met up with a baby whale while they had sailed the West Blue, and Laboon had traveled with them for most of their journey. But knowing how dangerous the Grand Line was, they had decided that it was in Laboon's best interest to leave him behind where he would be safe. But Laboon had followed after them anyway because he had come to see these pirates as his family. The damage that their ship had taken just getting to the Grand Line however was very extensive so they decided to stay here for several months to sing with Laboon until repairs were made. After about three months, and their ship finally repaired, they had asked Crocus to take care of Laboon for them until they came back. They had promised that when they finished sailing around the world, they would come back for him and that the whale would then come with them on their future adventures. Crocus sighed and finished his tale by saying, that was fifty long years ago. Fifty years, Sanji repeated as they all stared at him. So Laboon has been waiting here all this time for his friends to return. Yuzop whispered, his eyes wide and his jaw falling open at hearing that. No wonder he's upset, Nami said, looking up at the whale with new sympathy. That kind of weight would drive anyone crazy. They could hear Laboon's voice crying out once again as the straw hats climbed up on the ship and had Crocus lead them out through the door and through a long canal inside Laboon's body. This is some canal, Zoro suddenly said. Amazing this whale's still alive with a hole like this in its body. I suppose you're responsible for this, Sanji asked Crocus, as the little island boat went sailing alongside them. Crocus was reading the paper and didn't look up as he answered. Just a doctor's playful mind, he stated causally, as if telling them what day it was. Doctor, Yuzop repeated in surprise. That's right, he answered, legally certified. I also ran a clinic on the Grand Line once upon a time. Before then I served as a ship's doctor. Really? Luffy said eagerly, as he sat up on the broke Mary's head. That's great. Then join us. We need a doctor. Don't be ridiculous. He called back, stopping near a ladder and started to climb. I no longer have that kind of energy. Exploring the seas is a young man's job. Sanji asked what kind of doctor would hallow out a whale's insides. Maybe it's part of the treatment. Nami suggested as Crocus reached the top of the ladder and stood on a platform. The girl is right, he answered, looking back at them. With a creature of this size as it's virtually impossible to treat it from the outside. Therefore I devised a more drastic solution. Here's the exit. He added as he then turned a wheel and the large door opened up and they could see the sky. The real sky. Don't you think 50 years is a bit extreme? Yuzop suddenly asked. Those pirates sure know how to test someone's patience. Idiot, don't you get it? This is the grand line. Sanji yelled at him as they moved the Mary's head onto the upper deck. His friends are dead. He blew out smoke from his cigarette and added, That whale can wait forever, they won't be back. Nami folded her arms and said, sad to say, but it's probably true. Back in the day, when those guys traveled the Grand Line it was an uncharted sea, a thousand times more treacherous than it is now. Yuzop gave a grunt of anger and ran over to them, yelling, Why are you all being so pessimistic? You don't know that they're dead. They could still come back for him. Come on, have some sympathy would ya? I thought it was very touching. I mean a whale still believing a promise that his friends made to him despite all these years. That's a true bond. Right Pops? Indeed, Crocus agreed. But he leaned his hand against the coconut tree and answered. But the lesson here is that reality is cruel. Laboon's cohorts aren't dead. The truth is that they abandoned their quest. And then told them that he learned that the pirates turned and left the Grand Line through the comm belt. He couldn't claim to know exactly what happened to them. But he doubted that they would ever return for him here. So if I got this straight, Sanji said, now sounding angry, these pirates were a bunch of cowards who cared more about saving their own asses than keeping a promise to a friend. Yuzop's voice rang out and outraged. Why would anyone abandon such a loyal creature? Just look at him. It's cruelty on a grand scale. But if you've known all this, why haven't you told him? Nami asked Crocus. Laboon can obviously communicate with you. He seems to understand humans quite well for a whale. I did tell him, Crocus admitted, down to the last miserable detail. 
He sighed as he said. That was the day Laboon began to howl at Reverse Mountain. Soon after he started slamming his body against the red line. It's as if he believes that wall is what keeps his friends away. And that by breaking it, he can clear the path for their return. He refuses to believe me because then he'll have to admit that it's over, Crocus said grimly. And that though terrifies him more than anything. There's no way for him to go back to the West Blue so what we have here is a paradox of tragic proportion. Laboon is a lost soul dying to live with his friends, but won't stop killing himself to reach them. Tragedy, Sanji stated. But still, despite all the grief those pirates put him through they did the same thing to you by saddling you with their burden. He pulled out his cigarette and asked what he was going to do, and added that he had done enough for Laboon. The scars on his hide are deep, Crocus answered simply. Those in his heart are even deeper. He needs someone to tend his wounds and I'm all he's got. For years he's battered himself and I patched him up. A strange friendship but it works. Their attention was brought out of the story as, with a loud cry, Luffy flew high up into the air on Eagle's wings. They all watched in shock as Luffy reached Laboon's head and found a place that was already bleeding, most likely where he had slammed his head against the red line earlier. This was the opening that Luffy needed and transformed his body into that of a swordfish. The pointed tip of the fish was propelled by gravity right into the wound, causing blood to gush everywhere. This time, Laboon felt the pain and his eyes watered up in pain as he let out a loud howl of agony. Luffy, having transformed his body back into human form, gripped onto the whale's front tightly. If one were to look closely, they would notice the octopus suction cups that had sprouted along his arms. Between thrashes, Luffy would unstick one of his arms and deliver a powerful punch to the open wound. Laboon was now angry as he jumped right out of the sea and slammed Luffy right into the red line with his body. The waves that the whale was creating almost ended up capsizing their ship. And with the size of the waves, there wasn't anything the straw hats could do but hold on for dear life. Luffy got right back up and was now grinning cockily at Laboon. The whale was now seriously ticked off and went to smash him with his tail, which did end up hitting him. Luffy then grew in size to that of an elephant and dug his tusks into the whale's side. But Laboon retaliated by slamming him into the lighthouse. This continued on until Laboon had actually managed to lift a part of his body onto land to try and go at him again. But then Luffy suddenly screamed out, It's a draw. Those words shocked Laboon so much that he stopped. Luffy looked up, dirty and bruised, but was smiling. I'm stronger than I look, but I had a feeling you knew that. Laboon just looked back, and even those who didn't understand Whale could tell that he was completely lost here to what was going on. I can always tell when someone's itching for a fight, Luffy told him as he looked up. Well, if you want a battle I'll give you one. Your shipmates used to spare with you didn't they and you miss it. Well, I can rival anything they threw at you. Tell you what, after me and my friends travel the Grand Line. We'll come back here and find you. Tears were forming in Laboon's giant eyes as Luffy finished. Then you better be ready for a rematch. Tears were now falling from the whale's eyes. The anger and madness that had been there only seconds before seemed to fade as he let out another howl. But this time, it wasn't of sadness. It was the thrill of another fight. After a while later, after they had retrieved the mast off Laboon's head, Luffy had gotten some paint and had managed to do a very poorly drawn version of their Jolly Roger on the whale's head where the scars were. It looked just like Luffy's first attempt to draw their flag before, and it just looked so funny painted there that they all laughed a little at it. Hey, not bad, Luffy commented as he looked back to admire his work, also covered in paint. Consider this a symbol of my promise to come do battle with you. He told him, course, it's a rushed paint job, so you'll have to be careful and avoid hitting your head or you'll rub it off. Understand, Laboon grunted in acknowledgement. Good whale, Luffy stated happily. Nami told Luffy to clean himself up as she tried to work out a plan for the Grand Line journey. Luffy looked annoyed, but did what she said. However, as he got back to the deck he spotted two things different here. First off, Ms. Wednesday and Mr. Nine were gone. And second, he spotted what looked to be a cross between a compass and an hourglass rolling around on the deck. What's this thing? Luffy said to himself as he picked it up. But then the crew heard Nami screaming and the noise startled Laboon so that he dove under the water. You mind? Luffy yelled back as Sanji and Yuzop climbed up to talk with her. Sanji bearing plates of food, keep it down. You idiots. Nami's voice yelled. The compass is broken. Looking surprised, Luffy put the strange device into his pocket and they followed him up so that they were sitting at a small table outside the lighthouse with the other three already gathered around it. Nami was there with the map and her compass in front of her. The little needle was spinning around and round. Never stopping. The needle just spins. It won't stop. She told them all. As they all talked amongst themselves about it, Crocus, who had been standing close by, turned to look at them. It is sadly apparent that none of you possess the slightest knowledge to how things work here, he said, did you all come here to die? As they all looked to Crocus and he explained, with Sanji warning Luffy not to eat all the food, there is nothing wrong with your compass. The Grand Line has little regards for the rules of the sea. Common sense is useless in this place. The needle, Nami asked slowly. 
Why does it spin? And so Crocus told them the reason why normal compasses don't work on the Grand Line was because of the nature of the island's magnetic fields. In order to navigate the Grand Line, a special compass called a log pose must be used. The log pose works by locking onto one island's magnetic field and then locking onto another island's magnetic field. Luffy pulled out the device, which happened to be a log pose, that he found earlier and Nami ended up punching him for not telling them about it. He argued back that he found it on deck and assumed that those two must have dropped it when they escaped as Nami took it from him. Crocus then finished up his explanation by telling them that there are a total of seven different routes that diverge from Reverse Mountain and travel east before merging again to the last island, Raftul, an island that's existence was only confirmed by Roger himself. Raftul, Nami repeated softly. That's it, Yuzop yelled excitedly, a big grin on his face. That must be where the One Piece is hidden. That's the most promising theory, Crocus said, but no one has been able to set foot on Raftal Island since then. Luffy, who was chewing on some of the bones of the meal, grinned, don't worry, we'll know soon enough. Crocus was looking at him with new surprise as Luffy finished the food and everyone began yelling at him for not leaving anything for them. Sanji, especially, was furious and beat him up for it, however ended up breaking the log pose in the process. Nami kicked both men into the sea, screaming that she was going to kill them if they didn't get out of her face. Fortunately, Crocus had won and he gave it to them as a thank you for helping Laboon. Laboon then came out of the water with both Sanji and Luffy, but also brought up Miss, Wednesday and Mr. Nine. Since they lost their log pose, they needed a ride back. This brings us to Luffy sitting up on the table with Vivi and Mr. Nine on their knees. Whiskey Peak, repeated Luffy in puzzlement. Huh, that's a funny name. So what it is? Yuzop asked. It's where we live. Mr. Nine snapped, before he added more respectfully, Sir, as Nami asked them what happened to their ship, Vivi answered nervously that it was destroyed. Asking us for a ride is pushing it Mr. Nine. Nami said slyly, especially after you tried to kill the whale. But when they tried to get some real answers out of them, the two refused to answer. Miss, Wednesday and Mr. Nine were now begging, telling them that they couldn't tell them anything because of their line of business. They told them that the only thing they wanted was to just get home. We have confidence in your character, can't you grant us the same courtesy? Miss, Wednesday asked. Please, we're begging you, show some mercy. Mr. Nine added. Don't do it, Crocus advised them at once. These two fools are dishonest to the core. They can't be trusted. Nami held up the broken log pose still on her wrist and told them that they didn't have another one and asked if they still wanted to ride with them. The reaction was hilarious as they began yelling at her for trying to trick them. But Nami merely smiled devilishly and said in a fake innocent voice that fooled no one. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Crocus gave us his so. And as soon as they heard that, they got back to their knees and began begging for pity again. Mr. Nine's face was twitching horribly, as if he was biting back what he really wanted to say. But to their surprise, Luffy said that it was all right for them to ride with them. Why? Yuzop demanded, pointing an accusing finger at them. These two are obviously pretty shady characters. Why would we take them anywhere? It's fine, Luffy repeated. Don't sweat the small stuff. It'll be all right. Choose your route carefully. Crocus warned him seriously from behind him. Once you head out from here, you'll be committed to that course. It's okay, Luffy said happily. If we don't like it, we'll try a different route next time. Crocus smiled at Luffy's words, admiring the younger man's youthful spirit. Okay, it's time we get going. Luffy declared as he jumped to his feet and looked to the rest of his crew. Now that me and Laboon have an understanding, I can leave with a clear conscience. Just who in the world do you think you are anyway? Ms. Wednesday asked as Luffy stretched out his stiff body. What's that? Me. Luffy asked looking back at her before he said confidently. Well, I'm the man who'll be king of the pirates. Crocus smiled widely at that, as if remembering something from a long time ago. But Miss, Wednesday and Mr. Nine covered their mouths as they fought back the laughs. With the sun setting they all climbed on board the repaired ship with Crocus letting them know that their log should be pointing directly to Whiskey Peak and they finished saying their goodbyes. Luffy looked to Laboon. I'm off, Laboon, he said. Be ready to fight when I get back. Laboon gave a surprisingly soft, almost purring sound as the ship pulled away. Next stop, Luffy cried out, Whiskey Peak, ready gang, let's send sail. They all cheered as Laboon let out noises of farewell, the crew waving goodbye to him and Crocus. The crew and their passengers were surprised a few days later to find the Mary with a thick layer of snow on deck. Sanji was shoveling it all off, but each shovel full that he threw overboard was replaced quickly as the snow continued to fall. Luffy and Yuzop meanwhile were fighting over snowmen when they heard Nami screaming in horror from inside the cabin. What's wrong? Yuzop yelled as he and Luffy were stopped in the middle of their snowball fight. Sounds mad. Luffy said knowingly as Sanji declared that he would save Nami from whatever the problem was. Nami, dressed in a warm coat, came out of the cabin, staring at the log pose in horror. No way. Nami screamed before she cried out. Make a hard turn 180 degrees, hurry. 
A 180. Yuzop repeated, baffled as he dropped his handful of snow. Why would you want us to turn back? Did you forget something? Luffy asked curiously. The ship has turned around. We're sailing in the wrong direction. She yelled at them, still looking at the log pose. I only took my eyes off the log pose for a second. She looked up at the sky and said, I thought the waves were calm. Just then, Miss, Wednesday asked from inside the cabin in that same conceited way. You're not a very good navigator are you? You can't trust anything here. Not the wind, sky, waves, clouds. Nothing is what it seems in the sea. The only way to get reliable direction on the Grand Line is with the log pose. Everyone knows that, Miss. Wednesday finished with a satisfied smirk. But the woman had finally gone too far and Nami kicked her and her partner outside. Shut your condensating mouths and do something useful around here. She screamed as she took charge. Brace the yard. Force the wind starboard. Turn the ship 180 degrees to the left. Yuzop manned the latin sails. Sanji take the helm. When they went running off she then barked orders at the two. Work you too. This girl's crazy. Mr. Nine stated as they began pulling ropes. All except Zoro were working desperately. As he was sleeping against the side of the boat, covered in snow. Hey wait. Looks like the wind changed. Yuzop yelled, getting their attention. And he was right. It changed rapidly from freezing cold to a springtime gale. And that was how it went. The winds would constantly change. Waves would become violent or calm when you least expect it. Once they almost hit an iceberg as a fog came pouring in. Although they had managed to turn just in time. The helm was damaged and Yuzop went off to fix the leak. Dark clouds came pouring in and they were battling the fierce wind right after that as Sanji was forced to keep bringing food for them to keep their strength up. The winds were tearing the sails apart and water was filling the bottom of the ship. It was chaos. Thankfully, the horrible weather had finally calmed down enough that they could all rest on deck, trying to catch their breath. But true to form, Zoro had finally woken up and was telling them all that they shouldn't be so lazy just because the weather was nice. He didn't notice the evil eyes that Nami, Sanji, and Yuzop were giving him as he finally noticed the two newcomers on deck. He went on to ask what they were doing there and Luffy explained the whole thing about taking them home. Grinning evilly, Zoro bent down to look at them. So tell me, what are your strange names again? Cause I don't think you two can be trusted. I. My name is Mr. Nine. Mr. Nine croaked out. I'm called Miss Wednesday. The woman added nervously, her eyes twitching a little fearfully. Right? Zoro said skeptically. His thumb under his chin, you know those names sound familiar and that's what's bothering me. In fact, the more I think about the more I'm sure I've heard them somewhere before. The two were looking terrified just as Nami hit Zoro over the head from behind and began to tell him that he was lucky that they didn't throw him overboard for sleeping when they did all the work. But as he glared back, looking ready to tell her off, she hit him three times over the head so that he was on the deck defeated, nursing his wounds. Nami stood up in front of them all and declared, Listen up everyone. There's no way to know what's gonna happen next. During the terror that most of us just experienced, she shot Zoro another evil look before continuing. I came to an understanding why this sea was named the Grand Line. She held up her fist and finished, My navigation skills are useless here. Anything can happen. But mark my words I will guide us through. She then pointed through the mist and yelled out, We're here. Our first journey on the Grand Line comes to an end. And through the thick mist, they could see the outline strange, cactus-shaped mountains with several buildings set up on either side of the river that they were traveling on. Luffy was crying out in joy at the idea of visiting another island. As he and the rest of the crew talked in excited voices, Miss Wednesday and Mr. Nine both jumped to the railing. They both said their thanks and goodbyes and chuckled darkly. Bye-bye baby. They finally finished speaking together before jumped overboard. That was a quick exit, Nami said. I guess we'll never learn what those nut jobs are up to, Yuzop added darkly, looking over the edge to try and see where they went. Who cares? Luffy asked, turning back to the matter at hand. We're landing. The pirates had received a surprisingly warm welcome from the villagers. They even threw a giant party in the pirates' honor. This turned out to be a setup. However, as the town was actually a den of bounty hunters working for an organization called Baroque Works who hoped to capture the straw hats when they were out cold from the party. This didn't go according to plan for them though, as Zoro had only faked being drunk and was able to take on the small army of bounty hunters, easily tearing through their ranks. Soon, most of the buildings were mostly destroyed. There was rubble and broken boards cast every few feet along with giant shards of broken glass and the walls around them looked close to crumbling away. The damage, however, was not all caused by the fighting between Zoro and the Baroque works. Luffy and Zoro, bloodlust in both their eyes, came bursting through a wall and were going at each other. Zoro's blades clashed against Luffy's arms, which had transformed into the bladed pincers of a prey mantis. As it turns out, the Chimera Man had woken up later in the night and, seeing the beaten bounty hunters thought that the swordsman was attacking their hosts for no reason. As a result, the captain wanted to fight him over it. 
so caught up in their fight that they didn't even notice the two figures who were pulling themselves out of some of the rubble, a man and woman. The woman had short blonde hair was wearing a yellow dress with a lemon-like pattern and with two lemon earrings dangling from her ears. The man with her was a tall, dark-skinned man with black hair and short spiky dreadlocks. He also wore a brown trench coat with the number 5 printed on along with dark sunglasses. These two were Mr. Five and his partner Miss Valentine's, two of Baroque Works agents. Miss Wednesday was also there, riding a duck that size of a horse. She looked different from before. She looked a little beat up as well and her long hair was let down. But she was still staring at Zorro and Luffy with terror on her face. The first two were both beat up, covered in bruises and cuts all over their faces. Looking at them, they didn't have to think hard to what must have happened. The two went charging at the fighting crewmates, convinced that they could win. But they picked the wrong people to fight. You can't beat us, Mr. Five yelled, prepared to die at the hands of Baroque Works officer agents. Both Luffy and Zoro stopped their fight and glared murderously at the agents, stopping them all dead in their tracks. The two looked truly terrifying. Their faces were covered in bloody scratches, while their eyes were devoid of any sympathy or benevolence. There was nothing but cold rage that was so strong that they could all feel chills going up their spine. Luffy's were like looking into the eyes of a rabid lion while Zoro's held all the ferocity of a demon. Shut up and go away. They both yelled, raising their fists, you're interfering, and together they sent the two flying with such force that one might have felt sympathy for the two poor fools. With our fight, the two finished screaming out, a trace of evil flashing there. They were sent crashing into the side of the buildings until they were both out cold for good this time. Zoro grumbled to himself, stupid pests, messing with our fight. Luffy growled in agreement as Miss Wednesday was staring at them in amazement as they both went back to glaring at each other. Zoro glared at Luffy, now looking completely insane here. Shall we continue? He demanded. Yeah, Luffy snapped back, looking just as demented as Zoro at that moment. With a crack of his arms, they became the burly clawed arms of a black bear. But as the two moved in for another round, their muscles bulging and the energy they were releasing seemed to bend the air itself as they clashed like sparks between them. However, before these two powerhouses could collide, Nami appeared out of nowhere and punched them both so hard in the faces that they were sent flying, knocked right out of their frenzy mode. You two, what the heck do you think you're doing here? Nami yelled at them both as they lay there, looking stunned at what just hit them. It's lucky for you that you managed to keep the girl safe. You almost lost us a billion berries. She picked them both up by the scruffs of their necks, like how a babysitter would to two brothers who just didn't want to get along and yelled, You understand? Miss Wednesday was staring at her, not understanding what she was talking about, as Luffy and Zoro were continuing to fight by pulling each other's faces and small punches like little kids. What do you mean? The other woman asked anxiously. What berries? I don't understand. Why did you save me? As the two continued to fight where they hung in Nami's grasp, Nami smiled and said to her, About that, I think we need to have a little chat. You see you and I have to work out a contract for a reward. She frowned at the two before she finally slammed them into the ground to stop them fighting for good. Knock it off. She screamed. Later, the trio and Miss, Wednesday, or rather her real name Vivi, were all seated in an alleyway. Luffy was sitting up on a barrel and was laughing his head off. Oh, he said in new understanding, they were all bounty hunters. Why didn't you just say so, Zoro? I did. Like twelve times, Zoro yelled back furiously at him. What a funny mix-up. Luffy laughed before Nami snarled at them to shut up, which they did at once. Would you drop it? Zoro demanded as Nami turned to Vivi and offered to take her home for one billion berries. Apparently, Vivi was a princess of the kingdom of Alabasta who had been undercover at Baroque Works for two years with her bodyguard Igarin, codenamed Mr. Eight. However, her cover had been blown and Mr. Five and Miss Valentine had been sent to deal with her before they ran into the two monsters. Igaram had begged Nami, who like Zoro faked being unconscious, into helping the princess. Nami agreed, though she blackmailed the man into paying a billion berries to do so. No, I can't, Vivi said sharply and Nami blinked in surprise. But I appreciate the help you've given me so far. Why not? Nami demanded at once. You're a princess aren't you? So aren't you rich? Do you know much about Alabasta Kingdom? Vivi asked sadly. And so she went into details about her home and how they were now in the middle of a civil war. The people are revolting and the entire kingdom was on the verge of self-destructing so she had decided to take matters into her own hands when she discovered that someone was now behind this war. So she and her companion Igaram infiltrated Baroque Works to find out who was behind it all for the last two years. You've got some guts considering you're a princess, Zoro said in an impressed tone, so... Were you able to find out what their plan was? She nodded just as Nami answered, to create an ideal nation. Vivi looked up at her in surprise and she explained, Anyway, that's what Igarem said it was. Is that what you found out? Vivi looked back down at her knees and admitted, It's not. That was only a cover story the boss was using. It's a lie to cover their tracks. Her eyes darkened and she finished. 
Their true goal is to take over Alabasta Kingdom. They all just looked at her as she said that she now had to get back home and warn everyone what was really happening before it was too late. She looked ready to cry and Nami sighed. Okay, I get it, she said in annoyance, I see how it is. Yeah, it's all starting to make sense now. I suppose you wouldn't have much money laying around during a civil war. Hey, Luffy said eagerly, so did you find out who's in charge? Bibby looked horrified at the suggestion. What? She screamed, causing everyone to become startled at her sudden change in tone. The boss's ID and ITY. U-S-H-O-U-L-D and ask that. But you know don't you? Luffy asked calmly. Ask me anything but that. She yelled, waving her hands around. If I tell you, your lives will be in danger too. Yeah, I'll pass. Nami added with a nervous laugh, clearly letting them know that she was happy not knowing. This guy is trying to take over an entire country after all. I wouldn't want someone like that chasing after me. Thank you. No, you don't. Vivi said loudly. I don't care how strong you people are. You wouldn't stand a chance against one of the warlords of the sea. Against Crocodile. Silence. Who now? Luffy asked. And Vivi turned white as she realized what she said and covered her mouth when Nami's jaw fell open in horror. You had to say it, Zoro said darkly before they felt like they were being watched. They looked up and they saw a strange sight. There was an otter in a white one-piece cloth with purple polka dots and a vulture with a flowered swim cap, both with thick sunglasses. They all looked up at the duo for a moment before the otter jumped up on the vulture's back and they took off. It turns out the two animals were Mr. Thirteen and Miss Friday. They served as crocodiles' messengers and were also in charge of executing any Baroque Works agents that fail their missions. Nami then grabbed hold of Vivi's front and began to shake her as she screamed at her, with Vivi telling her how sorry she was. The men on the other hand were looking excited at the thought. Hey, a warlord. That's cool. Luffy yelled out, his eyes shining. Not too bad, Zoro agreed. Luffy began to laugh wildly as Nami continued to yell at Vivi before she began to cry. Being hunted by a warlord in the Grand Line. That's more than I can handle. She cried, covering her face. So when do we get to see this guy? Zoro asked conversationally. I wonder what he's like. Luffy added as Nami yelled out, Shut up you. She then turned and began heading down the road. It's been nice knowing you idiots. Thanks for everything. She yelled at them. Where are you going? Luffy called after her. They don't know what I look like yet. She yelled back, I'm leaving. And no sooner had she said that did the otter show up with three very detailed drawings of Luffy, Zoro, and Nami. Nami clapped as she saw them. Wow, that's so lifelike. And that was when they took off, their silhouette against the bright moon. Nami turned back to them and yelled, No use in leaving now. I'm really sorry. Vivi said again quietly but Luffy said that she'll get over it. Where's she planning on going anyway? Zoro asked, as a twisted grin appeared on his face. Well then, it looks like the three of us will be sitting right on top of Baroque Works' hit list. Luffy chuckled to himself, that's so awesome. Nami however, was now sulking in a curled up ball on the ground with Vivi trying to think of something to say to cheer her up. You have nothing to fear. Someone suddenly yelled. The straw hats turned to see a fairly tall, muscular man standing there with three stuffed dummies and stared intensely at the group of pirates. Though it was clear he was a man, he was dressed in clothes similar to Vivi's, and with thick tube-like hair had been done up in a ponytail and even wearing lipstick. It's, the man, who turned out to be Igaram, coughed. He started to hum scales before he went on to say, It's gonna be alright princess, I've come up with a plan. Igaram, Vivi exclaimed, coming over to him. What are you? That's a really funny outfit old guy, Luffy said as he looked over the outfit. An entire parade of idiots, Nami whispered where she huddled. Igaram began to tell them his plan. Since Baroque Works had learned who Vivi really was, agents would be sent after her to try and kill her. So he came up with the plan to disguise himself as her and try to draw their attention to give them time to escape. So these things are us, Luffy asked as he poked one of the dummies. A decoy, Zoro summed up for them. While Baroque Works is busy chasing after me, Igaram finished up. The rest of you will head with Vivi straight for Alabasta Kingdom along a less direct route. Hold on. Just a second. Nami screamed, finally getting back to her feet. Who said we were gonna take her with us? They looked to her and she finished. We still haven't discussed the matter of payment. Payment for what? Luffy asked as he stared at Vivi. Take her where? Where have you been, Luffy? Zoro asked impatiently as he stood up and jerked his thumb to Igaram. The old man here wants us to take the princess back home to her kingdom. Oh, is that what all this yelling is about? Luffy said, getting it and Vivi looked to him in surprise as he finished by saying, Sure thing. Nami completely lost her cool and screamed out, Crocodile may already be after us. Is this crocodile guy really that dangerous? Luffy asked Igaram curiously. Igaram looked back and explained about how he was one of the seven warlords. And because of that, there wasn't a bounty on his head. However, once upon a time, his bounty had once been over 80 million. 80 million? That's four times Arlong's bounty. Nami screamed out. There's no way. 
Sure, Luffy answered with a confident smile as memory Nami looked like she was about to burst into tears again. It sounds like it'll be fun. We are forever grateful, Igarim said, and they could hear the gratitude in his voice as he lead them to a small ship and put the dummies on board before he turned back and spoke in a much higher voice. Now then, I, Vivi, will leave from here. Luffy began to laugh. Great imitation old guy. Imitation of who? Zoro asked, looking at Igarim like he thought that he was insane. But Igaram didn't pay any attention to them as he asked Vivi for the eternal pose and she handed it over, looking like she was doing this against her will. They could all see the sadness in her eyes. The truth was that she didn't want this, but there wasn't anything she could do about it. What's an eternal pose? Nami suddenly asked and Igaram looked at her in surprise. You've never heard of it? He asked her. You can say it's sorta of like a permanent version of the log pose. Igaram answered, holding up the little compass. It looked a great deal like the one Nami wore. Only this one was made to look a little more like an hourglass shape with only one orb in the middle with needle floating inside it and the name Alabasta was printed on the top, whereas a log pose will always lead sailors to the next island on the course. An eternal pose will forever remember the magnetic energy of the island stored inside it, so it will always point to that island and no other. And this eternal pose is set to Alabasta Kingdom, and you're going to use this to set your course to home. Vivi asked him worriedly, Princess Vivi, please take the indirect island hopping route to Alabasta. Igarim told her softly, silently letting her know that he knew the dangers, but he was ready to take them. I have never gone that way myself, but you should only need to pass two or three island to get there. He turned his attention towards Luffy. Please, take care of the princess in my absence. Yeah, Luffy said cheerfully. Igarim, Vivi started to say something, but her words died on her lips, unable to come out and say what she really wanted. I expect that your journey will be a difficult one, he said with a gentle voice and an encouraging smile. Please, be careful. Vivi still didn't look happy about it, but she forced a smile and took his hand as they promised that they would see each other again soon. They watched as Igarim set sail, all of them saying goodbye. But before he got too far away, there was a bright light and, to their horror, the ship exploded apart. The blinding light and force of the shockwave created a great wind and blew back at them, everyone looking stunned. The ship went up in flames, burning everything until there wasn't anything but a pile of burnt wood on the water. They're already after us, Nami exclaimed fearfully, once she got over the shock. That's impossible, Luffy said nothing as he turned around and walked over a few feet to wear his hat. That had been blown off by the shockwave before and put it back on his head. He let out a loud yell and looked ready to charge. Now was the time that they had to hurry and leave before they were killed as well. Zoro was right behind him as he yelled at Nami about the lock. She quickly checked and let him know that it was set, they could leave. Get the girl, he yelled back as he turned back to run with Luffy, come on. Let's go. As Nami tried to pull Vivi away from the horrible sight, Zoro told Luffy that he'll get the ship ready and that he should get the other too. Right, Luffy answered, I'm on it. He sprinted back down the street to the building where they had been staying. He broke down the door in his haste and looked wildly around the room for the cook and sniper. It was clear that there had been a party here. The whole place was a mess and the two were both passed out on the floor, snoring loudly. Luffy grabbed hold of Yuzop's nose and Sanji's leg, waking them up. But not soon enough. Come on. Luffy shouted as he ran out the door, which was only big enough for him, and so he pulled his two crewmates out through either side of the walls, both of them yelling in pain and confusion to what was going on. Sanji was cursing at him to stop it and Yuzop was screaming that his nose was gonna fall off. Luffy didn't stop until they reached where the ship was docked, and Zoro was just finishing up pulling up the anchor. Hey, I got them. Luffy screamed up, holding them up. Bring him up. We're ready to go. Zoro told him. Luffy turned around to check and saw Yuzop and Sanji were both out cold. What? They're still asleep. He shrugged and dragged them onto the going merry. Suddenly, they heard arguing and they looked behind them to see that Nami brought Vivi here and she was yelling at her. We don't have time to look for him. I'm not just gonna leave him here. Vivi yelled back. But listen. Nami screamed, looking close to slapping her. Zoro yelled out asking what was the problem down at them. Apparently her duck's gone missing. Nami screamed up at him. And now she's refusing to leave without him. This duck. He asked, pointing to the duck that was standing next to him. He's here. Both women yelled in fury. Yeah, he was there when I climbed on board, Zoro stated, made it here before I did. Zoro informed them, with the knowledge that her duck was safe and sound. Vivi climbed up the ladder, while giving them all directions to the best way out of here. With the sails opening, the straw hats were more than happy to say goodbye to Whiskey Peak and sailed off into a thick fog. As they got underway, Zoro turned to Vivi. Hey, he stated and she looked up in surprise. Mr. Bushido. She asked. Zoro asked how many people did she think that they were going to send after them. 
Vivi told them that there were at least 2,000 loyal employees in several bases like this one set up in the area. As she told them that, Sanji and Yuzop both came to and began screaming that they wanted to stay another night. We should have just left them behind, Zoro said irritably as Nami went and punched them both, shutting them up. Nami, will you explain it to them? I just did. She answered. Okay that was fast, he said in surprise. I left out the complicated parts. She added. By this point, the first rays of light were starting to appear on the horizon and they were clear of the island. Though they were now forced to sail very carefully through all the fog and avoid the rocks. One false move, and they could end up sinking right here. Finally, it's getting light out. Nami sighed in relief. I'm just glad we got away from the people chasing us, a voice said. That's for sure, Nami agreed. With all this fog, we'll need to be careful to avoid the rocks, the voice spoke again. I'll take care of it. Nami shouted confidently before she realized that she didn't know who had spoken. She looked to Luffy and asked hesitantly, wait, did you? Luffy looked at her in confusion, until they heard someone clear their throat behind them. And as everyone looked up they saw a figure sitting comfortably on the upper railings. The new figure was a woman in her twenties. She was a tall, slender, yet athletic woman with shoulder-length black hair. She has blue eyes, with dark, wide pupils, and she has a long, thin and defined nose. Her skin was lightly tan, and she wore a revealing purple cowgirl outfit, complete with hat. It's, it's you. Vivi stuttered in shock and fear. I just happened to run into your dear Mr. Eight a while back, the woman said coldly. He didn't look so good. Vivi's eyes turned dark as she yelled, so you killed Igaram. You, what are you doing on my ship and how did you get here? Luffy demanded of the stranger, who are you? Answer him. Vivi yelled, what are you doing here, Miss All Sunday? So you know who she is? Nami questioned, which of the numbered guys is she partners with? Her partner is Mr. Zero, the boss, Vivi said gravely. She's a bad guy. Luffy questioned her as Nami screamed in fright. She was the only one who knew the boss' identity. Vivi explained as she continued to glare up at Miss All Sunday, as if expecting her to start attacking at any moment. That's how we found out who he actually is, by following her back to him. However, Miss All Sunday said, to be accurate, I allowed it. So she's a good guy then, Luffy said, trying to understand this. I know you knew we were there. Vivi yelled, you're the one who told the boss what we knew, weren't you? That's right, she answered in a bored tone. All right so then she is bad. Luffy finally concluded, pouting and Zoro told him to cut it out. You still haven't told us what it is you're doing here. Vivi yelled again and the agent was looking annoyed at the rudeness. Oh, right, she said coolly. You were just so serious about the whole thing I couldn't help myself. A princess doing whatever it took to help her country while making herself an enemy of Baroque works. The idea was just so ridiculous. Vivi was looked enraged as she screamed out at the top of her lungs. You killed H-H-H-I-I-I-M-M-M. The five straw hats had leapt into action. Sanji and Yuzop were both up on their feet, Yuzop with his slingshot loaded on one side, and Sanji on the other with a gun pointed directly at her head. Zoro was below them with Nami, both of them had weapons as well. Yuzop and Sanji exchanged a brief conversation to what was going on, but the woman didn't look worried at all. I would really appreciate it if you would, she said softly, and it all happened so quickly that they all missed what happened as she apparently threw the two off the railing. Stop pointing those at me. Yumina, Zoro said gasped. She's eaten. Nami went on before her staff and Zoro's sword were knocked out of their hands. And then Zoro finished, a devil fruit. But which one? What's her power? Nami cried out, now standing farther back with the others in front of her like shields. Sanji looked up to get a good look at her and hearts reappeared. Wow, he gasped, as if he had never seen anything like her before, now that I get a look. You're beautiful. Miss All Sunday chuckled a little at Sanji's words before she looked back to Vivi. Now there's no need to get so excited, she informed her, you can all calm down. I haven't been given any orders to follow you here. I have no reason to fight you. Holding up her hand, she used her powers to get hold of Luffy's straw hat, spinning it around on her hand in a bored way. So, you're the captain, she said, looking over at Luffy. I've heard so much about you. Monkey D. Luffy, give me my hat back. Luffy yelled enraged, shaking his fists at her. You don't want me to come up there and take it. You are a bad person. I demand you leave this instant. Yuzop yelled from his hiding place behind the mast. Bad luck. The woman corrected as she put Luffy's hat on top of her own before going on, picking up a princess who Baroque works already made up their mind to see eliminated, protected by a mere handful of pirates. But your luck gets even worse, because of the direction your log pose is indicating. You see, Nami was looking at their log in fear as Miss All Sunday answered. The name of the next island is Little Garden. We won't even need to lift a finger, she finished up. You'll all be dead long before you reach Alabasta. My hat, give it to me. Luffy screamed, obviously not caring about anything she said. Leave now evil, doer. Use up yelled, evil doer. Zoro repeated, rolling his eye, seriously. That's all a matter of opinion, the cowgirl answered, not at all offended by it. 
You don't think it's a little foolish allowing yourselves to be wiped out? She asked as she threw back Luffy's hat and something over to Vivi. When she held it up, they saw that it was an eternal pose. An eternal pose. Vivi whispered as she looked at it suspiciously. Using that, you can just skip right past Little Garden without stopping. All Sunday answered her a little smugly. She also explained that this one island was near Alabasta and that none of their agents know that course so they shouldn't be followed. What? So she's good after all? Naomi suddenly asked as she looked up at her, trying to figure out what was going on. But the gesture seemed to make Vivi angry as she yelled up. Why are you giving this toss? It's gotta be a trap, Zoro said firmly. But Vivi was staring at the pose with a wondering expression and they could tell that she was trying to figure out what to do. Oh, does it? All Sunday asked as Luffy walked over to Vivi and grabbed the eternal pose out of her hands. Forget your thingy. We don't need it. He yelled as he then crushed it until it broke into nothing but shards of glass and wood. Nami and Vivi were both looking horrified at what he had done. Nami obviously didn't feel that way as she kicked him hard in the face and knocked him to the deck. You jerk. She screamed out, pointing up at the woman. She just went out of her way to show us an easier course to follow. Maybe she actually is trying to help us get away. But Luffy didn't react at all for a moment before he turned to look up at All Sunday and declared that she wasn't the one who decided where the ship goes. Both Luffy and the woman looked at each other for a few extra long seconds, with All Sunday just looking at him as if she was trying to figure out a complicated question before she smiled, as if she had it answered. Well, that's too bad. All Sunday told them all casually as she walked along the upper deck, looking a little satisfied as she did so. It was as if she was glad that he had decided not to accept her offer. Nami looked ready to yell again but Luffy answered. She blew up that funny old man and he was nice so now I hate her. I'm sorry to hear that, she stated looking back at him, and I'm sorry you didn't accept my offer. If you survive, I hope we meet again. No, Luffy said childishly and she actually chuckled at that. All Sunday gave them one last smile before she jumped ship and when they went running off to look, they found her leaving on the back of a giant sea turtle heading back to Whiskey Peak. Luffy watched after the turtle with bright eyes as Vivi fell to her knees in defeat. That woman, she cried out, I don't have the slightest idea what's going through her head. Then there's no point in thinking about it is there. Nami asked irritably. There's someone on this boat who's just like that. Zoro added as Yuzop demanded to know what was going on and Sanji swooned over Vivi. After quickly explaining everything that was going on to Sanji and Yuzop, their cook sighed and confessed that he was sorry that he missed all the fun. But it sounds like there'll still be plenty of demand for my skills. No need to worry now that your sleeping prince has awoken my sweet, you'll be safe. Yuzop was stating the opposite. He was glad that he asleep, as Sanji asked if Nami was jealous. She gave him a frosty look and gave him a definite no. Excuse me, Vivi asked hesitantly, and they all looked to her. She was standing there, looking truly terrible that she got them involved in this mess. I'm sorry but, is it really alright that I'm on your ship? I'm just causing you a lot of trouble. Nami, meanwhile, looked put out as she came over and started poking Vivi's forehead. It's a little late for apologizes don't you think? If you didn't want to cause us trouble you shouldn't have told us who you were. Sorry for that, Vivi said. Isn't that right Luffy? Nami yelled and Luffy cheered, saying that he was hungry too, which didn't do anything to boost Vivi's confidence. Well, for now, Zoro said, ending the fight, at least we know where we're heading to. Little garden, huh? Sanji said. Remember what she said. Yuzop said worriedly. Are we gonna die? Luffy laughed. Who knows? Let's go pirates. Later they were all standing on the Mary's deck with Sanji passing out fruit drinks to them all and Luffy asking them if they wanted to get out the fishing gear. Fishing? Heck yeah. I'm in, Zoro said agreeably. Sounds good to me. Yuzop said eagerly. I'll even make you one of my custom fishing rods. You'll love it. It was then that the men were all giving the duck, Karu, drink after fruit drink, even cheering him on with each one he took. Nami came out of the cabin with a couple more drinks and Vivi who was standing up there, looked to her, saying loudly, they're acting like idiots. Maybe this will help, Nami said, holding out the drink to her and Vivi looked surprised at that. Just relax, she went on. These guys may go through their goofy phases but when things get rough, they get to work. Trust me, I should know. Sorry, Vivi said, calming down. I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm getting worked up over nothing. Nami just smiled. This ship will put you at ease. She reassured her, you'll cheer up in no time. As she said that, Karu had drank too much and was looking ready to burst. The others were all laughing around him and even Vivi cracked a smile as Karu lay on his back, a fountain of juice erupting from his mouth. Yeah, she said, there. Funny. Soon though, Nami's words went to the test. A dolphin, the size of a sea king had jumped out of the sea, and as if they had this all planned out, they all dropped what they were doing and got to work. Like a well-oiled machine, they got the sails ready and turned around, all of them knowing just what to do without being told. Soon they used the waves that the dolphin created to ride out and go at an amazing speed, all of them even enjoying the ride. Vivi stared at them all in amazement as Luffy asked Nami for direction when the excitement died down. 
Nami told them to sail portside and they turned without any other complaints. Just after that, they could see it in the distance. Through a light mist, they could make out a large island that looked like a tropical jungle. There's no mistake. Nami declared as she checked the log pose to see that the needle was pointing directly at the island. Cactus Island and this one are definitely pulling against each other. She pointed at it and cried out, Our next stop. Everyone cheered as they slowly approached. This is it. Luffy yelled, jumping up and down with Seal, our second island in the Grand Line. They followed a little river right into the island, the heat of this humid weather and thick plant life already starting to make them all uncomfortable. But Luffy wasn't deterred at all as he said, I can see why they call this place Little Garden. I can't, what's little about it? Zoro asked him darkly. Yeah, this island looks pretty harsh if you ask me. Why the cute name? Nami added. The crew soon found themselves standing next to a shallow creek where Luffy had come running up to with Vivi riding Karu. Luffy had skidded to a stop and went over to the water, something catching his eye. Hey, what's the matter? Vivi asked, wondering why he had stopped. Over here, check it out. Luffy called out excitedly as he picked up something from the water. It's a shellfish that looks like a squid. He held it up to her as she got off her duck to get a closer look. Shell squid fish. He finished proudly. How strange, Vivi said, frowning as she looked at it. It sorta resembles an aminoid. Cool huh? Luffy asked and they heard the ground shaking. The sounds of giant footsteps. They all looked around and soon saw what it was with their own eyes. That's weird. Luffy yelled, looking up to see the giant creature overhead. What's a sea king doing on land? Vivi screamed out what it was. A dinosaur. Awesome. Luffy screamed as Vivi and Karu could only yell in terror. Okay sadly the chapter is over. And if you enjoyed the video just leave a like. And subscribe with post notification. So when the next chapter is ready. You will be notified. Okay see you in the next video. Bye.